All right, people. I believe everybody is doing great, nice, and absolutely fine. Welcome to An Academy Neat English. If you have not subscribed to the channel, make sure you hit it as soon as possible. Okay? Just a second. Okay? So let me know in the live chat if I am audible and visible properly. If everything is going great, make sure you hit the like button, mark the attendance, okay? Because we have to do the real killing and shelling today. We have to complete the entire modern physics, okay? We have to complete three chapters which are in your modern physics. And, and, let me just tell you, basically we'll be completing 35 to 40 marks in the today's session, okay? Every concept will be discussed over here. And every pattern of question I will be showing you in this particular marathon, okay? So for the next 10 to 12 hours, you will be st basically uh, staying with me. Then only we can complete this entire marathon. Then only we can complete these three chapters. I want everybody of you to like this session as soon as possible. Hit the like button, hit the like button, everybody. And, and show some Josh fire, okay? In the live chat so that I'll get the same energy like you guys have. Everybody. Come on, guys. And this was the most awaited chapter, okay? Everybody was actually waiting for this because this is considered to be one of the, we say, high weightage portions when it comes to the NEET and when it comes to the JE both. Okay? Great, 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 great. So, tell me, how is everything going? Is it going great? How is everything going? Is it going great? So let the people join and we will start accordingly, okay? We'll start accordingly. Till then, we'll wait for some time. Great, 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 great. Yeah, semiconductors, I'll be taking the another session for that. Because semiconductors is also a very big chapter. We'll be do doing that in the next session. But as of now, in this one, we'll have to do the modern physics only. We'll have to do, uh, we say dual nature, atoms and nuclei and those de Broglie waves or matter waves will be finishing in this one only. And there will be tons and tons of questions. Every pattern will be discussed. Every pattern of problems will be discussed. We say all the theory will be discussed. And most importantly, we say I'll be taking you from the scratch. If you have not studied the modern physics before at all, if you are a newcomer, if you are studying this for the first time, I am 100% sure you will you'll get to understand each and every single point whatever i show you over here that's for sure okay that's the guarantee from my side and most imp uh, most importantly i'll tell you i'll make this butter for you okay so that will be smooth you can eat it okay very smoothly everything will be sorted okay and and if you have not liked this session i want you guys to hit the like button as soon as possible okay then only i'm starting the session everybody everybody out there Hit the like button as soon as possible. So, this is basically the modern physics one shot. Three chapters will be covering. This is the day 43. We have completed 43 chapters as of now. When it comes to your NEET. Okay. Now, over here, my dear friends. One more important thing I just wanted to tell you. That is nothing but. I have personally launched the NEET Conquest test series. For NEET 2024 students. This is completely free. This is for the physics. Okay. So I am personally making this test series. I'm personally making the questions when it comes to this particular test series. I want you guys to join it, okay? Because see, this is the test series in which you will get to see every pattern of question which has the chance that this question can be asked in the upcoming NEET 2024. That's why teachers have the experience what pattern of questions they have been asked from the past 20 years. So what are the pattern of questions they can ask now? That's why I'm telling you I'm personally designing this test series. I want you guys to join it. This is on every Sundays and completely free of cost. You just don't have to pay anything. Just you have to basically visit this link over here. Okay. So there is basically when you open this particular session on YouTube. Over here, over here you can clearly see this one in the description. In the description you will get this link. Need Conquest Test Series by Yawar Manzoor sir. You have to click on this one and join it. You don't have to pay anything. Completely free of cost. So I want you guys to do it as soon as possible. Okay. 
So this was about it. Now let's go back to the session. Okay. Okay. Let's basically, let's basically start the session now. Okay. So guys, time to kill this entire, all the three chapters, time to kill the modern physics. The shelling is going to start. Everybody, okay? Listen to me very carefully and, and, and I want you guys to make this, these likes more than 250 right now only. Okay, I'm watching, I'm watching. Everybody, everybody, okay? So, let's get into the session, my dear people. I am having the high josh. I am having the high energy in the today's session, okay? Every time I have the high energy, but today I have more high, okay? Now, see, listen to me very carefully. The first thing that we need to study in this one, this is the chapter number one. This is the chapter number one. Which one? That's we call, we say, dual nature of matter and radiations. The first chapter that we'll be targeting, okay? First, we'll be talking about some uh, small, small concepts like about photon, about energy of light, energy of photon. Then afterwards, we'll be basically shifting onto the photo photoelectric effect and its problems and then de Broglie waves, okay? Now listen to me very carefully, my dear people. Dual nature of matter and radiations, okay? So what do we have to actually study in this particular chapter, okay? What do we have to study in this particular chapter? Let's talk about the light. Let's talk about the light, okay? The light we actually have over here. Let's talk about that light. Because the other things we have already talked about in kinematics, the body is moving or we say in force and laws of motion forces are acting on a body about the charges and all in electrostatics, all of that is done. Okay, we have studied that physics. But right now we need to talk about, we need to talk about the light. Let's understand what this light is all about. See, previously it was actually the battle between, it was actually the kind of war between different number of scientists, different number of physicists. Okay, some people used to say, sir, this light is a wave and some people used to say this light is a particle. See. What I'm trying to say over here, I am asking you a simple question. Is this light a particle or a wave or a wave? Is this light a particle or a wave? This is what we need to, this is the basic question that we have in our mind. And back in time, people had the same question. Okay. What does this actually mean? Listen to me very carefully. Let's suppose I'm taking a light source over here. This is a light source. This is a light source. Sir, light source means which provides the light from which light is actually coming out. So we say if this light is basically giving us the light over here, let's suppose there's a bulb or whatever you call it, light source in general. We say, sir, over here, so the light which is coming out of this light source is this light a particle? I'll make these particles over here. I'll make these particles over here. Is this light made up of particles? Okay. Or, or my dear people, this, this, let's suppose we say, is this light, we say, I'll represent the wave something like this. Is this light made up of a wave? Is this light a particle which is coming out of this? Okay. Or is this light, is this light a particle which is coming out of the light source? This was the basic question that people actually had. This was the basic question that people actually had. Now listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. Some physicists actually came. They said, sir, this light is basically made up of particles. This light is a particle. And some people said this light is a wave. Okay. Now, different number of other people actually came. They said to the ones who used to say light is made up of particles or light is a particle. What are the proofs that you actually have? So they said, we have the strong proofs. What is that? We say, sir, photoelectric effect, photoelectric, photoelectric effect. Okay. Listen to me very carefully. We say Compton effect. We say black body radiation. So in photoelectric effect that we have to study after some time, 
वट एवर आई टेल यू जस्ट कीप ऑन रिमेम्बरिंग दिस डू नॉट यूज युअर माइंड ओके लीव दैट अप टू मी आई डू दैट यू जस्ट हैव टू रिमेम्बर वट एवर वी आई से ओके बिकॉज यू जस्ट हैव टू क्रैक द नीट यू डोंट हैव टू बिकम द फिजिसिस्ट ओवर ह्यूर सो द अमाउंट ऑफ इन्फॉर्मेशन विच आई गिव यू जस्ट टेक दैट ओनली सो वी से सर द प्रूफ दैट वी एक्चुअली हैव दिस लाइट इज अ पार्टिकल द प्रूफ दैट वी एक्चुअली हैव दिस लाइट इज अ पार्टिकल is basically which one is basically photoelectric effect just a second just a second i'll put it on this one Sorry, 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 guys. Okay, back, 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 back to the session. Are you able to see everything? Okay. Can you guys see me? Can you guys see me? Is it clear? Is it clear, guys? Let me know in the live chat. Is it clear to each and every one? Is it clear? Is it clear? Let me know. Okay. Okay. Great. Now see. Let's come back to the story. Let's come back to the story. See, we say, sir. the ones who were claiming that this light is made up of particles what proof they actually have photoelectric effect because we say in photoelectric effect if we consider light as a particle then only this photoelectric effect can be proven okay then only this photoelectric effect can take place now what are the proofs for those people who said light is a wave we say sir young's double slit experiment ydsc that will be studying in the wave optics or we say sir interference that is one and the same thing we say diffraction okay so these are the proofs strong proofs these guys have these are the strong proofs these guys have okay now my dear friends finally we came to know light is having the dual nature we say light light has light has dual dual nature nature so it depends it depends we'll have to study this in detail okay it depends upon with what light is interacting with listen to me very carefully sir the first question with which i started in this particular chapter is the light which is coming out of the light source is this light made up of particles or this part is made up of waves so we say sir some people said light is made up of particles okay what was the proof they had we say sir photoelectric effect and some people said this light is a wave what was the proof they have we say sir young's double slit experiment interference or diffraction okay and and my dear friends when it comes to the wave optics listen to me very carefully sir in case of wave optics we consider light as a wave we consider over there light as a wave but here 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 in this chapter in this chapter listen to me very carefully we say we consider we consider light light is a particle 
we consider light as a particle. In this particular chapter, we consider light as a particle. Means from now onwards, if I say, if I say, sir, there is a light source we actually have over here. Sir, from this light source, the light is coming out. What does that mean? Means these are the particles which are coming out of the light source, okay? Because in this chapter, we have to consider the light as a particle. And in wave optics, we consider the light as a wave. Because interference is only possible when you consider the light as a wave. So we say, sir, we say, sir, over here, this light is made up of particles. So from now onwards, you will remember one thing, sir, this light is a particle when it comes to this chapter. Over here, we'll consider light as a particle. And this, this particle, this particle is known as, this is what we call the photon, okay? This is what we call the photon. So we say, we say light is made up of, made up of small, tiny particles, tiny particles called, called photons, called photons. So we say light is made up of small, tiny particles and those particles are what we call the photons. So basically, from now onwards, if I say, sir, I have a light source over here. From that light source, light is coming out. What does that mean? That means these are the photons which are coming out of that light source. Okay. So these are the photons. So we say, what are these photons? Any other definition, sir? We say, sir, these photons are also called, we say, packets. Packets of energy. Packets of energy. This photon is nothing but energy. This photon is nothing but energy. This photon is nothing but energy. Is it lagging, guys? Is it lag or this is clear, guys? Let me know in the live chat. Is it lagging? I don't think so. Okay, 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 okay. Great, 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 great. Make sure you hit the like button. Okay. So, so we say, sir, the light is made up of small, small, tiny particles, which are called photons. And those photons are what we call the packets of energy. Okay. Now, my dear friends, let's come on to the first topic that we have to study over here in this particular chapter. That's what we call the energy of a photon. Sir, if I say, if I say, if I say, we have got a light source over here. We have got a light source over here. Sir, what does light source mean? Light source means from which light is coming out, which provides light. We say, sir, this is light. This is light source. Okay. And sir, we say these are the photons which are coming out of the light source. And these photons are only called the, 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 these, the these photons are only called, they, they basically, we call it light. Okay. And light is made up of these photons. Now you say, sir, these photons have energy. Yes. How much energy does these photons actually have? Energy of a photon. Listen to me very carefully. We say, we say, we say. Guys, is there any sound problem? Are you able to hear? Am I audible? Why are you mentioning in the live chat sound, no sound? Okay, okay, okay. So we say, sir, when it comes to the energy of photon, when it comes to the energy of photon, Remember from now onwards, when we say energy of a photon, we say you multiply this H with this F. Sir, what is this H? H means Planck's constant. Planck's constant. And this F means, sir, frequency. This F means frequency. So whenever you multiply frequency with Planck's constant, you get the energy of photon. Sir, is, is there any derivation for this particular particular formula we say sir no there is no derivation you just have to remember it directly whenever you multiply Planck's constant with the frequency you get the energy of photon you get the energy of photon okay as simple as that as simple as that as simple as that so we say my dear friends listen to me very carefully 
We also say, sir, when it comes to this frequency, we say, sir, this frequency is C divided by lambda. This frequency is C divided by lambda. Okay. Now, if you put, what is C? C is the speed of light. C is speed of light. Speed of light. And this lambda is, we say, wavelength. This lambda is wavelength. Now, if you put this in the equation first, instead of this F, you can write the energy of photon as, you can write the energy of photon as, that is H C divided by lambda. This is what we call the energy of a photon. This is what we call the energy of a photon. Okay. Simply from now onwards, if someone asks you, sir, is this light made up of waves or particles? You say, sir, this light is made up of particles. And those particles are what we call the photons. And those photons are having the energy. How much energy a photon actually has? We say, sir, it is H into F. H is Planck's constant. F is frequency. Okay. Frequency, we further say C divided by lambda. C is speed of light. Lambda is a wavelength. And if you put it in the equation, first you will get E is equal to HC divided by lambda. Now, you guys tell me one thing. You guys tell me one thing. See. When it comes to, when it comes to the Planck's constant, H, what is the value of H? We say, sir, the value of H is 6.6 .6 into 10 raised power minus 34, we say joule second. This is the value of, this is the value of, we say, sir, Planck's constant. Like you have Coulomb's constant, K, 9 into 10 raised power 9. You have universal gravitational constant. Similarly, you have Planck's constant. Now, my dear friends, I say, sir, when it comes to the speed of light, we say speed of light is 3 into 10 raised power 8 meter per second. As simple as that. Yes. Now, now, if you guys put these values into the equation number first, let's call as equation number first. So we say put, put in equation number first. Put in equation number first. Now see, what we can write over here, E is equal to HC divided by lambda. Sir, this is HC divided by lambda. So instead of H, I can put it as value. So we say 6.6 .6 into 10 raised power minus 34. Then multiply with HC. C is 3 into 10 raised power 8. Okay. Then divided by, then divided by lambda. Then divided by lambda. And if you solve this, this will come out to be, listen to me very carefully, 2 into, 2 into, approximately it will come out to be 2 into, 10 raised power minus 25 divided by lambda. 2 into 10 raised power minus 25 divided by lambda in joules. So we say, we say this is, this is the energy of a photon. This is the energy. This is the energy, energy of a photon, of a photon in joules, in joules. This is the energy of a photon in joules. Remember this from now onwards. Is it clear? Is it clear? Is it clear? Let me know in the live chat, guys. Is it clear to each and everyone? When it comes to the energy of a photon, we say it is 2 into 10 raised power minus 25 divided by lambda. Okay? Simple, simple explanation I'm giving you over here. No complicated things. Okay? Just the basic things. Yes. Now, Guys, this is the energy of a photon in joules. But when it comes to the modern physics, listen to me very carefully. When it comes to the modern physics, we calculate the energy in electron volts mostly. We do not say, sir, this is a photon which is falling on my hand. It has the energy of 50 joules. No, we say it has the energy of, let's suppose, 50 electron volts, 20 electron volts. Like, like, we say, sir, we have got 1 kg, 1 kg rice over here. Some other person will say, sir, we have got 1000 grams. Okay. So, we say, sir, kg is also the unit, grams is also the unit. Okay. Similarly, in this case, we can measure the energy in joules as well as in electron volts. As well as in electron volts. Listen to me very carefully. I'll write the same statement over here. We say, here... In modern physics, in modern physics, we mostly, mostly calculate, calculate energy in 
electron volts okay electron volt is also the another basically unit over here okay so my dear friends listen to me very clear yes yes lambda is in meters over here lambda is in meters over here 100 percent now see here we have to calculate we have to calculate the energy of a photon in electron volts this is the energy of a photon in joules how do we calculate see see i'll tell you over here i'll tell you over here one thing you guys remember one thing you guys remember sir what is that see we say sir 1.6 into 10 raised power minus 19 joules it is equal to one electron volt like we say sir one kg is equal to 1000 grams similarly over here 1.6 into 10 raised power minus 19 joules is equal to one electron volt is equal to one electron volt okay okay is it clear so we say my dear friends if we calculate the value of this j joule over here one joule so we say sir this j will come out to be one electron volt upon this 1.6 into 10 raised power minus 19 okay and this ev is over here on now let's call this as equation number second i want you guys to put in equation number second i want you guys to put it over here in the equation number second now listen to me very carefully my dear friends we say sir energy of photon will come out to be 2 into 10 raised power minus 25 divided by we say sir lambda and then instead of this 1j or j can we put the value this over here 110 percent sir we can say multiplied by so this will be one electron volt upon 1.6 into 10 raised power minus 19 minus 19 i will show you all the questions over here i'll show you every formula that that too from the to basics and that will be to the point see 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 sir when we solve this particular particular equation over here when we solve this so what we will get over here on solving this on solving the above equation above equation if we solve the above equation listen to me very carefully what we are going to get over here is what we are going to get over here is we say sir we'll get energy of photon is equal to one two four zero if we solve this we'll get the energy of photon one two four zero divided by lambda but this lambda is in nanometer okay and the total energy is in electron volts my dear people my dear people so you have to you have to keep this thing in your mind from now onwards so basically basically over here over here we say sir this is the energy of a photon this is the energy of a photon in electron volts on solving this particular equation you will get the value of energy of photon in electron volts as one two four zero but lambda is in nanometers also 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 i'll write over here also i'll write over here also we can get if you solve this question if you, if you solve this equation you can get this value also energy of a photon is equal to one two four double zero previously it was one two four zero now it is one two four double zero divided by we say lambda but right now lambda is in angstrom but the energy is in electron volts guys guys i know you are confused right now but i'll take the confusion out just give me two seconds see on solving this particular formula i don't have to go in depth and solve it over here we'll get this one we'll get this one energy of a photon this energy of a photon we got in electron volts but 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 the lambda is in nanometer if you put one two four zero in the numerator but if you put one two four double zero in the numerator then we say in that case lambda is in angstrom but the energy is in electron volts energy is in electron volts is it clear guys let me know in the live chat let me know in the live chat everybody of you is it clear is it clear Is it clear? With the fire emojis, everybody, everybody, guys. With the fire emojis. If this is clear to each and everyone, all the people out there. 
great great and if you have not liked the session yet make sure you hit the like button as soon as possible okay like this particular session as simple as that and make the like count 300 plus okay great 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 now see now see so you got the energy of a photon as 12400 but lambda is in nanometer what i'm trying to say is that listen to me very carefully see guys i'll make you understand sir let's go over here when it comes to the energy of a photon sir this is the basic formula for energy of a photon h into f Planck's constant multiplied by frequency and and you can write it something like this also hc divided by lambda so this is also the energy of a photon okay you have got two formulas as of now then we further discussed sir this is also the energy of a photon but this is the energy of a photon in joules and this lambda is in meters over here and then you have got the next formula for energy of a photon this is also the energy of a photon but this energy is in electron volts and lambda is in nanometers. Then you have got one more formula for energy of photon that is this one. This energy is also in electron volts but lambda is in we say angstrom. Now listen to me very carefully. I'll give you the feel. Let me give you the feel of this one. Let me give you the feel of all these equations. I'll tell you which equation you have to use at what time exactly. Listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. See, let's suppose I am asking you, I have got a photon over here. This is a photon. This is a photon falling. Okay. This is a photon coming from some light source. And this photon has got a wavelength of, listen to me very carefully. This photon has got a wavelength of, let's suppose 400 nanometer over here. Okay. And I am asking you to tell me the energy of photon, energy of photon in, in, electron volts energy of photon in electron volts see lambda is given in nanometers and you have to find the energy of photon in electron volts directly you will be using this one sir energy of photon in electron volts when lambda is given in nanometers so we say you can use this formula energy of photon is 1240 divided by lambda and this will give you the energy of photon and if I just tell you, my dear friends, we have got one more photon over here. But the wavelength of this photon is given in, let's suppose we say in angstrom. Let's suppose it has got 4000 angstrom is the wavelength. And I'm asking you to tell me the energy of a photon in, in electron volts, not in joules. So in that case, we'll be using this formula. When lambda is given in angstrom, and you need to find the energy of photon in electron volts, then use this one. So we'll be using the formula EP is equal to 12400 divided by lambda in electron volts. Over here, this one, over here, this one. And if lambda is given in meters, then you will have to find the energy in joules. You can use this formula. You can use this formula. Is it sorted, guys? Is it sorted, guys? Let me know. Is it sorted? Is it sorted? Everything. Let me know in the live chat. Is it clear, guys? I need to. I, I want. I want to see your Josh. I want to see the fire emojis in the live chat. Okay. Everybody out there. Great, 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 great. Now, 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 let's move on to the question that we actually have over here. The question is, what is the energy in joules associated with a photon of wavelength 4000 angstrom? Also, I'll write over here. Also, find the energy of photon in, in, we say electron volts. See, in this particular question, what is given is that, in this particular question, what is given is that, we have got a photon over here. Okay, let's suppose this is a photon. And this photon has a wavelength of, we say, sir, 4000 angstrom over here. 
we need to find the energy of a photon energy of a photon in in we say sir joules in joules and and in electron volts we have to find the energy of a photon in joules as well as as well as as well as in electron volts in ev as well as in joules now my dear friends if we solve this particular question over here sir energy of photon is given in angstrom we have to find the energy in electron volts which formula we will be using sir when lambda is in angstrom and we need to find the energy in electron volts so we'll be using this formula so we'll have to use the formula over here as as we say sir energy of photon is 12400 divided by lambda and this lambda is in angstrom this will give us the energy of a photon in electron volts so i can write over here energy of a photon is 12400 divided by what is the value of lambda that is 4000 in this case that is 4000 in this case and this will be electron volts so how much this will be so energy of photon will be 3.1 electron volts so energy of a photon is 3.1 electron volts over here is that clear guys is that clear now tell me now to find we say sir energy in to find energy in joules see 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 if we have to find the energy in joules which formula we will be using so we'll use the formula e is equal to sir this one this one this one this one this one this one 2 into 10 raised power minus 25 divided by lambda and in joules this is in meters over here okay so we say we say sir in this case we'll be using 2 into 10 raised power minus 25 divided by we say lambda and this will give us the energy in joules over here is this clear to each and every one guys is this clear to each and every one guys i want everybody of you to tell me over here is this clear to each and every one so we say sir in this case we can write sir this is nothing but 2 into 10 raised to the power minus 25 divided by lambda this lambda is in meters but we are given the lambda in angstrom so we have to convert this in meter so we say this is 4000 into 10 raised to the power minus 10 when you multiply 10 raised to the power minus 10 with this one it will become in meters okay and then solve this will get the answer is it clear to each and every one so this will come out to be 0.5 into 10 raised to the power we say minus 18 over here okay joules is that clear is that clear let me know in the live chat is it clear to each and every one okay so whenever you have to find the energy in joules you will be using this formula but instead of this lambda which is given in angstrom you have to convert this in meter so multiply with 10 raised to the power minus 10 so let you will get the answer over here now comes basically the next topic that is what we call now comes basically the next topic that is what we call energy of light that is what we call energy of light or energy of a radiation energy of a radiation listen to me very carefully what does light mean see Let's suppose I'll take a light source over here. I'm taking the light source over here. This is a light source. This is a light source. Sir, what does light source actually mean? Light source means from which light is actually coming out. From which light is actually coming out. Okay. So I am representing this light with the help of small particles or we say, sir, photons over here. So we say these are what we call photons. now you guys tell me one thing my dear friends i'm asking you the simple question i'm asking you the simple question sir these photons basically make light either you say this is light coming out or you say these are the photons coming out it is one and the same thing it is one and the same thing either you say this is light coming out or you say these are the photons coming out this is one and the same thing now as we know as we know sir energy of one photon sir energy of one photon is h into f planck's constant multiplied by the frequency now sir when it comes to the light complete light we say there are n number of photons coming out 
it is not just one photon only there are n photons so we say light is made up of up of we say sir n photons light is made up of n photons so can we say in that particular case my dear friends can we say in that particular case sir for one photon energy is hf sir we say sir energy for n photons energy for n photons is n h into f or energy for 10 photons 10 hf energy for n photons is n hf and these n photons are basically called light so this will be the energy of light only so from now onwards my dear friends what you will remember is that we say sir energy of light energy of light is simply n h f or you say sir n h instead of f we can say c by lambda n h c by lambda so this will be the energy of light that you can that you remember from now onwards so we say sir nhc divided by lambda and from over here from over here you can also find the number of photons so this n can be multiplied over here so this will be sir e into lambda divided by hc and this is what we call the energy this is what we call the number of photons where n is number of photons is it clear guys is it clear guys let me know in the live chat when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to energy of light nhc divided by lambda and when it comes to the number of photons we say e lambda into hc e lambda divided by hc hc Yes, 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 yes. I'll tell you, I'll, I'll make you understand. When it comes to the energy of light, we say, sir, energy, energy of one photon is H into F. So this light is not made up of only one photon. It is made up of N number of photons. So we say these are N photons. So for N number of photons, energy will be simply NHF. For two photons, it is 2HF. For 100 photons it is 100 hf so energy of n photons means energy of light because when it comes to the light it is made up of n photons so we say sir energy of light is nothing but n hf instead of f i am putting c by lambda because f is equal to c by lambda so n h c by lambda is it clear Is it clear? Because we are dealing with the photons only. Light is made up of photons. That's why I'm considering the energy of a photon over here. Okay. Is that clear, guys? Okay, great. Is okay, great, great. Enough, enough. Let's come on to this one. Let's come on to this one. That is momentum of a photon. Momentum of a photon. Listen to me very carefully. My dear friends, when it comes to the momentum of a photon, we say, sir, this momentum P, it is simply, we say, sir, H divided by lambda. H divided by lambda. What is H? This H is what we call, sir, Planck's, Planck's constant. And when it comes to the lambda, this lambda is what we call the wavelength or de Broglie wavelength. Okay? So, like I told you, whenever we talk about the energy of a photon, we say H into F. Planck's constant multiplied by frequency, that will give you the energy of a photon. But whenever we talk about the momentum of a photon, I say you take Planck's constant and divide it with de Broglie wavelength, you will get the momentum of a photon. Directly, there is no derivation for this. Directly, you have to remember over here. Okay. Now, now. Further, we'll, we'll, we'll basically get some relations over here that will uh, I'll help you. See, as, as we say energy of a photon is equal to hc divided by lambda. Sir, this is a momentum of a photon. P means momentum. P means momentum. We represent momentum with sir P. So, P, P is equal to h by lambda. So, when it comes to the energy of a photon, we say it is hc divided by lambda. Okay. Now, this h by lambda. 
can we put instead of h by lambda as p yes so we say we say this is basically energy of photon energy of a photon now instead of h by lambda i can put p so we can say e is equal to p into c so what is this sir this is nothing but this is nothing but this is what we call this this is the relation this is the relation between we say momentum this is the relation between momentum and energy of a photon this is the relation between momentum and energy of a photon energy of a photon this is the relation between momentum and energy of a photon and energy of a photon okay now now my dear people my dear people listen to me very carefully listen to me very carefully so we said this is the relation between momentum and energy of a photon now if you do one thing if you do one thing over here sir instead of this e we'll put once again hc divided by lambda sir what are you doing i'm just playing with these equations okay that's it so we say hc divided by lambda is equal to sir what is the another formula for momentum that we have studied in the mechanics p is equal to p is equal to m into v p is equal to m into v so we say we can write over here p is equal to m into c because photon moves with the speed of light photon moves with the speed of light so over here instead of velocity we say sir c whenever a mass is moving with some velocity v it has got the momentum m into v over sure photon moves with the speed of light so we say m into c so instead of this p we can write m into c and then this c will be c square now this c and this square we can cancel over sure and we can get this further this m will be equal to take this c and divide it over here so this will be h by lambda c this is what we call the moving mass of photon this is the moving mass of a photon this is a moving mass of a photon is that clear is that clear is it lagging guys is it lagging let me know in the live chat okay okay tajamal you have problem in your laptop i guess check it okay 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 so basically momentum of a photon is h by lambda and this is the relation between momentum and energy of a photon and from this we got the moving mass of photon when the photon is moving how much mass does it have that's what we call the momentum of a photon see this c square comes instead of p i am writing m into c and then you have this c m into c into c that is m c square over here Oh, Tajamul is a sincere student, he is not a spammer. Oh. He has watched all the one shots from the beginning, from the scratch. Okay. Now, 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 let's come on to over here. That is the power of light. That is the power of light. Listen to me very carefully. What does power of light actually mean? What does power of light actually mean? See, I would recommend you guys to do one thing. Make a separate formula sheet for all the formulas that I'll be showing you in the modern physics today. Because when it comes to the modern physics, it's completely formula based, okay? So you have to remember each and every single formula. You have to keep that in your mind, okay? Now, let's come on to the power of light. Sir, what does power of light actually mean? Listen to me very carefully. Let's suppose, let's suppose I say, I say, I have over here, I have over here. Let's suppose I have over here. Two light sources. I'll make the two light sources over here. Let's suppose I have two light sources over here. I have got two light sources over here. Okay. Let's suppose 
this is the first one which I actually have. This is the first one which I actually have. This is the first light source which I actually have. Okay. And this is the second one which I actually have. Okay. Cool. Now, my dear friends, this is the source one and this is the source two over here. Sir, what does a light source actually mean? Light source means which provides light, which gives light. Okay. So basically, this is the light which is coming out of this light source one. This is the light which is coming out of this light source one. So light means photons. That's why I'm representing this with the help of the photons over here. So these are the photons which are coming out of this light source over here. Okay. Yes. So these are the photons. These are basically the photons. And more specifically, if I say this is what we call energy. Okay. Either you say this is energy coming out. Or you say these are the photons coming out. It's one and the same thing. Okay. Now in this second case, over here also we say, sir, photons are coming out. These are the photons coming out in case of second source. Okay. These are the photons coming out in, in case of the second source. Energy coming out of in case second source. Tell me one thing. Tell me one thing. If I say every second, every second from which one? more light is coming out or more energy is coming out what is the difference between s1 and s2 over here what is the difference between s1 and s2 over here sir we say sir more energy more energy is coming out i'll write over here more energy is coming coming out from s1 source from s1 source every second every every second and my dear friends i can say sir less energy is coming out less energy less energy less energy less energy is coming coming out from s2 source s2 source we say every 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 second over here more energy is coming out from s1 source every second less energy is coming out from every source coming out so we say we say my dear friends my dear friends in this particular case in this particular case we say this has got less power so we say sir power of s1 is more more than more than s2 this has got more power this has got less power it is simple you have got the two bulbs at your home okay one is giving more brightness more energy means the power is more another is giving less brightness means less energy we say sir power is less so what is the actual formula for the power that i'll write over here so when it comes to the power we say sir it is nothing but energy I'll write over here, power is defined, defined as energy per, per second. Energy coming out of a light source every second. And we can write this power as, this is energy per second means energy upon time, energy upon time. Okay, so further we can write this power is simply what is the formula for energy, sir? We know, sir, energy of light is simply NHC divided by lambda. Okay, so just put it over here. So this will be NHC divided by lambda into T. So this is the formula for power. This is the formula for power. Is that clear? How much energy is coming out every second? How much energy is coming out every second? Is that clear, my dear friends? Let me know in the live chat. Let me know in the live chat, guys. Let me know in the live chat, guys. Is it clear to each and everyone? Is it clear to each and everyone over here? So from now onwards, if anyone asks, what is the power? You simply say, sir, when it comes to the power, it is how much energy is coming out from a light source every second. If more energy is coming out, we say, sir, energy, we say, sir, power is more. If less energy is coming out, we say, sir, power is less. As simple as that. You have got the two bulbs at your home. One is giving more brightness. 
more photons are coming out, more is the power. Another is giving less power. Great, great, great. And make sure you like this particular session, okay? Make sure you like this particular session. Everybody out there, guys. Everybody out there. I want you guys to make it 400 now, okay? The target is increasing. The target is increasing. Make it 400 right now. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Great, 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 great. Okay? Now, now, listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. That is nothing but... Okay, this is a good question. The question is basically, see over here. Sir, NR, NB... NR and NB be respectively the number of photons emitted by a red bulb and blue bulb. Power in the given time is same. Which is emitting more number of photons? Okay, let me make you understand this question over here. See, let's suppose we have got the red bulb over here. Let's suppose we have got, we have got the red bulb over here. So this is the red bulb, okay? This is the red bulb, red bulb. So, this is providing the light over here. I am showing this red bulb with the help of red color over here. So, this is basically red bulb. A red bulb. Okay. And, and if this red bulb is giving light means this is giving photons. Let's suppose NR. NR means number of photons coming out of the red bulb. NR. Okay. And we have got the blue bulb over here. Let me make the blue bulb with this color. This is blue bulb. So we say, let's suppose this is the blue bulb. Let's suppose this is the blue bulb over here. Let's suppose this is the blue bulb. So we say these are the photons coming out of the blue bulb. Okay. The photons coming out of the blue bulb. The photons coming out of the blue bulb and this will be sir NB. Number of photons. Number of NR and NB be the respectively the number of photons emitted by a red bulb and a blue bulb. Okay. And we say sir power of red. We say sir power of red. Power means how much energy is coming out. Power of red is equal to the power of blue. We say sir power of red is equal to the power of blue. In this case, it is given that, so the energy coming out of this bulb, every second is same as the energy coming out of this bulb, every second, because power is same. Power means energy per second. How much energy is coming out every second? We say, sir, power of red bulb is given as power of blue bulb. You guys are supposed to tell me which have more number of photons which emit which emit which emit more number of photons you have to compare nr and you have to compare nb which will actually emit more number of photons that's what you guys need to tell me in this particular case i want everybody of you to answer this particular question over here all the people out there all the people out there and one more thing i just want to tell you see when it comes to the frequency of red we say, sir, frequency of red is less than frequency of blue. This is what I'm telling you from here only. If you say frequency of this red, it is less than the frequency of blue. Tell me, which will emit more number of photons over here? Which will give more number of photons? Power is same in both. okay now see my dear friends sir when it comes to the formula for power what is the formula for power we say sir that is n h f divided by t f means c by lambda you can also say n h c by lambda into t or you say n h f divided by t now over here if you write the power of red, you can directly write number of photons of red. Okay. Number of photons of red. Then you have Planck's constant. Okay. Then you have frequency of red. 
डिवाइडेड बाय टाइम टी लैंग्स कांस्टेंट इज एच टाइम इज टी ओवर हियर इट इज इक्वल टू पावर ऑफ ब्लू यू कैन राइट नंबर ऑफ फोटॉन्स ऑफ ब्लू एच लैंग्स कांस्टेंट इज सेम ओवर हियर आल्सो हियर आल्सो एंड फ्रीक्वेंसी ऑफ ब्लू डिवाइडेड बाय टाइम टी नाउ दिस 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 विल गेट कैंसिल आउट ओवर हियर सो व्हाट रिमेंस इन दिस केस वी से नंबर ऑफ फोटॉन्स ऑफ रेड फ्रीक्वेंसी ऑफ रेड इज इक्वल टू नंबर ऑफ फोटॉन्स ऑफ ब्लू into frequency of blue means the product of these two is equal to the product of these two now what i have told you in this case is that frequency of red is less than the frequency of blue remember this my dear friends frequency of red is less than the frequency of blue so if if listen to me very carefully frequency of red is less we say frequency of blue is more and frequency of red is less but but you can clearly see over here the product of these two is equal to the product of these two product of these two is equal to the product of these two see over here if we say this quantity is more we say this quantity has to be less then only this would be equal to this one so over here if this quantity is less this quantity has to be more because their product is equal if we say sir this is more and this is also more so both becomes more then this th these two will not be equal to these two so we say in this case if this frequency of blue is more the number of photons of red has to be less why because this term has to be equal to this term so we say sir number of photons of red are greater than number of photons of blue so this will give more number of photons in that case is that clear my dear friends let me know in the live chat everybody guys tell me is that clear is that clear crystal clear to each and every one is that crystal clear to each and every one my dear people let me know with the fire emojis everybody and i want you guys to make the like count I want you guys to make it 400, okay? As soon as, as soon as possible, ASAP. Okay, great, 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 great. Now let's come on. let's come on let's come on to this one yes yes ncrt examples are very important for the neat yes that's for sure now see intensity of light what does intensity of light mean listen to me very carefully let's suppose i have got the light sources over here i have got two light sources over here let's suppose i have got two light sources over here sir this is the first light source i actually have which provides the light okay and this is the and this is the next light source i have over here okay this is the next light source i have actually over here okay so we say this is what we call s1 and this is what we call s2 these are the two light sources we actually have over here my dear friends i say this light source is providing me the light means it is sending the number of photons these are the number of photons over here these are the number of photons coming out of the s1 and when it comes to sir s2 we say sir these are the number of photons coming out of the s2 these are the number of photons coming out of s2 number of photons means light coming out of s2 number of photons means light coming off out of s2 now you guys tell me one thing i'm asking you the simple question over here that is what is the difference between s1 and s2 what is the difference between s1 and s2 what is the difference between s1 and s2 tell me over here what is the difference between s1 and s2 sir you say in this case in this case clearly sir in s1 we say more number of photons more number of photons are coming out coming coming out every second are coming out every second one more thing i just want to add over here is that 
let's suppose i'll keep a sheet over here i'll keep a sheet over here so that these photons actually fall on this particular sheet on this particular sheet now my dear friends i'm asking you one single question if i take a unit area this is what we call unit area unit area over here and if i take the unit area over here also unit area and over here unit area also you tell me one thing i am asking you the simple question in this case we say sir less number of photons in s2 sorry in s2 in s2 in s2 we say sir in this case we say sir in this case We say, sir, in this case, see, less number of photons are coming out every second and falling on the unit area. In this case, more number of photons are coming out every second and falling on this area. Why? Because the number of photons over here is more, number of photons over here is less. That's what I'm saying. In S2, in case of S2, more number of photons are coming out every second and falling and falling on the unit area on the unit unit area on the unit area okay so we say in this case my dear friends so so intensity intensity of s2 is more than the intensity of than the intensity of than the intensity of we say sir s1 we say intensity of S2 is more than the intensity of S1. Why? Because more number of photons or we say more energy is coming out every second and falling on the unit area. If you take this unit area, every second more energy is falling on this one as compared to this unit area. So we say that's why intensity of this is more as compared to the intensity of this so i can define intensity over here listen to me very carefully i can define intensity over here see so we say intensity is defined defined as energy falling energy falling photons falling or energy falling every second every second or per second per unit area per unit area so we say how much energy is falling on the unit area every second if it is more we say intensity is more if it is less we say intensity is less so we can clearly say over here intensity of two is greater than intensity of one so if we have to write the formula for intensity we say sir intensity is simply sir energy falling every second means energy okay upon we say sir energy falling every second energy upon time multiplied by per unit area on unit area so we say area so you can further write it something like this on the next screen we can write sir when it comes to the intensity sir it is energy upon time into area so we say intensity is what is the formula for energy sir n h f this is energy divided by a into t this is the formula for energy that you can keep in your mind over here okay and also further you can write it something like this you can write it something like this instead of f you can write c by lambda intensity will be simply n h c divided by lambda a t okay so this is basically the intensity this is the intensity this is how we actually define intensity is that clear is that clear guys let me know semiconductor is next we'll see later on which chapters we'll be doing okay right now focus on this one which we are studying i'll I have to teach you guys semiconductors also. I have to teach you guys optics also. So now what is only those two chapters are remaining now. Rest of the 12th part we are done. Only we have optics and semiconductors.
just the two marathons. So I'll show you both. Don't worry about that. Tell me in the live chat. Is this clear to each and everyone how we define intensity? Intensity means how many number of photons or how much energy is coming out? How much energy is falling on unit area every second? If every second energy is falling on unit area is more, then we say intensity is more. Great, great. Now, an important question which I want you guys to exactly focus on over here. What is that? The question is, take a look on the screen. When the intensity of light, when the intensity of light source is increased, when the intensity of light source is increased, just a second, I'll switch off this AC. You guys are supposed to tell me in this particular question, which one is correct and which one is incorrect. This is a good question actually. When the intensity of light source is increased, okay, the number of photons emitted by the source in unit time increases. See, it is saying that, let's suppose we have got a source over here. We have got a source over here. Let's suppose we have got a source over here, okay. This is a light source light source and we say sir from the light source light is coming out this is the light which is coming out of the light source this is the light which is coming out of the light source listen to me very carefully it is saying that if the intensity is increased if the intensity of this light source is increased the number of photons emitted by the source is increased see sir this is the formula for intensity take the formula for intensity put it over here I is equal to N H C divided by lambda A into T. This is the formula for intensity. N H C divided by lambda A T. See, my dear friends, it is saying that if intensity is increased, if we increase this quantity, if we increase this quantity, what will happen to the number of photons per second? Sir, Intensity is directly proportional to the number of photons per second. Number of photons, simply you say, sir, we say in this case, we say in this case, intensity is directly proportional to the number of photons. So if intensity is increased, we say number of photons will also increase. So this one is correct. Option A is correct. Second, second, the total energy of the photons emitted per unit time increases. Sir, what does total energy of photons mean? See, total energy of photons. Sir, when it comes to energy of one photon, it is H into F. Total energy of photons is how much, sir? That is NHF. My dear friends, if because of intensity, number of photons increases, if because of intensity, number of photons are increased, so we say if number of photons increase, simply we say total energy will increase as total energy E total is proportional to number of photons. If number of photons increase, we say obviously total energy will increase. So this is also true. This is also true. Is it clear? Is it clear? Okay. Okay. You can write it something like this also. E is equal to NHC divided by lambda into lambda into T. Okay, because F is equal to C by lambda. Now see, energy, this is total energy of photons is directly proportional to N by T. So number of photons per unit time increases. Number of photons per unit time increases. So we say this energy is proportional to the number of photons per unit time is directly proportional. So this is also true. What about the third one? Is option C correct or incorrect? Is option C correct or incorrect? Is option C correct or incorrect? See, you have got, this is multiple correct. Guys, why are you getting confused? This is multiple correct. This is also correct. This is also correct. 
This is a multiple correct question. Is C correct or incorrect? C is saying more energetic photons are emitted. C, C, more energetic photons are emitted. It is saying that, let's suppose you have got a light source over here. So we say, sir, from the light source, light is coming out. Just a second. Wait a second, guys. See, it is saying that more energetic photons are coming. What does that mean? If I say, sir, these are the photons which are coming out of a light source. Now, now, if you increase the intensity, if you increase the intensity, sir, intensity is proportional to number of photons. Number of photons can increase. But energy of a single photon remains same. Energy of this single photon, it remains same. Total energy will increase. Why? Because if number of photons increase, so total energy increases. But when it comes to energy of one photon, it's just h into f. So energy of one photon does not depend upon n. It does not depend upon number of photons. So we say energy of one photon, of one photon, or every photon individually remains same. Remains same. Hey, if you have to increase the energy of a photon, you have to increase the frequency. Then only the energy of photon can increase. So we say option C is incorrect. More energetic photons are coming out. This is incorrect. And then you have faster photons are emitted. What does faster photon mean? Photon moves with the speed of light. Photon moves with the speed of light. So we say, sir, speed of light is maximum 3 into 10 raised power 8 meter per second. So same is the speed for photon. It cannot exceed that. We cannot say faster photons. So this one incorrect, this one incorrect, this one and this one are correct. A and B is correct, C and D is incorrect. Is it clear? Okay. Now, 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 now. Let's come on to this particular question over here. Let's come on to this question. Tell me, if the intensity of light is doubled, then the number of photons will be if the intensity of light is doubled then the number of photons will be same double half none none which one which one if the intensity see when it comes to the intensity we say sir intensity is n h f divided by a into t okay so clearly we say over here intensity is proportional to the number of photons but there is one glitch guys what is that glitch let me just tell you in this particular question we say nothing is mentioned about the frequency when nothing is mentioned about the frequency then take frequency as constant when nothing is mentioned <clears throat> mentioned about the frequency then take frequency as constant because frequency of a given source because frequency of a given source of a given source is same if you take one particular source, we say frequency of a given source, we consider same. So if this is constant, H is constant already, frequency also constant, area and time are the external parameters. So we say I is directly proportional to N. In this case, we say I is directly proportional to N. When nothing is mentioned about the frequency, we say, sir, in that case, I is directly proportional to N and frequency is considered to be the constant. Next question. If the frequency of light and if the intensity of light and frequency both become double in this particular question is do you think that something is mentioned about the frequency in the question yes so over here you cannot say frequency is constant we say here here f is not constant 
That's why I told you, if nothing is mentioned about the frequency, take it constant for a given source. Take it constant for a given source. But, but, my dear friends, if we say, sir, in a question it is mentioned, then you have to take it. Now, see, we say, sir, intensity is equal to N H F divided by A into T. This is the formula for intensity. Now, H is constant. And this A and T, area and time are the external parameters. Consider these constant also, take it out. So we say in this case, intensity is equal to N into F, N into F. Now, now we say, sir, if we calculate the number of photons over here, that will be I divided by F. In this case, my dear friends, when it comes to the intensity, if intensity of light and frequency both become double, so it is saying that if this becomes double 2i and frequency also becomes double 2f. So we say again, we say number of photons will remain same. See, if you are doubling this, doubling this, this also again will get cancelled out. So we say, sir, number of photons will remain same. Is it clear? You can join our telegram channel where you will not get the pdf okay i'll share the pdfs over there you can join our telegram channel actually and you can join my personal telegram channel that is we say sir yawar manzoor e dot m e slash yawar manzoor this is my telegram channel okay over here i keep on sharing the material in this telegram channel you guys can join it okay join it as soon as possible and over there, I'll be sharing the PDFs, each and everything. T.me slash Yawar Manzoor. Okay. The name of the channel is Yawar Manzoor Physics. And this is the link. Okay. Great, 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 great. Now, let's, let's come on to this one. This is the photoelectric effect. This is the photoelectric effect. <laughs> yes, yes, I'll be sharing the previous PDFs also. Photoelectric effect. What does photoelectric effect mean? Let me just make you understand what does photoelectric effect mean. Let's suppose we have got a metal surface over here. Photosensitive metal surface. What is photosensitive? I'll tell you later. Photosensitive metal surface. As of now, you just say, sir, this is a metal surface which I have, I have got over here. This is a metal surface which I have got over here. Okay. So, I say, I'll take a light source. I'll take a light source over here. This is the light source I'm actually taking over here. This is the light source I'm taking over here. Light source. Okay. So, we say, sir, if this is a metal surface, inside this metal Electrons are present, yes sir. Electrons are present, atoms are present. In the atoms we have electrons, yes sir. Now, now, sir, when it comes to the light source, we know sir, from the light source, photons are coming out and which fall on this metal surface. These are the photons which fall on this metal surface. We are performing this experiment actually. We, are take, we took a metal surface. And on that metal surface, we say, sir, photons are falling. Photons are falling. Okay. These are what we say, sir, photons. And we observe that while the photons are falling on the metal surface, we observe that these electrons are coming out from the metal surface. The electrons are emitted from the metal surface. So we did an experiment. We took a metal surface. So then a light source over here. The light has fallen on this metal surface means photons are falling on the metal surface. We observed, we saw that these photons are coming out of the metal surface. These, phot sorry, these electrons are coming out of the metal surface because of the falling of photons. So we say this phenomena, this process is what we call photoelectric effect. We say when photons fall on a photosensitive when photons fall on a photosensitive metallic surface 
on a photosensitive metallic surface electrons are emitted from the metal from the metal this process this process or phenomena is called photo electric this is what we call the photoelectric effect when photons fall on the metal surface because of those photons electrons come out of the metal surface okay electrons are emitted this phenomena is what we call this phenomena is what we call the photoelectric effect okay okay is that clear is that clear my dear friends with the fire emojis and if you have not liked the session like it as soon as possible okay i want you guys to make the like count 500 right now i hope you would have made it 400 plus okay 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 now work function what does work function actually mean listen to me very carefully what does work function actually mean let's suppose we have got a metal surface over here okay and we have got another metal surface over here that I will make over here in this case. Okay. This is the first metal surface. And this is the second metal surface which I have actually over here. Okay. So this is the surface 1. We say sir surface 1. And this is the surface 2. Surface 2. This is another metal. This is another one. Now my dear friends. If you. If you have to take out the electron from this metal surface, if you have to take out the electron from this metal surface, what you are supposed to do is that you have to send the photons which should actually fall on this metal surface. Now, if you have to take out the electron from this metal surface, you have to send the photons which should fall on this metal surface. But I'm saying that, listen to me very carefully, I'm saying that, the work function of this metal surface is 5 electron volt and work function of this metal surface is 7 electron volt sir what does that mean i'll make you understand work function that means if you have to take the electron out of this metal surface the photon which you are sending the photon which you are sending it should have it should have the energy, it should have energy greater than or equal to work function. It should have the energy greater or equal to work function. Sir, what does that mean? That means work function is that energy, the amount of energy which is required to take out the electron from a metal surface. So we say in this case, if you have to take the electron out of this metal surface the photon which you are sending should have the energy equal to the work function that is 5 electron volts if this has the energy less than the work function then the electron will not come out so that's why we say it is the minimum amount of energy required required to take out the electron from a metal surface from a metal surface from a metal surface so we say sir for different materials it can be different in this case in this case work function is 5 electron volts means if you have to take out the electron from this metal surface the energy has to be 5 electron volts and if you have to take the electron out of this surface the energy has to be 7 electron volts if the energy is less than 7 electron volts then we say electron will not come out minimum amount of energy required to pull out the electron from the surface is that clear guys is that clear guys what is the what is work function so we say sir it depends upon the material for different materials materials we say work function is different 
for different materials we say work function is different like for this one work function is 5 electron volt for this one this is 7 electron volts okay so for different materials work function is different for different materials we say work function is different okay 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 now conditions of photoelectric effect what does the conditions of photoelectric effect mean listen to me very carefully sir when it comes to the conditions of photoelectric effect the first condition that i need to write over here my dear friends we just studied the concept if you have to pull out the electron from metal surface the energy of photon let's suppose i'm saying this is the metal surface okay this metal surface has got work function 10 electron volts and you have to pull out the electron from this metal surface so what we need to do we know sir we'll send a photon over here and that photon will pull out the electron from this metal surface so we say over here sir if energy of photon is 5 electron volts can this photon take out the electron from this metal surface no no why because the energy is less minimum energy which is required is 10 electron volts so if 10 electron volt photon is coming falling on this metal surface then only electron will come out so we say the first condition is energy of photon has to be greater or equal to work function then only then only then only we say photoelectric effect takes place takes place then only photoelectric effect takes place is that clear my dear people what i'm trying to say so we say sir this is the first condition if this energy of photon is less than the work function then it will not come out that's why i told you it is the minimum energy required to pull the electrons out of the metal surface over here okay so we say in this particular case in this particular case energy of photon if i say sir 12 electron volts then also it can come out greater or equal to the work function greater or equal to the work function okay now you tell me one thing what is the value of energy of photon we say sir h into f we can write it greater or equal to what see you can write this work function also something like this h into f naught because this is also the energy minimum energy required to pull the electrons from a metal surface so we say this is also energy h into f naught h and h you can cancel we say sir f naught f is greater than f naught so where where we say f naught is the threshold threshold frequency where f naught is the threshold frequency okay at which the photoelectric effect takes place see if if you are sending the photon which falls on the metal surface if the energy of that photon is greater than work function then photoelectric effect will take place what does that mean then electron will come out yes sir that's for sure so now i'm saying that if the frequency of this photon is greater or equal to the threshold frequency threshold frequency is the value minimum value of frequency if this frequency is equal to the threshold frequency then also we can say photoelectric effect can take place then also photoelectric effect can take place this is the threshold frequency minimum some value of frequency at which electron comes out of the metal surface is what we call is what we call the threshold frequency is what we call the threshold frequency i hope this is clear guys huh? i'm using my 100 percent energy next level energy let me know is it clear okay this is the threshold frequency and one more point i just want to write over here it is one to one interaction that is what does that mean that is one photon can pull out pull out 
only one electron. If you are sending, let's suppose, one photon over here, it can only pull out one electron. It cannot pull out five electrons. One photon can pull out one electron. Two photons can pull out two electrons. Depends, okay? So it does not. If I, I'm saying, sir, work function is 10 electron volts, and I'm saying if I'm sending a photon of 100 electron volts, then it can take out 10 electrons. No, it can only take out one electron. Where will the rest of energy go? That, that will, uh, we'll see. That we'll see. Okay? That we'll see. Okay? So these are the conditions of photoelectric effect. If you want the photoelectric effect to take place, what is that? Pulling out the electrons from the metal surface. The first condition is the photon which you are sending should have the energy greater than the work function. The frequency should be greater or equal to the threshold frequency. Okay, now let's come on to the experimental setup. Let's come on to the experimental setup. Is this visible clearly, this one? Is this visible clearly? Let me know in the live chat. Is this visible clearly? Is this visible clearly? See, we'll take break exactly once we are done with the photoelectric effect chapter. So that will be approximately 9 o'clock. At 9 o'clock, we'll be taking the break. Before that, nobody is going to tell me in the live chat, break, 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 break. Okay? If you guys said, then I'll cancel the session and I'll leave. Yes, break will be after first chapter. Now see, listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. This is the photoelectric effect. Sir, I have to do the experiment now. How should I do this experiment? I'll go out, okay, in a sunny day and I'll perform this experiment. We say no. You have to perform this experiment. You should have a proper setup actually. You should have a proper setup actually. So how do you make the proper setup? See, I have made it over here. I have made it over here. So we take this. This is a tube-like structure over here. This is a tube-like structure. We take this tube. Okay. And inside this tube, vacuum tube, you have got over here. You have got over here. This plate. This is one plate. Plate. That is what we call the cathode. And then you have over here another plate inside this tube. That's what we call the anode. Inside this tube, you take two plates, cathode and an anode. What is the plate? Ta plate is the metallic surface on which photons are falling. If I say, I have placed the light source over here. If I say, I have placed a light source over here. Light source. So we say, sir, from the light source, these are the photons coming and falling on this metal surface. From the light source, these are the photons falling on the metal surface entering through this opening. Okay. And, and over here, over here, you can clearly see that, sir, this, this is connected. This cathode is further connected to the voltmeter in order to measure the potential difference. This is the ammeter in order to measure the current. We will create the current here also. So, in order to create the experimental setup, in order to perform this photoelectric effect, we have to create its experimental setup. We take a tube-like structure over here. This is a tube, closed tube. Inside this, we have two plates, cathode and anode. You have the opening over here through which the photons are coming in. And then you connect a switch to it, okay? And you have a battery over here. You have a battery. This is the negative terminal of the battery and this is the positive terminal of the battery. This is the battery in this case, which is connected to this setup. This is what we call the photoelectric effect. The, sorry, this is what we call the experimental setup of photoelectric effect. <laughs> I have, by the way, I have got the new hoodie from Unacademy. Is it good? I think this looks much better than the previous one. I think so.
<laughs> thank you, thank you. Yes, modern physics like never before. That's for sure, hundred percent. I will not leave a single topic. And and let me just tell you, I'll be basically moving according to. I'll be teaching you according to the new syllabus, not according to the old syllabus. Okay, great, great, great. Now see, now see. Yeah, ha ha. Yes, I am in Kashmir. Now see, now listen to me very carefully over here. See. What I'm trying to say in this particular case is, what I'm trying to say in this particular case is, everybody over here. Sir, when it comes to the experiment of photoelectric effect, when it comes to the experiment of photoelectric effect, listen to me very carefully, I'll make you understand. See, in this case, in this case, in this case, we say, we say over here, we say over here, sir, these photons are actually coming and it falls on the metal surface. So when photons fall on the metal surface, I'll write over here, when photons, photons fall on metal surface, or we say more specifically cathode, cathode, we say electrons come out. Electrons come out of this cathode. I'll, I'll show these electrons over here. These are the electrons which come out of this cathode. Okay, these are the electrons which come. You have basically sent so many electrons which fall on this cathode and we say electrons are coming out of this cathode. Electrons are coming out of this cathode. Now my dear friends, now my dear friends, now my dear friends, now my, my dear friends, if electrons are coming out of this cathode, listen to me very carefully, listen to me very carefully. We say, let's suppose, I'll write over here, if, 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 let's take a single photon, sir, if you are sending a photon which falls on this cathode, I know you are sending so many photons, but let's take one photon. Because of one photon, one electron will come out. If we say, sir, energy of photon is equal to, let's suppose, 8 electron volts. Listen to me very carefully. If you are sending a photon over here, this photon has got the energy of 8 electron volts, okay? And work function of this cathode, work function of this cathode, work function of this cathode, we say, sir, that is two electron volts. What does that mean? In order to pull out the electron from this cathode, minimum energy required is two electron volts only. Now, now, my dear friends, my dear friends, how much is the remaining energy, sir? Energy of photon is eight. Sir, in order to pull out the electron, it used, this photon used two electron volts. How much is the remaining? We say, sir, eight minus two, that is six electron volts. Six electron volts is the remaining energy. So, my dear friends, if six electron volts is the remaining energy over here, so we say, where will this energy actually go? We say, sir, this will go into the kinetic energy. Means, sir, electrons are coming out over here, but these electrons do not have to stay out here only, but they have to move forward. They have to move forward. They have to move forward towards the anode, towards the anode. So that current is produced in the photoelectric effect. So we say, sir, six electron volts will go into the kinetic energy. Now, now from this, from this, can we make an equation? We say, sir, energy of photon is equal to some part of the energy of photon is used to pull out the electron from the metal surface. That is work function. And some part is used so that the electron moves forward. So we say some part goes into the kinetic energy maximum. This is, this is what we call Einstein's, this is what we call Einstein's photo electric, photoelectric equation. This is what we call Einstein's photoelectric equation. This is what we call Einstein's photoelectric equation. This is what we call Einstein's photoelectric equation. Energy of photon is equal to the work function plus kinetic energy maximum. Energy of photon is equal to the work function plus kinetic energy maximum. Some part of the energy is used to pull out the electron. Some is used so that the electron moves forward towards the anode. Okay. Now, now, one more thing I just want to tell you over here. 
Sir, what is that? That is, if I say, come over here, if I say, if I say, let's suppose one more photon is actually falling on this one. So many photons are falling. Let's take one more photon. If I say over here, sir, if energy of that photon, if energy of that photon, let's suppose it is, it is 8 electron volt. It is 8 electron volt. And work function in this case is, we say, sir, 2 electron volts. Because for a metal, work function remains same. And, and, and. Sir, sir, listen to me very carefully. When this electron comes out of the metal surface, it used, it used to, if the photon is falling on this one, listen to me very carefully. If this 8 electron volt photon is falling on the metal, it gives all of its 8 electron volt to this electron which is inside. So 2 electron volt it is using in order to come out of the metal surface. Okay. 2 electron volts it is using in order to come out of the metal surface. Sir, while it was moving forward, it also faced the collisions because you have got the ions, atoms, molecules over here also. So it faced the collisions. It's not like the electron can move smoothly towards anode. It has to face the collisions. We say, sir, while it was facing the collisions, so in collisions, it wasted, we say, sir, let's suppose 2 electron volt energy. It wasted, we say, sir, 2 electron volt energy. Now, in this particular case, in this particular case, can you tell me how much is the remaining energy? Can you tell me how much is the remaining energy? You say, sir, in this case, 8 minus 2 is 6, 6 minus 2 is 4. We say, sir, 4 electron volt will go into the kinetic energy. So, 4 electron volt will go into the kinetic energy. We say, sir, if this electron, this is another electron, which is coming out of the metal surface. Okay, so 2 electron volt it used in coming out, 2 electron volt in collisions and 4 it will use in the kinetic energy. Let's, sir, in this case you said collisions, let's suppose this was that electron which faced 0 collisions. So, we say over here, collisions is equal to 0. So, that's why we say this is the maximum kinetic energy. And let's suppose we say, sir, the photon, if, if, if I say energy of photon is, let's suppose, 8 electron volt. Sir, work function of this metal is 2 electron volt. And we say this, this time, the collisions which electron is facing, listen to me very carefully, is we say, sir, we say, sir, let's suppose, we say, sir, let's suppose 4 electron volts. Okay. Can you tell me how much will be the kinetic energy in that case? You say, sir, in that case, we say 2 electron volt will be the kinetic energy. And, and if I say, if I say, we say if the energy of photon is equal to 8 electron volts, work function is 2 electron volts, okay? And we say in this case, in this case, an electron, an electron is facing so many collisions. We say, sir, all of its energy, rest of the energy, 6 electron volts is wasted in collisions. So, can you tell me what is the value of kinetic energy in this case? Can you tell me what is the value of kinetic energy in this case? Can you tell me what is the value of kinetic energy in this case? We say, sir, zero. Sir, which electron is this one? Listen to me very carefully. Let's suppose this is that cathode, okay? So, we say, sir, so many photons are falling on the cathode and Electrons are coming out, electrons are coming out, electrons are coming out of the cathode. Listen to me very carefully. These are the electrons which are coming out. Now, this is the first electron, this is the first electron which has got maximum kinetic energy. So, this can easily reach anode over here. This can easily reach anode over here. This is cathode and this is anode. Okay. And this is the next one. This has got how much kinetic energy? We say, sir, this has got... 4 electron volt kinetic energy. Let's suppose this will also reach. Now, now, this is the third electron. This has got how much kinetic energy? We say 2. Let's suppose it will reach till over here. Because it is facing more collisions. And this is the last one which has got zero kinetic energy. Means this electron will just come out and it will face so many huge collisions that it will not move forward. It will stay over here only. 
Let me know if you got the feel of this one, guys. Let me know if you got the feel of this one, guys. Tell me, tell me in the live chat. Everybody, guys. No, no. Can I make a statement? Can I write a statement over here? The kinetic energy of the electrons can be maximum also. This is maximum. This is maximum when collisions are zero. Can be maximum also. And kinetic energy of collisions can be zero also. We say, sir, kinetic energy of electrons can be between, we say, sir, zero and can be between zero and maximum. It can be zero also, it can be maximum also. It can be zero also, it can be maximum also. It can be zero also, it can be maximum also. It can be zero also, it can be maximum also. Okay, okay. Now listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. See, while the photons are falling on the metal plate, electrons are actually coming out. Let me just show you over here. Let me just show you over here. Let me just show you over here. See, I'll make this as a cathode. This is a cathode, okay? This is a cathode. And I'll make it over here. This is, we say, anode. This is, we say, anode. This is cathode. And this is anode. We say, sir, Photons are falling on this cathode. Because of the falling of photons, we know, sir, electrons are coming out. Let's suppose 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. 10 electrons are coming out of the cathode. Okay? 10 electrons are coming out of the cathode. Let's suppose, okay, you are sending the photons on the cathode. 10 electrons are coming out. Suppose, 10 electrons are coming out, coming out of the cathode. We say, let's suppose 10 electrons are coming out of the cathode. And, 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 and only, only 4 electrons reach, are, are able to, able to reach a rich anode. So if if 10 electrons are coming out of the cathode, see you are sending so many photons over here because of those photons we see 10 are coming out. How many electrons are actually able to reach anode? We say sir 1, 2, 3 and 4. Only 4 are able to basically reach anode. Why sir only 4? Maybe because rest of the photons are facing much collisions because of those collisions, energy is wasted. So they got zero kinetic energy. That's why they cannot move further. That's why they cannot move further. Okay. So we say, we say, these four electrons have maximum kinetic energy or good enough kinetic energy to reach anode, to reach anode over here. Okay. Now, my dear friends, what I want you guys to do is, Listen to me very carefully. I want you guys to basically take all of these electrons and all of these should actually read, uh, reach anode. Okay. So we say, we say, we say, what we will do in that case is we'll connect a switch over here. We'll connect this battery. Connecting the switch. Switching on means connecting the battery to the setup. Connecting the battery to the setup. Let me basically connect it over here. Let me basically connect it over here. See, see, if I say, if I say, if I say, sir, I have got this cathode, I have got this cathode and this is the battery which I am actually connecting this one over here with the entire setup, with the entire setup, with the entire setup over here. Okay. Now, my dear friends, this is the positive terminal of the battery and this is the negative terminal of the battery. So what does negative terminal, you are basically connecting the switch. What does negative terminal 
actually mean and positive terminal actually mean? It means that this positive terminal will develop the positive charge on this anode over here. It will develop the positive charge on the anode over here. Okay. If I am connecting negative terminal with this anode, it will develop the negative charge on the anode over here in that case. See, see, over here, over here, let's suppose we say I'll write over here by connecting the by connecting the switch or we say directly by connecting the battery battery we say positive charge is developed developed on on anode positive charge is developed on anode okay here is your Vaseem sir. Huh? <laughs> What's up guys? How are you? How is everything? <laughs> yes, he's my elder brother. Asha, by the way guys, who's looking more smart today? <laughs> he has kept 5-6 lights in front of him. <laughs> That's why I'm glowing. Huh? That's why he's glowing. So what's up? How are you? <laughs> Im <-imers>. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening guys? All good? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. We'll, we'll have live session soon, okay? I'm, I'm better than before. Thank you. I'm better. So what's up? Why the Josh is so less today? Like, there used to be a lot of fire emojis in the chats, right? The chat used to continuously go up. What happened to that? I'm better than before, guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you well, so much. When are you taking the next marathon? I'll schedule it in few days. Okay. Which one? I'll have to see that. Which chapter I'll take. <laughs> it's good. Correct. <Right. laughs> it's all matter. <laughs> okay, guys. Huh? Have fun, guys. Huh? What is happening? Photoelectric what? effect is up. <laughs> Yeah, everybody is saying, please share the PDFs, okay? Please share the PDF of all the chapters. That's mandatory. Yes, yes, I'm done. <clears throat> so, you guys carry on, then, huh? Carry on, guys, carry on. Yes, I'll, I'll come up with the live session soon. I'll come up with the live session soon, yes. Hormones. <laughs> <laughs> cool, 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 cool. This is an academy neat English channel, right? <laughs> you cannot say controversial statements over here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is talking about emerge. What is emerge? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm leaving this class. I'm <laughs> going out. It's <laughs> going to be a emerge, emerge, emerge. It's a emerge. Uh, I'm, I'm better than before, guys. I'm better than before. I'll come up with a live session soon, okay? You enjoy physics right now, okay? Okay. Enjoy physics. Ah, uh, who's that? Mate, who's the video? Who's me? Oh, Carmen, so bad. Okay, guys. Now, see. <clears throat> we have got cathode over here. We have got, got anode over here. So you are connecting this positive terminal over here. What does that mean? By connecting the battery, positive charge is developed on the anode. Why? Because positive terminal of the battery is connected to anode over here. Now see, what does that mean? Sir, the work of the battery is to create the potential difference or maintain potential difference. Okay. So we say, sir, in this case, EMF is developed or EMF is basically being produced over here. Listen to me very carefully. We say, we say, once we basically create the positive charge on this one, once positive charge is developed because of the battery over here, that means, that means EM, it is because of the EMF of the battery. It is because of the EMF of the battery, because of EMF of the battery. Okay. EMF of the battery. Listen to me very carefully. 
we are connecting the battery to this setup because battery has emf voltage potential difference okay so we say we say it will create the positive charge on this anode it will create the positive charge on this anode let's suppose i'll i'll write over here i'll write over here see see when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to i say sir emf i'll write over here and i say number of number of electrons flowing number of electrons flowing listen to me very carefully sir when battery was not connected to the setup when the switch was not connected so we say in that case how many electrons were able to reach anode only four so we say when battery was not connected means when emf was zero volts in that case we say how many electrons were flowing four electrons now now when you connected the battery you started increasing the emf for potential difference so we say sir on increasing the emf means you are increasing the charge on anode which one positive why because positive terminal is connected to the cathode so let's suppose i have developed how much we say let's suppose i applied 10 volts of potential difference over here so because of the 10 volt potential difference let's suppose now one more electron see 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 sir now positive charge is developed some positive charge this positive will now attract the electrons if you have got some positive charge over here it will attract some electrons over here it will attract some electrons over here we say now let's suppose five electrons will reach now if i increase the emf listen to me very carefully let's make it 20 volts we say sir now six electrons will reach an we say sir more positive charge is developed over here so more electrons are being attracted and able to reach anode now if i say i'll increase more let's suppose this is 30 volts means you are developing more positive charge on this one and we say in this case seven electrons are reaching the over here and we say if we apply 40 volts we say eight electrons are reaching we say over here and let's suppose if I apply, sir, 50 volts, we say, sir, 9 electrons are now. Now, we say, we say, reaching over here. Okay. So, at 10 volts, we say, sir, 5 electrons were able to reach. Sir, at six, uh, 20 volts, one more electron started moving. At, we say, sir, 60 volts, 40 volts, we say, sir, one more electron started moving. Okay. Okay. And we say, sir, at 60 volts, we say, let's suppose 10 electrons are attracted towards the anode. All the 10 electrons basically are now basically reaching over your anode. Now, I am asking you the simple question. Guys, guys, tell me, tell me. If I increase more potential difference, let's suppose 70 volts. How many electrons will reach anode over here? Tell me in the live chat. How many electrons will reach anode? How many electrons will reach anode? Everybody, I want all of you to basically give me the answer over here. Yes, absolutely great. Absolutely great. Sir, if only 10 electrons are coming out, if only 10 ele electrons are present at the cathode, so only 10 can reach anode. Where does the 11th electron come from how can you say 11 maximum number of students are saying 10 only at 70 volts electrons are 10 at 80 volts we say sir electrons are 10 only so this is what this is what number of electrons flowing so we say this is current flowing because whenever charge flows charge moves we say sir current is being produced so either you say this is number of electrons flowing or you say this is nothing but photo current photo current is being produced okay okay so we say current is being produced in this one that's what was our goal to make the current in this particular case to make the current in this particular case guys 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 we are done with photoelectric effect i just have to show you one or two graphs complete tell me tell me in the live chat is this clear to each and everyone any sort of doubt 
is this crystalline clear with the fire emojis everybody everybody oh this was the detail every detail about the photoelectric effect is it clear to each and everyone i want all of you to tell me great 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 i'm loving the response today okay 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 now my dear friends what was photoelectric effect all about i told you the photoelectric equation sir take a setup over here on this cathode we say electrons are falling okay now we say some electrons will reach anode some will not how do all of the electrons reach anode by connecting the battery all of the electrons will be attracted so electrons flow current will be produced so i'll write over here when electrons flow from cathode to anode cathode to anode we say current is produced and is called and is called photo current and is called photo current now now let me make the graph over here let me make the graph over here the graph is actually the graph is between the graph is between the graph is between the graph is between we say sir photo current photo current and we say emf graph is between photo current and emf the graph is between photo current and emf listen to me very carefully since since our goal was listen to me very carefully since our goal was to create current with the help of photoelectric effect we did that okay now we have to make the graph between that photo current and emf now see now see how does the graph actually look like in this particular case if you take a look sir when emf was zero means emf is zero over here some 10 volts 20 30 40 50 okay how many electrons were flowing sir four was current zero at that particular time when emf was zero is current zero or current has some value is current zero yes or no is current zero when emf is zero is photo current zero when emf is zero yes or no in the chats everybody is current zero is current zero no current is not zero why because four electrons are moving current is less but not zero because electrons are flowing over here four so we say we say in this case will not will will not st start the graph from the origin but the graph starts from over here graph starts from over here as you increase the potential difference let's suppose you applied let's suppose you applied 10 volt potential difference at 10 5 electrons are flowing so 10 volts are more current is flowing at 20 volt 6 electrons are flowing we say current is increasing now clearly you say current is increasing till over here current is increasing till over here so i'll make the graph something like this i'll make the graph something like this as as you keep on increasing you keep on increasing we say what we say sir potential emf or potential difference photo current is increasing and if you see over here sir at certain value of emf we say photo current is let's suppose 10 10 uh, 10 electrons are flowing now afterwards if you are increasing the potential difference 70 80 but only 10 electrons are flowing we say sir photo current is same so that's why we say sir photo current in that case remains same photo current in that case remains same even if you keep on increasing the potential difference see this is 60 volts 70 volts 80 volts but photo current is same only 10 electrons are flowing tell me is this graph clear tell me is this graph clear this is what we call the saturation current this one is what we call the saturation current saturation current when current reaches peak value and becomes maximum and becomes constant becomes constant 
okay is that clear my dear friends is that clear is that clear yes so we got to understand what is the graph of photoelectric effect this is incomplete as of now let me complete this graph let me complete this graph now now take this setup this is the this is the zoomed view this is the zoomed view of which setup this is the zoomed view of this particular setup now what i want you guys to do is that what i want you guys to do is that see see what you will do in this particular case what you will do in this particular case let's make this is the cathode over here and this is the anode over here this is the anode over here this is the cathode and this is the anode over here okay this is the cathode and this is the anode over here okay now my dear friends in this particular case what you will be doing is that you will reverse the polarity of the battery that means from this side is now positive terminal and from this side is now negative terminal from this side is now negative terminal now in this particular case this is positive and this is negative and this is cathode and this is anode this is anode so these were the 10 electrons which came out of the cathode okay these were the 10 electrons which came out of the cathode and only four electrons were able to reach anode when battery was not connected this is the story which we already have learned okay this is the story which we have learned already now now listen to me very carefully in this case my dear friends if you are connecting negative terminal to this one on reversing the polarity on reversing the polarity on reversing the polarity of the battery on reversing the polarity of the battery we say negative charge negative charge is developed on anode is is developed on on anode this is what we call applying the retarding potential okay over here previously we say sir positive charge is developed because positive terminal was connected now in this case negative charge negative terminal is connected it will develop negative charge on this anode. okay now tell me one thing my dear friends if i say you are applying certain value of negative potential over here what does that mean some negative charge will be developed guys at zero volt emf if i'm saying four electrons are moving now if i say let's suppose if you are applying minus 10 volts over here if you are applying minus 10 volts over here so we say sir at my zero emf we say sir in that case we say over here four electrons were moving four electrons were moving okay now now if you are increasing the potential in opposite polarity in opposite polarity so at minus 10 volts we say sir now only three will reach one will be stopped because negative charge will repel the electrons now again on increasing minus 20 volts we say sir now two electrons will be repelled my dear friends we say sir on minus 10 minus 10 volts let's suppose three electrons are moving reaching towards anode at minus 20 volts let's suppose we say we say only only two electrons are now able to reach anode because more negative charge is being developed over here now if i say minus 30 volts at minus 30 volts we say sir one electron is reaching the anode only one rest of the three gets repelled at we say let's suppose minus 40 volts we say sir zero electrons zero electrons are now reaching anode. so can i say at this particular value at this at this value of potential at this value of potential no current flows no current flows photo current becomes zero photo current becomes zero hundred and ten percent sir so this value of potential at which photo current becomes zero this value of potential at which at which photo current is zero is called is called stopping potential 
is called stopping potential is called stopping so my dear people if i have to make the graph see this is the emf plus 10 plus 20 plus 30 and from over here you make this retarding potential so it will be if you keep on increasing the my at minus 10 current is decreasing less electrons are now able to reach anode so as you keep on increasing as you keep on increasing 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 at certain value of potential let's call that v naught sir current becomes zero and this is what we call stopping potential is that clear guys more than this more than this the shelling of this chapter is not possible Tell me in the live chat, is this graph clear? Is this graph clear? As you keep on increasing the retarding potential, we say photo current is decreasing. Less electrons. Now the electrons are being repelled over here. Why? Because negative charge has developed on this one. Tell me, tell me in the live chat. Is that clear? Is that clear, guys? Guys, is it clear? I want all of you. Everyone means everyone. Let me know in the live chat. I'll move forward. Give me the signal and I'll move forward. Reoptics will be after semiconductors. Please don't talk about the other chapters as of now. I'll teach all the chapters. Don't worry about that. Let this chapter fin let this marathon finish first. Great, great. So this is the graph of this is the graph of photoelectric effect. This is the graph of photoelectric effect, and we call this graph between graph between we say photo current, photo current, and EMF in case of photoelectric effect 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 done we are done and dusted photoelectric effect is completely done okay now i have to show you the questions only okay one more thing i just want to tell you in this case this is this is the series that you need to remember if frequency increases photon energy energy of photon increases Kinetic energy increase, stopping potential increase. And before this, I need to tell you one more point in this case. Now see, now see, now see. Listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. We say, sir, at stopping potential, let's suppose minus 40, no electron is able to move. No electron is able to reach anode. Okay? No electron is able to reach anode. Why? Because minus 40 is what we call the stopping potential. Maximum negative charge has developed on this rod, on, on this on this plate. Maximum negative charge has developed on this plate. Maximum negative charge has developed on this plate. That's why these electrons are being repelled. One more thing I just want to tell you. Sir, at stopping potential, these electrons which have come out of the cathode are just waiting outside the cathode only. When you remove this stopping potential, okay, if you disconnect the battery, they will start flowing towards the cathode. Remember it. So we say, I'll write over here, I'll write over here, we say, at stopping potential, at stopping potential, at stopping potential, at stopping potential, we say, no electron flows, no electron flows towards the anode but they are waiting outside the they are waiting outside the cathode they are waiting outside the cathode when you remove the stopping potential when you remove the stopping potential, they will start flowing. So we say, we say, so at this stopping potential, no electron flows to, uh, towards anode. 
but they are waiting outside the cathode outside the cathode and and has maximum potential potential energy and have and have maximum potential energy and have and have maximum potential energy and have maximum potential energy and have maximum potential energy listen to me very carefully this point i'll make you understand i say i have got a pen over here it is at some height does this pen have potential energy or kinetic energy right now we say sir potential energy if i release it i am holding if i release it it will start falling that potential will be converted to the kinetic energy with which it will actually fall with which it will actually fall okay now listen to me very carefully guys so we say sir same is the case over here same is the case over here sir at stopping potential these electrons are stopped over here okay they are being held over here when you remove stopping potential they will start flowing because of the kinetic energy so when they are stopped over here they have got the maximum potential energy now if you remove it if you release it sir they will start flowing that potential energy will be converted to the kinetic energy so we say the detail which i am telling you in this chapter is all is important everything is important okay that's why i am telling you this this is to the point now see so we say have maximum potential energy okay now that potential energy gets converted when they start flowing towards the anode when they start flowing towards the anode and my dear friends and this only this only is converted converted to kinetic energy when they start flowing flowing towards anode towards and if i ask you if i ask you how much is that kinetic energy or how much is that potential energy i'll write over here i'll write over here at stopping potential stopping potential this kinetic energy is equal to sir potential energy this kinetic energy is equal to potential energy or you say sir when you remove the stopping potential this potential gets converted to the kinetic energy okay and and this this potential energy we know the formula for potential energy u is equal to q delta v q delta v this potential energy is equal to q delta v okay this is the formula which i have told you in the electrostatics one shot remember it directly q means charge delta v is the potential difference so put it over here this is q delta v so you can write this kinetic energy is equal to this kinetic energy is equal to this is equal to sir q q is what over here sir these are the electrons which have been stopped over here so instead of q i can write e at which potential sir stopping potential that is v naught so we say instead of q we write e so we say sir v naught this is the formula of kinetic energy this is the formula of kinetic energy this is the formula of kinetic energy in terms of stopping potential is this clear is this clear guys guys tell me tell me tell me tell me this this slide is clear this slide is clear tell me everybody everybody in the live chat is this clear guys am i going fast or the speed is okay or the speed is speed is cool tell me or am i going fast shall i slow down let me know in the live chat speed is perfect huh? great 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 great
Okay, 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 okay. I'm loving the response today, by the way. Now let's come on to this statement. Let's come on to this statement. If anybody asks me in the live chat, sir, do we need to study extra from this marathon, out of this marathon for your NEET as well as J, I say completely no. That's it. Yeah, if you want to solve more questions, then that is recommended, that I'll tell you. But theory, this is maximum, enough, that I'll be showing you over here. Okay? Now see. Now see. Frequency is proportional to the energy of photon. See, when it comes to if, if, if I say if, if, we say, sir, frequency is increased. If frequency increases, we know, sir, we know, sir, energy of photon is equal to H into F. If somehow you are increasing the frequency, so we say, sir, energy of photon will increase, will increase. As simple as that. You are increasing the photon, if frequency energy will increase. Now, my dear friends, tell me one more thing. Tell me one more thing. What is that? Sir, if energy of photon is increasing, as, as we know, as we know, we recently studied Einstein's photoelectric equation is energy of photon is equal to work function plus kinetic energy maximum. Okay. Now, if I am saying, sir, this energy of photon is increasing, can I say, sir, Time, kinetic energy will increase as simple as that. You are sending a heavy photon. You are sending a photon which has got, got large energy. So we say it will give that energy to the electron which gets more kinetic energy. Or this is directly proportional to this one over here. So we say kinetic energy will increase. Now tell me the last one. Sir, if kinetic energy increases, recently I got this formula. Kinetic energy in terms of stopping potential. So we know also, we know, sir, kinetic energy is equal to EV naught. V naught is the stopping potential. If kinetic energy increases, we say stopping potential will also increase. So V naught also increases. That's what is mentioned over here. If frequency increases, energy of photon is increased. If energy of photon is increased, kinetic energy is increased. If kinetic energy of electron is increased, we say, sir, stopping potential will increase. We say stopping potential will increase. Tell me, is this clear? Is this clear, guys? Is it crystal clear to each and everyone? Now, now, one more statement I just want you guys to focus on. If intensity increases, number of photons will increase. If number of photons will increase, number of electrons will increase. If number of electrons increase, we say, sir, photo current increases. Now, now, listen to me very carefully. Sir, as, as, when it comes to the intensity, intensity is N H F divided by A into T. Guys, for a given source, we consider frequency constant. H is constant. A and T are the external parameters. So, over here, sir, intensity is directly proportional to N. If intensity will increase, N will increase, number of photons increase. We say, sir, we say, if, if I increases, I increases, then, then number of photons, photons increase. Okay. Now, now, my dear people over here, if number of photons increase, we say, sir, more number of photons are falling on the metal surface. You have got this metal surface over here. You are sending more number of photons on the metal surface. Chances are more electrons will come out. More electrons when uh, they are coming out, sir, photo current will be more. So we say number of electrons will increase. And if number of electrons increase in flowing, we say, sir, photo current increases. So basically intensity depends upon number of photons, it depends upon number of electrons, it depends upon photo current. They are related to each other. And in this slide, these quantities are actually related to each other. This is the question that you have over here. I want you guys to solve this particular question. 
आई वॉन्ट यू गैस टू सॉलो दिस पर्टिकुलर क्वेश्चन Is that clear? Is that clear? Is that clear? Hi HSP sir, how are you? HSP sir in the chats, huh? The ultra legend. Actually, we are just the kids in front of HSP sir. Honestly, you guys, me, everyone. <clears throat> ग्रेट 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 यस दे हैव नो रिलेशन इंटेंसिटी एंड रिलेशन दीज आर द रिलेशन दिस इज द रिलेशन ओके इंटेंसिटी इज अ नंबर नंबर ऑफ फोटो इज ऑल्सो द नंबर दिस इज ऑल्सो द नंबर दिस इज ऑल्सो द नंबर नंबर कैन नॉट डिपेंड अपॉन द एनर्जी और एनर्जी कैन नॉट डिपेंड अपॉन द नंबर एनर्जी कैन डिपेंड अपॉन एनर्जी नंबर कैन डिपेंड अपॉन नंबर okay now tell me the answer of this question compare the intensity and frequency of the three graphs you have got three graphs over here you have to compare the intensity and frequency of these three graphs you have to compare the intensity and frequency of these three graphs compare the intensity and frequency of these three graphs over here tell me sir see Clearly, we say here, here, we say photo current. Photo current is same, sir. Photo current for all the three is same, or saturation current is same. So, if photo current is same, you can see this, this one, sir. Photo current is 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 proportional to intensity. They have their relation with each other. So, means so so we say intensity. intensity is same so if i say intensity for this is i1 i2 and i3 then we say in this case i1 is equal to i2 is equal to i3 in this case intensity is same now my dear friends you can clearly see over here sir this is the stopping potential v1 this is the stopping potential v2 and this is stopping potential v3 sir they have got different stopping potential if stopping potential is different now clearly i can see in this one sir stopping potential has the relation with frequency if frequency changes stopping potential will change now i say over here i say as as we say we say stopping potential stopping potential we say stopping potential is proportional to frequency okay and and my dear friends if stopping potential increases see v3 has got more stopping potential v2 has got less than that so we say we say over here sir we say frequency of 3 is greater than frequency of 2 is greater than frequency of 1 because because stopping potential v3 is greater than v2 is greater than v1 is this clear is this clear is this clear guys let me know in the live chat okay now comment on the frequency and intensity of the two graphs comment on the intensity and frequency of two graphs tell me comment on the intensity and frequency of two graphs over here what about the intensity and frequency i want you guys to do it over here only yes this is just the sign don't get confused over here sir this one is more no no from the negative side you have to say which one is more from stopping potential is the negative potential retarding potential so we say v3 is more because this will be minus 40 minus 30 minus 20 okay don't get confused this is the maths 
in terms of maths we say minus 10 is uh, greater than that so we say in this case over here sir photo current is different sir photo current i2 is greater than i1 this is current i2 i1 so we say intensity intensity of second is greater than intensity intensity of first why because because intensity is directly proportional to the photo current the one which has got more intensity more photo current has got more intensity so this graph has got more photo current in this case you can clearly see they are meeting at the same point over here so means they have got the same stopping potential here v naught is same so if v naught is same means means frequency is same for both frequency is same for both is that clear is that clear both of these graphs can you plot these graphs between photo current and intensity kinetic energy maximum and intensity photo current and frequency stopping potential and intensity is that clear guys let me know let me know in the live chat is that clear is that clear tell me guys is that clear yes see sir we have to plot the graph between photo current and intensity does photo current and intensity have the relation with each other let's check from this one sir photo current and intensity yes they have the relation with each other so the graph is dependent over here so we say the graph will be something like this if you increase intensity we say photo current will increase okay now photo current versus frequency does the frequency have any relation with the photo current check no sir frequency has relation with these they are dependent on each other but when it comes to the graph over here i can clearly say this will be sir constant over here this will be constant over here this will be constant over here okay this will be constant over here now when it comes to the kinetic energy and intensity sir this is energy and this is number they do not have the relation with each other so the graph will be constant something like this okay now stopping potential and intensity sir does stopping potential and intensity have relation no sir this is also constant you can check from these two graphs these two statements this one and this one they are very 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 important you guys have to remember okay 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 let's follow this particular question that we have on the screen let's follow this question let's follow this question come on are you able to see this particular question over here tell me in the charts for a certain metal frequency is five times v this v is five times v naught v naught is threshold frequency let me show you let me just read the let me just make the question over here listen to me very carefully we have got a photosensitive metallic plate photosensitive metallic plate metallic plate we have got a photosensitive metallic plate okay and on this metallic plate a photon is actually falling on this metallic plate the photon is actually falling this is the photon and listen to me very carefully this photon has an energy of this photon has an energy of that is nothing but we say five times of five times of 
वी से एच इंटू एफ नॉट एफ नॉट इज द थ्रेश होल्ड फ्रीक्वेंसी और लेट मी राइट इट समथिंग लाइक दिस लेट मी राइट इट समथिंग लाइक दिस एच इंटू एफ एनर्जी ऑफ दिस फोटोन इज एच इंटू एफ वेर एफ इज दिस एफ इज वेर एफ इज फाइव टाइम्स ऑफ एफ नॉट एफ नॉट इज द थ्रेश होल्ड फ्रीक्वेंसी एफ नॉट इज द थ्रेश होल्ड फ्रीक्वेंसी दैट आई टोल्ड यू सर द फोटोन विच फॉल्स ऑन दिस मेटालिक प्लेट हेज गॉट हाउ मच फ्रीक्वेंसी फाइव टाइम्स ऑफ एफ नॉट सो इंस्टेड ऑफ दिस एफ आई कैन राइट फाइव टाइम्स ऑफ एच इंटू फाइव टाइम्स ऑफ एफ नॉट एच इंटू फाइव टाइम्स ऑफ एफ नॉट एच इंटू फाइव टाइम्स ऑफ एच ओके and it falls on the metallic surface it falls on this metallic surface now when it falls on the metallic surface electron is coming out of the metallic surface now this electron has got velocity v1 this electron has got velocity v1 and the value of that is 8 into 10 raised power 6 meter per second okay now another photon another photon falls on the same metallic surface okay this photon has got the energy of This photon has got the energy of. We say, sir, h into f. We know, sir, energy of photon is h into f. But this photon has frequency. We say f is equal to two times of f naught. This photon has frequency five times of f naught. This photon has got frequency. We say, sir, two times of f naught. F naught is the threshold frequency. That frequency at which photoelectric effect is possible. We say we say two times of H F naught. Okay, so because of this electron also, we say sir electron because of this photon also electron is coming out. It has got speed v two. It has got speed v two. We have to find find v two. V one is given. We have to find the velocity of velocity of the electron. This one, this second electron. What is the velocity of the second electron? What is the velocity of the second electron? Is question understood? You got the question. You got the question. Tell me in the chats. You got the question. See, solution. How do we actually solve it? We say use Einstein's, or directly I say, sir, as we know, as we know, energy of a photon is equal to work function plus kinetic energy maximum. This is the energy of a photon. This is the energy of a photon. See, sir, this is the case one and this is the case two. I'll write over here. I'll write over here. See, I'll write over here in case one. Case one means when this photon falls on the metal surface, which has got this much energy. So we say energy of this photon is how much? That is h five times of h f naught. Is equal to instead of work function, I told you we can write work function h into f naught also previously. Then plus kinetic energy, sir. Kinetic energy we know in mechanics we have studied one by two m v square. So we say one by two m v one square. Okay. Now now if I talk about in case two, in case two, this case where this photon falls on the metal surface, we say sir. Energy of photon. Energy of photon is how much? That is two times of h f naught is equal to work function. Work function is h into f naught plus kinetic energy. Kinetic energy of this electron is one by two m v two square because this electron has got how much velocity v two. This is equation first. This is equation second. Listen to me very carefully, sir. We can further write this equation five times of h f naught. Minus h f naught, so that will be four times of h into f naught is equal to one by two m v one square. And from let's call this as equation first, and this one will be two minus one, that is h into f naught is equal to one by two m v two square. Let's call this as equation six second. So I say I say over here divide divide first by Second, so what is the first equation, sir? Four times of h f naught. So we say, sir, this is four times of h into f naught divided by 
एच इंटू एफ नॉट एच इंटू एफ नॉट बिकॉज इन केस ऑफ सेकेंड इक्वेजन दिस इज एच इंटू एफ नॉट एंड देन यू हैव वन बाई टू एम वी वन स्क्वायर वन बाई टू एम वी टू स्क्वायर सो वी से इज इक्वल टू वन बाई टू एम वी वन स्क्वायर डिवाइडेड बाई वन बाई टू एम वी टू स्क्वायर दिस एंड दिस वी कैन कैंसिल दिस एंड दिस वी कैन कैंसिल सो वॉट रिमेन्स वी वन डिवाइडेड बाई वी टू इट्स होल स्क्वायर इज फोर ओके and then 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 so v1 divided by v2 is equal root of 4 that is 2 so v2 you can find over here that is v1 divided by 2 v1 divided by 2 now v1 divided by 2 what is the value of v1 value of v1 in question is given as 8 into 10 raised power 6 so you can put it over here So v two will come out to be eight into ten raised power six divided by this two. So this will be v two is equal four into ten raised power six meter per second. This is the velocity of the second electron. Is this clear? Is this clear? Is this clear? Tell me, tell me in the live chat if each and everything is crystal and clear and sorted. everybody and make sure you hit the like button make sure you hit the like button all the people out there guys tell me in the chats tell me in the live chats if if everything is sorted make the like count 500 plus you have to increase it okay you have to make it 500 plus सर शुड बी सोलो जे मीन्स पी वाई क्यू यू कैन सोलो इट बट फ्रॉम फिजिक्स परस्पेक्टिव आई एम सेंग नॉट मच रेकमेंडेड नो फ्रॉम फिजिक्स परस्पेक्टिव आई एम सेंग आई टोल्ड यू आई गिव द ब्रेक एट नाइन ओ क्लॉक बिफोर नाइन आई नॉट गिव द ब्रेक बिकॉज वी हैव टू फिनिश दिस चैप्टर फर्स्ट now we have got the same type of question that i'll be telling you over here we have got a metal surface we have got a metal surface okay and on this metal surface we have a photon which is falling and this photon has an energy of this photon has an energy of 1 electron volt this photon has an energy energy of 1 electron volt okay and the work function of this is work function of this is we say sir 0.5 electron volts this is a metallic surface and in this case we say sir when photon falls on the metallic surface electron is coming out that electron has velocity v1 now now over sure sir one more photon falls on the same metallic surface that photon has an energy of 2 electron volt no 2.5 2.5 electron volts and over here also electron is coming out of the metal surface with velocity v2 you guys are supposed to tell me the value of v1 divided by v2 what is the value of v1 divided by v2 tell me in the live chat same approach which i showed you over here this one this question same approach you have to do in the next question same approach you have to do in the next question same approach you have to do in the next question come on sir let's call this as case number 1 and let's call this as case number 2 i say in case 1 see we know sir energy of photon is equal to work function plus kinetic energy this is the formula we know now when it comes to the energy of photon sir how much is the energy of photon in case 1 that is 1 electron volt okay is equal sir work function of this metal is how much 0.5 electron volt plus 
kinetic energy we can write 1 by 2 mv1 square okay now now my dear people if i talk in about the case 2 sir in case 2 we say sir energy of photon is how much that is 2.5 electron volt is equal to Sir, work function is how much? 0 0.5 electron volt plus 1 by 2 m. Over here, the electron which leaves with speed, we say, sir, V2 square. Over here, it is V1 square. Now, this will be how much? If we just write this one. See, how do we write this one? This is 1 minus 0 0.5. That is how much? 0 0.5 electron volt plus 1 by 2 mv square. Okay. If I just write it over here, this will be 0 0.5 electron volt is equal to 1 by 2 mv1 square. Because 1 minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. And this if I write 2.5 minus 0 0.5 is 2 electron volt is equal to 1 by 2 v2 square. Take this equation. This equation is let's suppose first and this equation is let's suppose second. So we say over here divide divide first by second. So what is the first equation that you have? 0 0.5 electron volt divided by this you have 2 electron volt is equal to this is 1 by 2 m v1 square divided by this is 1 by 2 mv2 square. This and this you can cancel out over here. This, this. So what remains in this case is 0 0.5 divided by 2. We can write it something like this. 0 0.5 means 1 by 2. Into this 2 over here only. Instead of 0 0.5 I write 1 by 2 and divide by this 2. And then from this side you get v1 divided by v2 whole square. And if you take it over there, it will be V1 divided by V2. Okay. Okay. So this will be that is nothing but 1 by 2. 1 by 2. Okay. That's it. Option 1. 1 is to 2. Is that clear? Tell me in the charts, guys, if each and everything is sorted, sorted, sorted. Yes, NCRT problems are very important for NEET. Computer has been asked. There is a guy in the charts, computer, namely computer. So he is asking about the NCRT questions. NCRT questions are very, very, very important from NEET perspective. Okay, be it NCRT examples, be it NCRT questions, okay, you have to solve those. Okay. Solo this one. In photoelectric emission process from a metal of work function 1.8 electron volts, from a metal of work function 1.8 electron volts. The kinetic energy of most energetic electron is 0 0.5 electron volts. The corresponding stopping potential is. See, I'll make you understand this one. It is saying that a photoelectric effect is happening over here. Means a photon is falling on the metal surface and electron is leaving in this particular case. Okay. And the electron which is most energetic. Let's suppose so many electrons are leaving over here. We say, sir, the most energetic electron, the most energetic electron, the most energetic electron has kinetic energy. When most energy, energetic electron leaves, it has kinetic energy. How much? In a photoelectric emission process, work function one bit, the kinetic energy of most energetic electron is, sir, 0 0.5 electron volts. Okay. And the corresponding stopping potential is, sir, photons fall on the metal surface. Because of that, electrons leave. 
द मोस्ट एनर्जेटिक इलेक्ट्रॉन हैज हाउ मच एनर्जी वी से सर जीरो पॉइंट फाइव इलेक्ट्रॉन वोट You guys are supposed to tell me in this case what is the value of stopping potential. Listen to me very carefully. We say as when it comes to the kinetic energy, it is equal to E V naught. Sir, kinetic energy in this case is given as zero point five E V is equal. Then we say E V naught. You can cancel this E and E. V naught will come out to be zero point five volts in this case. V naught is the stopping potential. is that clear <laughs> em waves i'll be teaching you also don't worry about that now see when it comes to the photoelectric dual nature of matter and radiations it has this particular chapter is made up of two units first unit we are done with that the second unit is de broglie waves or we say matter waves de broglie waves or matter waves that we need to understand this one this will take us further 30 to 40 minutes and we are done with this chapter number 1 then we'll move on to the next chapter and then we'll move on to the next chapter okay now come over here listen to me very carefully in this particular case see when it comes to the de broglie waves come sir matter wavelength or de broglie wavelength what does it actually mean sir when it comes to the light let's talk about the light we say sir light has dual nature it has got wave nature and the light has also got the particle nature light has got wave nature and it has got the particle nature why sir we know light is made up of waves and it is made up of particles also sir what is the proof which clearly proves that yes sir the light which comes out of the light source is a wave sir that proof is basically interference and we said diffraction this will be studying in the wave optics if you perform if you have to show the interference pattern if you have to show the interference pattern we say sir that is only possible if you consider this light as a wave so diffraction is another proof when it comes to the particle nature few people used to say sir this light is made up of particles so what is the proof they had we say photoelectric effect black body radiation compton effect so these are the strong proofs which clearly proves that light is a wave the light is a particle these are the strong proofs which clearly proves that light is a wave now come over here then came de broglie look at the look at this look at this the points over here that i have mentioned so beautifully we say then came de broglie first one category of scientists physicists used to say this another category of physicists used to say this they have got this proof they have got this proof then comes the next one he is the hero we call him de broglie de broglie came he said light is not a wave nor a pot particle he said light is not a wave nor a not a particle nor a wave okay nothing so what he actually said he said it is a form of energy he said the light which comes out of the light source if this light which comes out of the light source this is nothing but energy coming out of the light source okay this was his statement first statement which sometimes behaves as wave and sometimes particle this light source if i say from the light source light is coming out it says that it is not a particle not a wave but it is an energy which sometimes behaves like a particle and sometimes behaves like a wave it depends when it will behave like a particle when it behaves like a wave it depends upon surroundings it is interacting with my dear friends my dear friends i have shown you the photoelectric effect concept i have shown you the photoelectric effect concept come over here what did i just tell you sir when it comes to the photoelectric effect we say sir we considered the light as light as particles over here 
then only these electrons came out. So means if the surrounding is photoelectric effect, if you have to perform the photoelectric effect, then in that case, we say light will behave like a particle. Light will behave like a particle. Okay, surrounding means this one. Which experiment you are performing? If you are performing photoelectric effect, then we say surrounding is photoelectric effect. Then we say light will behave like a particle. Now, come over here. Sir, in case of Young's double slit experiment, in case of Young's double slit experiment, we say, we say, sir, light will behave like a wave. In case of photoelectric effect, it behaves like a particle. In case of Young's double slit experiment, it behaves like a wave. Okay, okay. That's what it says, some which depends upon the surrounding it is interacting with. Okay, this was the first statement of De Broglie. He also said, every particle will show the wave nature. So matter also has dual nature. Not only light, leave light. Every particle, we say this pen. This pen is also a wave. Sir, this pen is a particle. This is made up of particles. We can feel it. It is made up of small tiny particles. We can feel its particle nature. Is this wave also? De Broglie said, yes. This is also the form of energy which shows dual nature. Particle as well as wave nature. Every particle, you, me, this pen, this board, every particle will show the wave nature. So matter, matter has a dual nature. So matter has a dual nature. Wave nature as well as particle nature. We can feel its particle nature. We cannot feel its wave nature, but it has actually wave. Now, my dear friend, so if matter shows wave nature, he said it has got a wavelength. He said if this matter also has wave associated with it, if this is a wave also, means whenever we say something is a wave, it has got wavelength. So this is also having the wavelength and that is and 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 let me just take it over here and and that is that wavelength will be equal to h divided by p he said if the matter shows wave nature so that wave also has wavelength we say sir that wavelength will be equal to h by p that wavelength will be equal to h divided by p now come on to this one come on to this one now this was the actual statement This was the actual statement. See, everything in this universe, listen to me very carefully. Everything in this universe has a wave nature, has a wave nature and a wave is associated with it. Everything you say, you see around us in this entire universe, we say it has got the particle nature as well as it has got the wave nature over here, has a wave and the wave which is associated with it, that is what we call the matter wave. So what is matter wave? I say, this is a matter, okay. Sir, does this matter also have wave? Does this matter, this marker is also made up of waves? We say, yes, that wave is what we call the matter wave, okay. Or we call it the de Broglie wave. And how to calculate that? We say, sir, lambda is equal to h by mv, where h is Planck's constant, P is the momentum. This is the formula for de Broglie wavelength. Lambda is equal to H by P. Guys, tell me in the charts if this is crystalline clear. This statement is crystalline clear. Tell me in the charts. Tell me in the charts if this is crystal and clear. Everybody out there, these four or five points which I made you understand, I hope this is clear. Everything around us, you, me, everything, is a particle as well as wave and the wave of these particles is what we call the matter wave how to calculate that this Planck's constant divide it with the momentum h by mv why not everyone is sending me the uh, signal in the charts which example are you are talking about yeah? Is this clear guys tell me tell me where is that Josh that is gone now huh? you want you want me to leave the class right now you want me to end this class 
ओके आई अंडरस्टैंड यू गैज आर लिस्निंग केयरफुल बट आई वॉन्ट यू गैज टू रिप्लाई वेन आई से इवन यू कैन जस्ट पुट अप द थम्स अप ओनली जस्ट यू हैव टू डू वन क्लिक Yeah, that's also good. That's good. That's good. NCERT exemplar. That's good. <clears throat> De Broglie wavelength in terms of kinetic energy. Now come on to this particular topic over here. De Broglie wavelength in terms of kinetic energy. See, we say every particle we see in the universe has got wave associated with it. has got wave associated with it and what is the wavelength of that wave we say sir lambda is equal to h divided by m into v okay where lambda is the de broglie wavelength h is the planck's constant mv is the momentum mv is the momentum now this is the de broglie wavelength in terms of momentum we say this is the de broglie wavelength in terms of momentum this is the de broglie wavelength in terms of momentum okay now the question which they have asked de broglie wavelength in terms of kinetic energy de broglie wavelength in terms of kinetic energy listen to me very carefully sir as 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 we know sir when it comes to listen to me very carefully when it comes to sir kinetic energy we know kinetic energy is 1 by 2 mv square okay what i want you guys to do is multiply with m and divide with m over here multiply with m and divide with m over here so what it will be sir this will be kinetic energy is equal to 1 by 2 m into m becomes m square into v square divided by over here this is nothing but 2m m into 2 is 2m now take this over here you can write 2m then we have ke is equal to m square v square what remains over here that is m square v square now the take the square and it becomes root over here so this will be under root of 2m ke is equal to m into v under root of 2m ke is equal to m into v okay now i want you guys to put in the equation first put put mv in equation number first put this mv in equation first so can we write it something like this guys can we write it something like this we say sir lambda is equal to h upon instead of this mv i can write simply under root of 2m ke 2m ke so so my dear people my dear people we say my dear people we say we say this we say this is the de broglie wavelength in terms of kinetic energy this is the de broglie wavelength in terms of kinetic energy this is the de broglie wavelength in terms of kinetic energy okay okay now now come over here the next question which i am asking you over here is de broglie find the de broglie wavelength of a relativistic particle all of these are important that you need to understand over here all of these are important that you need to understand over here de broglie wavelength for a rel relativistic particle okay what is a relativistic particle we say it is that particle it is that particle whose speed is comparable comparable to the speed of light whose speed is comparable to the speed of light if i say sir a particle is moving with a huge speed extremely huge speed that speed which we can compare with the speed of light we say that is what we call the relativistic particle like if i say 
I am moving with a hundred meter per second or thirty meter per second. Speed of light is three into ten raised power eight meter per second. When you compare thirty with three into ten raised power eight, it is not a comparison. It is nothing in front of three into ten raised power eight. If I have got a billionaire over here, I have got ten thousand rupees in my pocket. So you cannot compare my money with that billionaire. Why? Because that is having so huge money. That's what I'm saying. If a particle, if a particle is moving with some speed and that speed is comparable to the speed of light. If not equal, but we can compare them. If there is a millionaire and there is a billionaire, we can at least compare them. So we say, we say, we say that is what we call the relativistic particle. And my dear friends, when it comes to the mass of a relativistic particle, we say, sir, its mass is, if we say, sir, this is a relativistic particle, it is moving with a huge speed. What is the mass of this relativistic particle? You say it will be simply m naught under root of under root of 1 minus v square by c square. 1 minus v square by c square m is equal to m naught under root of 1 minus v square by c square where this m naught is what we call the rest mass this is what we call the rest mass rest mass means if the object is at rest and you calculate its mass how much that will come out to be is called the rest mass and this is what we call mass in motion mass in motion and this is the speed with which it is moving and this is the speed of light. Now, for this particle, you have to write the de Broglie wavelength. Let me show you how do we write the de Broglie wavelength for this type of particle. We say, sir, lambda is equal to sir, h divided by mv. Now, what is h's Planck's constant? v is the speed of that particle. What is the mass of that relativistic particle? You can say lambda is equal to h upon. Instead of m, I can write over here, this is m naught. Then we have under root of 1 minus v square by c square. Okay, instead of this, this m, I am writing this. And then you have this v over here. Now take this over in the numerator. So this will be lambda is equal to h. And then you have under root of 1 minus v square by c square. Then you have divided by m naught into v. So this is is this clear? Is this clear, guys? Tell me in the charts. Tell me in the charts de Broglie wavelength for a relativistic particle. De Broglie wavelength for a relativistic particle. Okay, okay, great, great, great. Let's talk about this one. Charge accelerated under potential difference delta V. So we say, find the de Broglie wavelength of a charged particle which is accelerated under potential difference delta v. Listen to me very carefully. If I say, if I say a particle, a particle accelerated under night mode is on, a particle accelerated under potential difference delta v, okay, has, has, Kinetic energy equal to Q delta V. See, see, I say if you have got a particle which you are accelerating, which is accelerating, moving, accelerating because of potential difference, because of potential difference delta V. So that is having the kinetic energy Q delta V. Directly remember it. We don't have to go in much depth because this I have told you before. So even recently I told you in the uh, when we were learning the uh, photoelectric effect. We said this is the kinetic energy of that particle. Now you tell me as, as we know, as we know. You tell me, sir, when it comes to the de Broglie wavelength, we say lambda is equal to h upon under root of 2m ke. 
this is the de Broglie wavelength in terms of kinetic energy which I recently told you. So we can write this lambda is equal to h upon under root of h upon under root of we say sir 2m instead of kinetic energy what we can write is q delta v that is q delta v. So we say this is the de Broglie wavelength this is the de Broglie wavelength of a charged particle this is the de Broglie wavelength of a charged particle which is accelerated under potential difference delta v is that clear guys is that clear guys okay next one we have charge at rest in electric field what does this actually mean it means that let's suppose you have got the electric field over here okay and inside this electric field you have placed a charge okay how much is the de Broglie wavelength of this charged particle listen to me very carefully whenever we place a charged particle in electric field we say sir force acts on it okay sir that force is equal to q times of e and if force acts on something acceleration is there we say sir that acceleration is force upon mass because f is equal to ma instead of force i can write qe so acceleration is qe divided by m now this acceleration is constant my dear friends why because q is constant e is constant m is constant so so i say over here as as after some time when it moves when it moves it will gain some velocity this charge force is acting on it it will move it will gain some velocity we say sir that velocity will be equal to u plus a t initially it was at rest so we say sir initial velocity is zero plus instead of acceleration we can write q e divided by m into t so velocity will be q e by m into t this is the velocity of that particle which is moving in inside the electric field now tell me how to write its de Broglie wa wavelength as we know lambda is equal to h divided by mv this is the general formula for de Broglie wavelength so in this case we can write lambda is equal to h upon then we have m instead of v can we write this sir this v we can write sir q because q e t divided by m because we know we know we know sir this is the velocity of that particle only so we say this m and m we can cancel lambda is equal to h upon q e t guys these are the important expressions okay you have to remember all of these expressions in your mind you have to remember all of these expressions over there in your examination you will not be deriving these questions okay directly you have to remember these and questions can be asked from or directly they can be asked in the question in the in the exam next charged particle placed in a magnetic field b let's suppose we have got a magnetic field over here we have got a magnetic field over here this is the magnetic field b this is the magnetic field b we have got a magnetic field and inside this magnetic field we say sir charge is entering inside this magnetic field okay let's suppose it is moving with some velocity v okay charge placed in a magnetic field b write it perpendicularly perpendicularly means if magnetic field is inwards velocity is forward so angle that is being made over here is 90 degrees okay now whenever the charge which is placed inside the magnetic field okay enters the magnetic field perpendicularly it performs the circular motion it performs the circular motion it performs the circular motion okay it performs the circular motion let me write over here when charge enters the magnetic field perpendicularly it performs circular motion so it moves in a circle it moves in a circle it performs circular motion if 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 it performs
just a second. Okay, see, see. So when a charge enters the magnetic field perpendicularly, it performs the circular motion. Okay. And when it performs the circular motion, listen to me very carefully. Two forces will actually act on it. One is called the centripetal force and another is called the magnetic force. Sir, whenever the charge enters the magnetic field and it has some velocity, we say magnetic force will act. Whenever the charge enters the electric field, we say electric force act. Over here, magnetic force will act. And since the charge is in the circular motion, we say, sir, centripetal force will also act because of its circular motion. And both the forces will be equal. Fc, sir, centripetal is equal to the Fv magnetic. And what is the value of circular, the, this centripetal force? So that is m v square divided by, we say, r. What is, sir, m? m is the mass of this charge. R is the radius of the circle. V is the velocity with which it is moving. mv square by r. And this magnetic force will be, sir, q v b sine of theta. Q is the charge. V is the velocity with which it is moving. And B is the magnetic field in which it is entering. And sine theta, theta is the angle between magnetic field and velocity. That is 90 over here. Okay, over here we say theta is 90 degrees. So we say, sir, in this case, this square and V will get cancelled out. So we say MV will be simply sine 90 is 1. So this will be Q, B and R. So the value of MV is simply Q, B, R. Now, 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 listen to me very carefully. I say, I say, as if we have to write the de Broglie wavelength for this particle, which enters the magnetic field. So we say, we say de Broglie wavelength lambda is equal to H upon, we say MV. This is the general formula. Now, for this particle, what is the value of MV? That is QBR. So we say lambda is equal to H upon, we say QBR. This is the de Broglie wavelength for that charged particle. Is that clear? Is that clear? Let's move on to the next one. Okay, for a gaseous molecule, for a gaseous molecule at temperature T, if you have got a gaseous molecule, centripetal force is not any different force here. It is same magnetic force as centripetal. Yes, this I have told you so many times which I, when I was teaching you the electrostatics, when I was teaching you the magnetism over there only. Centripetal force is not a real force. It is being produced by different forces. Over here, it is being produced by magnetic force. In case of electrostatics, it will be produced because of the electric force. And in case of Newton's laws of motion, if you tie a string to a rope, it will be created because of the tension. We don't have to go. I have told you that. Now see, for a gaseous molecule at temperature T, listen to me very carefully. For a gaseous molecule, For a gaseous, see, if your body is performing the circular motion, centripetal force is there. Now that centripetal force will be created because of magnetic force. But in reality, centripetal force is there. Whenever something performs the circular motion, means centripetal force is there. Okay. Now see, now see, for a gaseous molecule at temperature T, we say, sir, if you have got a gaseous molecule, let's suppose you have got the gaseous molecule over here, okay? Inside this container, you have got these gaseous molecules, which are performing the random motion. And these gaseous molecules have got how much kinetic energy? We say their kinetic energy is 3 by 2, then KBT. What is this KB? This KB is what we call Boltzmann's constant. T is the temperature. Now, if you have to write the de Broglie wavelength of this particle, you say, sir, lambda is equal to H divided by mv. Or don't write this one. We have another form also. We know another form also. That is H upon under root of 2mke. 
This is the de Broglie wavelength in terms of kinetic energy. Nuff, 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 nuff. So we say, sir, this lambda is equal to h divided by under root of, we say, sir, 2m. Instead of kinetic energy, kinetic energy of this molecule is this, how much? We say, sir, 3 by 2. Then we say k, b, and this is t. Okay. So further, you can write it something like this. Lambda is equal to h upon this 2 and 2 will get cancelled. So we say under root of 3m a b and this t. So this is basically the de Broglie wavelength of that gaseous molecule. De Broglie wavelength of that gaseous of a gaseous molecule which has the kinetic energy this much. Okay. You can get the notes. I'll share it on the telegram. You can join this one. Telegram, my telegram is actually that is t.me slash Yawar Manzoor. This is the link, okay? You can join my telegram channel over there. I'll be sharing the notes. Everybody join it right away. t.me slash Yawar Manzoor. Yes, Mushtaq, magnetic force is only the force which is moving the particle in the circle over here. Yes, that is clear. But once the particle moves in a circle, now we say centripetal force also will be there. Okay. Then we say centripetal force is made because of the magnetic force only. It is the general statement which everybody knows, basic statement. Whenever the particle is in the circular motion, it has centripetal force acting on it. We'll give you the break at 9 o'clock, huh? I told you. Now see, or we have to finish this chapter first. For an electron moving in the nth orbit, okay, let's suppose, listen to me very carefully. Let's suppose we have got, we, I'm, I'm making the atom over here. I'm making the atom over here. This is the nucleus. And this is the orbit in which atom is, we know, sir. Inside the nucleus, protons and neutrons are present. An electron is revolving around the nucleus in orbits. And let's suppose this is one more orbit. And let's suppose this is, let's suppose this is one more orbit. That is the, we say, sir, nth orbit. Nth orbit, n can be 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever. Huh? Nth orbit. This is first, second, nth. Okay. And it is saying that if there is an electron, if there is an electron, this is the electron, which is revolving in this nth orbit, how much is the de Broglie wavelength of this particle? How much is the de Broglie wavelength of this particle? Okay. If an electron is revolving in nth orbit, how much is the de Broglie wavelength for this particle? See, for an electron revolving revolving in we say nth orbit its kinetic energy this i will be showing you after some time when we move on to the atoms chapter its kinetic energy is we say sir kinetic energy is we say 13.6 divided by n square 13.6 divided by n square so, if an electron which is revolving in the nth orbit, this electron has got mass, it has velocity. How much will be its energy, sir? 13.6 divided by n square. Now, if it is revolving in first orbit, put the value of n1. If it is revolving in the second orbit, put the value of n as 2. Now, how much is the de Broglie wavelength for this type of particle? We say, sir, lambda is equal to h upon under root of 2m, then we say ke. So we say, sir, lambda is equal to h upon under root of, we say, sir, 2m. Instead of kinetic energy, you can write, sir, 13.6 divided by, we say, n square. This root is for both. Okay. Now, this square and root will get cancelled out. So I can write over here, lambda is equal to, take this n in the numerator, that is n into h. n is the number of orbit. Which number of orbit you are talking about? is Planck's constant and then divided by over here 
this will be 2m into 13.6. So this is the de Broglie wavelength for that particle which is revolving in the nth orbit of an atom. Guys, I want you to tell me if everything is getting clear. Okay, we are done with the entire chapter. Now we have few questions in this particular chapter and we have four or five questions and then we'll start the atomic physics. See, over here we have atomic physics. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven questions we have and then we'll start the atoms. So before that, I want you guys to tell me, I want you guys to tell me if everything is clear, if everything is clear over here. Everybody, everybody. And make sure you like this particular session. Make sure you like this particular session. All the people out there. Make the likes 500 plus. Make the likes 500 plus, everybody. It is 494. The count is at 494. I want you guys to make it 500 plus in, in 10 seconds. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 9, 9.1, 9.2, and 10. Okay, 497 is the likes right now. Make it 500. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, crossed, crossed 500. Thank you, guys. Okay, so. <laughs> now we have this particular question over here my dear friends this is the question i hope till here everything is crystal and clear everything is crystal and clear. now see find the ratio of velocities of proton and alpha particle if de broglie wavelength for both is same see see what the question is saying Question says that we have got an alpha particle or let me write the proton first. We have got a proton. Okay. And we have got an alpha particle. Okay. Now, when it comes to the mass of proton, we say mass of proton is let's suppose M. And when it comes to the alpha particle, this will study in the nucleus chapter after some time. As of now, you remember alpha particle has got mass 4m 4 times mass of proton okay because inside the alpha particle it has got two neutrons and two protons that's why its mass is four times mass of proton now it is saying that de broglie wavelength of this proton is equal to de broglie wavelength of alpha particle it is given we have got de broglie wavelength of this particle proton is equal to the de broglie wavelength of this one now this is moving with some velocity, let's call velocity of proton. This is moving with some velocity, velocity of alpha particle. We have to find, we have to find the ratio of de Broglie, the ratio of velocity of proton and alpha particle. We have to find Vp divided by V alpha in this case. Their de Broglie wavelength is given as same. Now my dear friends, when it comes to the de Broglie wavelength for a proton, we say, sir, it will be H divided by mv. H is Planck's constant. M is the mass of proton. V is the velocity of proton. Vp, I'll write. This is the general formula for a de Broglie wavelength. Now, is equal to, sir, de Broglie wavelength of alpha particle, we say this will be H divided by, sir, m m v. What is the mass of alpha particle, sir? Mass of alpha particle is 4m. So I'll write 4m over here. Because this is m and this is having 4m mass. Now h and h will get cancelled out. This m and m we can cancel out over here. Now this is velocity of, velocity of alpha particle. Take it over there or take it over here. So we can write further. We can write it over here. Sir, this, take this 4 over here. This will be 4 by 1 
is equal take this vp over here this is velocity of particle uh, proton divided by velocity of alpha particle so answer is 4 is to 1 is that clear this is the ratio let's move on to the next one this one yes this one so the question says that over here let me make you understand i hope this is visible it is saying that an electron of mass m accelerated through a potential difference v we have got an electron we have got an electron okay we have got an electron we have got an electron we have got an electron okay and this electron has got de broglie wavelength lambda e we have got an electron it has got de broglie wavelength lambda e okay okay now my dear friends further it says that the de has has de broglie wavelength lambda it has de broglie wavelength lambda it is given the de broglie wavelength associated with the proton of mass m then it says that we have a proton okay and the mass of this is we say sir small m mass of electron is small m mass of proton is we say lambda p is the de broglie wavelength of proton and mass of proton is capital m okay then it says that the de broglie wavelength associated with the proton of mass m through the same potential difference will be it is saying that de broglie wavelength of electron is given as lambda you have to find the de broglie wavelength of proton now now this electron and this proton they have been accelerated under same potential difference delta v mass of pro electron is small m mass of proton is capital m these are the four options you have to solve it accordingly now see when it comes to the electron we say sir if we talk about the de broglie wavelength for an electron tell me one thing de broglie wavelength in terms of potential difference because potential difference is given over here de broglie wavelength in terms of potential difference this is the de broglie wavelength in terms of potential difference we'll use the same formula over here we'll use the same formula over here now see i'll write as lambda in terms in terms of delta v de broglie wavelength in terms of potential difference delta v we say sir lambda is equal to h upon under root of 2m then we say 2m we say we say we say sir uh, q delta v q delta v is accelerated under the same potential difference q delta v. okay this is what we call the de broglie wavelength of electron de broglie wavelength of electron okay now now my dear friends when it comes to the proton we say sir de broglie wavelength of proton it will be also h upon under root of we say 2 what is the mass of proton that is capital m then q delta v q delta v sir this is the de broglie wavelength of this electron it has mass small m that's why i mentioned mass small m it has got mass capital m that's why i mentioned the mass capital m now if i tell you if i tell you divide first by second i'll write over here i'll write over here lambda e divided by lambda p this will be how much this divide with this so we say this will be h upon so this is under root of 2m q delta v upon h upon how much is this that is under root of 2 capital m q delta v 2 capital m q delta v now h h we can cancel out 2 2 q q delta v delta v what remains in this case is we say 1 upon root m from the upper side divided by 1 upon under root of capital m now you can take this in the numerator you can write sir it will be simply under root of this is m divided by small m because if you take this in the numerator it becomes m divided by small m so what we can write over here that is lambda e divided by lambda p is equal to under root of capital m divided by small m okay so we have to find the de broglie wavelength of the proton de broglie wavelength of the proton so in this particular case what we can do 
what we can do is that we can basically we can basically do one thing if you do the reciprocal over here we say sir this lambda p divided by lambda e is equal to under root of m divided by capital m and then this lambda p is equal to lambda e under root of capital m by small m sir you can write over here lambda p is equal to instead of lambda e what you can write is instead of lambda e you can write as lambda put the value of lambda over here under root of capital m by small m lambda capital m by small m option d is that clear is that clear is that clear tell me in the chats everybody Is it clear? Shall we take the break? Hmm? Now, if I say, if I say over here. <clears throat> So, what we can do in this case is, if the velocity of an electron is doubled, then the, if the velocity of an electron is doubled, then its de Broglie wave, de Broglie frequency will be, tell me, what is the answer of this question? If the velocity of an electron is doubled, then its de Broglie frequency will be, tell me. Okay. Last question. Kiss me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Last question. Okay. 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 Just the writing mistake over here. Okay. Option second. Is it correct now? Slip of tongue or tongue of slip. Mm -hmm. We have five, six questions. We have four, five questions. Let's basically finish these four, five questions and then. Now see. <laughs> Come over here. Tell me. If the velocity of an electron is doubled, then the de Broglie frequency will be. See. We have got, let's suppose a particle, okay. It has got de Broglie wavelength. Lambda is equal to H by mv. This is an electron. This electron has got de Broglie wavelength. Lambda is equal to h by mv. Lambda is equal to h by mv. Okay. Now, my dear friends, my dear friends, in this particular case, lambda depends upon the velocity. Okay. This lambda depends upon the velocity. It, it is inversely proportional to the velocity. It is inversely proportional to the velocity. Now, sir. When we say this lambda is inversely proportional to the velocity, tell me one thing. We also know, sir, lambda is, can we say, sir, when it comes to the lambda, 
what is the relation between lambda and frequency we say sir inverse over there only so can i say this lambda is inversely proportional to the frequency also okay yes c by f exactly because f is equal to c by lambda and lambda is equal to c by f so we can say in that case this frequency will be directly proportional to the velocity over here it will be 1 by f is proportional to 1 by v means frequency is directly proportional to the velocity so we say if velocity is doubled so if v is doubled this is f divided by c by f sorry c divided by f so lambda is inversely proportional to the frequency instead of this lambda i am putting 1 by f so then f is directly proportional to the velocity if v is doubled then f will be doubled let's move on to the next one the wavelength lambda e of an electron and lambda p of a photon have same energy e are related by have same energy e are related by this is the homework that i'm giving you guys will be answering this in the comments okay i'll give you the general idea how to solve this question see in this case you are suppose you are given an electron okay you are given an electron and you are given a photon you are giving a photon okay and the energy of this we say sir kinetic energy of this is equal to the kinetic energy of photon so means both have got the same energy in this case then you guys are supposed to find the relation between de broglie wavelength of de broglie wavelength of electron and photon electron and photon you have to find the relation between lambda p and we say lambda e okay this is your homework next i'll be showing you over here okay this is a very good question this was asked in need 2016 and iit je 2021 need 2016 and iit je 2021 now see how i will make you understand this particular question over here an electron and a photon have same energy let's first read the question over here an electron and a photon have same energy e okay we have got an electron over here we have got electron over here okay and this electron has got kinetic energy let's suppose e and we have got a photon we have got a photon it has kinetic energy that is also e it has got kinetic energy that is also e okay it has got got kinetic energy that is also e the ratio of listen to me very carefully the ratio of de broglie wavelength associated with the electron the ratio of de broglie wavelength associated with the electron and that of photon is we have to find the de broglie wavelength of electron is lambda e de broglie wavelength of photon is lambda p what we are supposed to find in this case is the ratio of de broglie wavelength of an electron divided by de broglie wavelength of photon how much is this we have got an electron we have got a photon the energy of both is same but we have to find the ratio of their de broglie wavelengths now in this particular case how do i solve it when it comes to the de broglie wavelength of an electron listen to me very carefully sir we say de broglie wavelength of electron listen to me very carefully as as when it comes to de broglie wavelength of electron we say h upon under root of 2m we say sir ke instead of ke i'll write sir e why am i writing e over here because kinetic energy or energy of an electron is e and this is the formula for de broglie wavelength of a particle when you have some particle you have to find its de broglie wavelength you can find with this formula this is the de broglie wavelength in terms of kinetic energy now when it comes to the photon we do not use this formula to find the de broglie wavelength of photon but which one photon is a different thing so we say as as 
energy of photon is equal to is equal to hc divided by lambda what is lambda lambda is de broglie wavelength only so from here if you take it over there we say sir lambda lambda of photon is equal to hc divided by e where e is the energy of photon this is how we calculate the energy of photon guys do not get confused over here this is how we find the energy of photon and this is how we find the energy of electron or uh, de broglie wavelength of photon and de broglie wavelength of electron electron is a different particle photon is a different particle so we say over here we calculate the lambda like this over here we use the general formula that we know now divide this equation with this so we say sir lambda e divided by lambda p this will be simply sir this is nothing but h upon under root of 2m into e whole divided by this will be sir hc divided by sir e now h and h you can cancel over here so what remains this and this you can cancel what remains if you take this in the numerator so this will be this will be simply e upon e upon we say under root of and this this c will be over here only if you take this in there this will be e upon and this c over here and then you have 2m into e this is the final result further we can so we say lambda of we say lambda of electron lambda of electron divided by lambda of photon it will be simply it will be simply e divided by c we say e divided by c under root of 2m e okay so first what we did is that we calculated the de broglie wavelength for electron then de broglie wavelength for photon then divide these two now my dear friends what we can do is you rationalize this multiply with lambda root e and divide with root e now see this root e into this root e becomes e because root e into root e becomes root e whole square the square and root cancels only remains e so we say sir this will be lambda e upon lambda p it will be simply sir this is e upon 2 e upon this c and under root of 2m under root of 2m and then you have then you have this root e into root e becomes this e and you have this e in the under root e in the numerator this e and this e you can cancel over here so what remains is 1 by c then you have under root of this e divided by under root of 2m okay now this ro root is for this one as well as this one and what is the value of root we say sir this is 1 by c value of root is 1 by 2 so we say e divided by 2m and this is 1 by 2 whole raised power 1 by 2 e by 2m 1 by c 1 by c e by 2m whole raised power 1 by 2 this option a e by 2m is that clear is that clear is that clear guys let me know let me know in the live chat the following has the same energy the following has the same energy see let me first finish these questions i told you the following have the same energy yes this was the question which was actually asked in the j means 2021 exam see we have got an alpha particle listen to me very carefully we have got a neutron we have got a proton we have got a proton we have got an electron we have got an electron we have an alpha particle, we have a neutron, we have a proton, we have an electron. Okay. Now, my dear friends, my dear friends, in this case, yeah. Rudra. Is it? Yeah. Forget me, break. The cure. Yeah, I'm going to take it. Okay, this 
Now see, so we say alpha particle, we have neutron, we have proton and we have an electron, okay. <laughs> we'll give break, we'll give break. Just, just let me solve this question. We have an alpha particle, we have a neutron, we have a proton, we have an electron, okay. Now in this particular case, sir, when it comes to the alpha particle, remember one thing, the mass of alpha particle is greater than mass of neutron, okay, and is equal to the mass of proton is greater than we say mass of electron. Remember this always, mass of electron is less than the mass of proton and when it comes to the neutron and proton both have got the same mass and when it comes to the alpha particle it has got four times mass of proton so mass of alpha particle is large now you tell me one thing we say sir lambda is equal to h divided by mv lambda is inversely proportional to the mass okay so we say over here if in this order we are saying mass is different for different particles now you tell me one thing, sir, sir, all, all, in this particular case, which formula we'll be using, we'll be using this, h upon under root of 2m, 2mke, yes, because all have got the same energy, this alpha particle, neutron, proton, electron, all have got the same energy, that's why kinetic energy for all the four is constant. Sir, Planck's constant is constant, H is constant, means lambda is inversely proportional to this M. Now you tell me one thing, if I say the one which has more mass has got less de Broglie wavelength, which is having more mass alpha particle, so de Broglie wavelength for alpha particle is less than the de Broglie wavelength of neutron is equal to de Broglie wavelength of proton is less than the de Broglie wavelength of electron. This will be the order, okay? And this was the question which was actually asked in NEET 2024. This was the question which was actually asked in the NEET 2024. Uh, not, sorry, J means 2021. Not NEET 2024. Ne uh, J means 2021. Okay? So this is the order of the de Broglie wavelength in this case. Now we have this question. And after this, I'll give you the break. Now, what does this question actually say? We say figure shows four situations in which an electron is moving in electric field and magnetic field. Listen to me very carefully. This is the first case, option A. Here you have got this electric field, okay, this is the electric field. And inside this electric field you have a negative charge. And you have an electron which is moving towards right with velocity B. Okay, this is the electric field. And in case B, you have got this electric field in the forward direction. And this electron also moves in the same direction. Velocity of the electron is in the same direction. Over here, option C. In this case, you have got, we say, sir, magnetic field in the backward direction. And this electron also moves in the backward direction. Now, in the option D, you have got magnetic field in the backward direction. and this electron in this magnetic field is moving in the forward direction. You have to tell me, you have to tell me in which of the four cases de Broglie wavelength of electron is increasing. In which of the four cases de Broglie wavelength of the electron is increasing. Will the de Broglie wavelength of electron increase here, here, here or here? You tell me one thing. See, I'll make you understand. I I'll solve this question. How do we actually solve this question? Listen to me very carefully. Sir, if I say, listen to me very carefully. Sir, de Broglie wavelength lambda is equal to h divided by mv. Now, mass of electron in all the four cases is same. Okay, we say sir, m and this h is same in all four cases. Why? Because over here electron, over here electron, electron, electron. In all the four cases, mass of electron is same. Planck's constant will be same everywhere. So, lambda is inversely proportional to velocity. Means, means, 
if velocity decreases somewhere, then lambda will increase. We have to check in all the four cases, in which case velocity of the electron is decreasing. In that case only, we say de Broglie wavelength of the electron will be increasing because we have to show increasing. Now, if you guys tell me one thing, my dear friends, what is that? If I say this is the electric field, inside the electric field, you have got the inside the electric field, you have got you have got the electron. Okay. Now if you tell me one thing. If we have got the electric field over here, and inside this electric field, we are putting the negative charge. I have told you whenever we place a negative charge inside electric field, we say, sir, force acts on this opposite to the direction of electric field. And if you have positive charge, force acts on it along the direction of electric field. Now, if this, if this, listen to me very carefully, if this charge is moving forward and because of this electric field, force on this will act in the forward direction only. Why? Because electric field is backward. Force on negative charge is opposite to the direction of electric field. Your electric field is forward. Force on negative charge is opposite. That is in the backward direction. So force is also forward. Now you tell me one thing. The car is moving in the forward direction. You are applying more force in the forward direction only. Will the speed of car increases or decreases? Sir, its speed will increase. So in this case, in this case, we say, we say here, here force and velocity in same direction, V is increasing. If V increases, if V is increasing, lambda will decrease. Sir, lambda is decreasing. So this is not our option. Because here velocity is increasing, lambda is decreasing. Now let's talk about this one. Sir, in this case, electric field is forward. We say force on this will act in the backward direction. Now over here, my dear friends, we say, sir, if car is moving in the forward direction, you are pushing it in the backward direction. We say, sir, it's lambda will decrease in that case. We say it's lambda will de decrease in that case. Why? Because here velocity is decreasing. So lambda will increase. Its speed will decrease. Lambda will increase. I hope this is clear. Now let's talk about the option three. Let's talk about the option three. See, this is the magnetic field. Now, my dear friends, in case of magnetism, I have told you, if this is the magnetic field in the forward direction and a charge is moving along the magnetic field only. We say, sir, force acts on this charge that is equal, F is equal to QVB sine of theta. Whenever the charge moves inside a magnetic field, force acts on it. That's what we call the magnetic force that's equal to QVB sine theta. Theta is the angle between velocity and magnetic field. How much is that? Sir, theta is zero degree over here. Why? Because both are in the same direction. If theta is zero, we say, sir, force will be QVB sine of zero. Sine zero is zero, so force in that case will be zero. So we say over here, force on this charged particle is zero. Why? Because velocity and magnetic field are in the same direction. If force is zero, we say, sir, velocity is constant. If velocity is constant, we say, sir, lambda is constant. So in this case, lambda is not increasing, it is constant. Here also, sir, magnetic field is backward. Velocity is forward. Here, theta is 180 degrees. So we say magnetic force in this case is QVB sine of 180. Sine 180 is zero. So magnetic force in this case is also zero. No force is acting on this negative charge on this electron. So we say then velocity remains constant. So lambda is also constant. So this is not our case. So option B is the correct option in which this is increasing. Is this clear guys? This was, this was a great question actually. This is the combination of different mixture of different concepts. So option B is the correct option. Okay.
Okay, now break. Kill. Nine. Nine fifty five. Okay guys, let's take a break. Let's come back at 9.55. This is 9 done right now. We are done with this chapter, okay? Next we have to start the atoms.
Okay, all right, people. Let's start the session. So, guys, welcome back to the session. Let's start the new chapter. That's what we call the atoms or we say atomic physics. Okay. This is the next chapter that we will be starting. Are you guys ready for the second chapter? Everybody let me know in the live chat. Is everyone ready for the next chapter? In the live chat, I just need to know. Everybody out there. Okay. I just need to know. Okay, great, 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 great. Now, <clears throat> we'll have to discuss in this particular chapter, Atomic Physics, We'll have to talk about the atoms, okay? Different models of the atom, different models of the atom. So we say here we discuss different models of the atom, like how does atom actually look like? So we say Thomson was the first guy. He was the first guy who actually came with a model of atom. He said an atom looks something like this, okay? I'll tell you this model. I'll we'll have to study this in detail. And then afterwards, we say came the next scientist physicist, we call him Rutherford, okay. Rutherford also gave the atomic model, that's what we call the Rutherford's atomic model. And then we have afterwards, we say Bohr. Bohr was basically the third one who actually gave the atomic model, okay. So this is what we call the Bohr's model of an atom. This is Thomson's model of an atom, okay. Different people actually gave the different models of the atom. Now, so we say, we say, sir, if we are talking about anything in this world, we say this is also made up of the atoms, small tiny particles called atoms, okay? Now, how does that atom actually look like? The first one who gave the atomic model was basically the Thomson. Okay, now see, now see. So what does the Thomson actually say? What did he actually say? Listen to me very carefully over here. When it comes to the Thomson's model of an atom, he said, he said that this atom, an atom, an atom is like, like a watermelon. Okay. He said, if you take a watermelon and if you compare that watermelon with the atom, it will be exactly similar. Okay, it will be exactly similar. Like if I say, I have got a watermelon over here. I have got a watermelon over here. This is the watermelon that I have. And I know inside the watermelon, you have those seeds. You have those seeds. Okay, these are the seeds which you have inside the watermelon. Now, my dear friends, he said, if you take atom, that is exactly similar like watermelon. Inside this watermelon, inside this watermelon, these are what we call seeds, okay? And then this is the portion which we actually eat, that red portion, okay? So we say, we say seeds represent, seeds represent, we say electrons, okay? And, and, Red portion, red portion represent, represent, we say sir, positive charge, we say sir, positive charge. He said seeds represent electrons and red portion represent positive charge. He said if you go and if you buy a watermelon, if you cut it, inside the watermelon if you see there are seeds present. And there is that red portion which we actually eat. He said, if you take the atom also, in that atom, there will be something exactly like you have seeds in the watermelon, 
that something is what we call the electrons. So we say that red portion is what we call the positive charge. That red portion is what we call the positive charge. Okay. Okay. And one more point he said that atom, atom is, is electrically, atom is electrically neutral. Atom is electrically neutral. What does electrically neutral actually mean? It means number of positive charge, number of positive charge is equal to, we say, number of negative charge, okay? It is not like positive charge is more and negative charge is less or negative charge is more and positive charge is less. No, it will be same. That's why we say atom is electrically neutral. One more point actually he said, let me just tell you over here. That is nothing but we say positive charge, positive charge inside an atom, inside an atom is, is uniformly, is uniformly distributed. So the first point he said that atom is exactly like a watermelon. If you take a watermelon, it will be atom. Atom is exactly similar to it. Now seeds represent positive, uh, we say negative charge are electrons and rest of the portion represent positive charge. He said this positive charge inside an atom is, is uniformly distributed. If you take the atom over here, sir, this positive charge is equally distributed inside this atom. It is not like if you take this particular portion over here, if you take, let's suppose this portion, sir, at, in, in this portion, positive charge is more and in this portion, positive charge is less. No, positive charge will be same in both the portions. It is uniformly distributed everywhere when it comes to the atom. Okay, when it comes to the atom. And next, this was, this was the atomic model. This was the atomic model, which was actually given by, which was actually given by Thomson. Okay. Just the theoretical model. Okay. Just the theoretical model. No proof, nothing at all. This was the theoretical model, which was given by Thomson. Now comes basically the Rutherford. Okay. Rutherford was the second guy who actually gave the atom, who actually gave the atomic model. So how did he give the atomic model? It's not like Thomson. He is coming up with some theoretical points. No, he actually performed an experiment. That's what we call alpha particle, alpha particle scattering, scattering experiment. Alpha particle scattering experiment. So he actually performed alpha particle scat scattering experiment. And from the results of alpha particle scattering experiment, he basically told us how does an atom actually look like? How does an atom actually look like? So what was this alpha particle scattering experiment? Listen to me very carefully. He took a radioactive substance or we call it alpha particle, alpha particle source. Sir, what does alpha particle source mean? Alpha particle source means which provides so many alpha particles from which so many alpha particles are coming out. Sir, what is this alpha particle? Let me just tell you over here. Sir, when it comes to alpha particle, sir, this alpha particle is made up of, we say, when two protons and two neutrons combine, they form the alpha particle. So alpha particle contains two protons and two neutrons, as simple as that. If I say, sir, I have got a light source over here. Sir, from the light source, we say light is coming out. But from the alpha particle source, alpha particles are coming out. And this is what we call the beam of alpha particles. Beam of alpha particles. This is what we call the beam of alpha particles. So many alpha particles are actually coming out. Okay. Now, my dear friends, he took a gold foil over here. It is mentioned a gold foil is shown over here. Now, then he took another one. That's what we call the deflection screen. Deflection screen. Now, my dear friends, when alpha particles were coming out 
and they were crossing this gold foil. This was a very thin gold foil. Okay, this is very thin. So alpha particles were coming out of the alpha source and then they were crossing the gold foil and were falling on the screen over here and producing the bright spot. So they were producing bright spot, bright spot. Okay, this was actually the experiment. And this screen was actually showing us at which point the alpha particles are striking on the screen. If bright spot is being made over here, then means alpha particles are striking over here. If alpha particle will strike over here, then this brightness will be on the screen will be shown up. Okay. Now, what was actually, what was actually, uh, what were, the, what was the conclusion that we got from this one? Point number one was, we say, sir, the point number first is 99.86% alpha particles, alpha particles directly, directly crossed, directly cross the gold, gold foil, directly cross the gold foil and fall on the screen on the screen and directly fall on the screen so we say we say my dear friends if you are sending the alpha particles over here they are crossing the gold foil we say how many alpha particles are directly falling on the screen 99.86% so how many percent are being deviated? So we say, sir, only, only, we say 0.14 percent, okay, are deviated. Are deviated. Only 0.14 percent. And that 0.14 percent may be the error only. Or we can say it something like this. 1 in 8,000, 1 in 8,000 alpha particles are deviated. 1 in 8,000 alpha particles are deviated, are deviated or reflected back or are, are reflected back in this particular case. Okay, okay. Now you guys tell me one thing. You guys tell me one thing. So what was the conclusion? This actually happened. We took a gold uh, alpha source. So the alpha particles are coming out and they are crossing the gold foil and falling on the screen directly. And when they are falling on the screen directly, how many alpha particles are falling? We say, sir, 99.86% are directly crossing. Now, my question to you is, my dear friends, my question to you is, my dear friends, if I, I, I'm saying over here, I'm saying over here, Thompson said the positive charge is present in the entire sphere. Positive charge is present in the entire atom. Let me just tell you one thing. If I say, let's suppose, if I say, let's suppose we have, we have got an atom over here. If I say, let's suppose we have got an atom. And according to Thomson, positive charge is present in the entire sphere. This is the positive charge. It is present in the entire atom, uniformly distributed. And, and you are sending the alpha particles from here. You are sending the alpha particles from here. Okay. Alpha particles have got, alpha particles have got, we say, sir positive charge because protons are available in the alpha particle protons are present in the alpha particle so basically i can say it something like this these are the positive charge which are basically coming towards the atom tell me one thing sir if this positive charge is coming towards the positive charge only because positive charge is distributed among the whole sphere according to thompson we say they should get they should get deviated something like this they should deviate something like this. They should deviate something like this. They should deviate something like this. We say if you are sending, let's suppose 100 alpha particles or 8000 alpha particles. So among 8000, at least 2000 should be deviated, if not all. Okay, 100 should be at least deviated. 10 should be at least deviated. 40 should be at least deviated. But that doesn't happen. That didn't actually happen. So what happened is that we say these alpha particles directly cross the gold foil and have fallen on the screen. They directly cross the gold foil and fall on the screen. How many are reflected back? Only one. Means, sir, these this is positive charge, positive, positive repels. 
So this clearly says that, this clearly says that, this clearly says that. We say according to this model, according to this model, or according to this experiment, according to this experiment, we say positive charge, we say positive charge is not present, is not present uniformly, is not present in the, in the entire atom. Entire atom. Okay? Because if positive charge was present in the entire atom, then these alpha particles should have deviated, but they did not deviate. It did not deviate, actually. You got it what I am trying to say? Okay. So we say this positive charge, but is present, but is present at a unique position. Unique position. What is present at a unique position called, called nucleus. What is present at a unique position, that's what we call the nucleus. That's what we call the nucleus. Something like this. This is the nucleus at the center. And if you are sending the alpha particle over here, it is directly crossing. And if you are sending one more alpha particle, something like this, it is also directly crossing. And if you are sending the alpha particle over here, which is basically being, which is, which is, which is, which is colliding with the nucleus, then this alpha particle will be reflected back. And if this alpha particle, this will directly cross and this alpha particle will also directly cross in this case. So means my dear friends, that's why, why we say sir, if you are sending the, if alpha particle, positive charge was present in the entire sphere, then all of these ha would have repelled or deviated. But that did not happen actually. We say all the alpha particles crossed except, except one. One in 8000 did not cross. Okay, so that was repelled because of this nucleus. Because positive charge is coming towards this positive charge in nucleus. That's why it was repelled back. That's why it was repelled back. Okay, that's why this was the conclusion. So according to the Rutherford, we say positive charge is not present in the entire sphere. But, 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 but we say, we say, we say it is present at a unique position. It is present at a unique position. That's what we call the nucleus. That's what we call the nucleus. And one more point he said. He said electrons revolve. Revolve around the nucleus. Around the nucleus. In, in a random orbits. Random. Random orbits. Okay. He said, electrons are not distributed like seeds inside an atom, but it is revolving and electron is revolving around the nucleus, around the nucleus in the random orbits, in the random orbits, okay? Okay? Not any particular orbit. Okay? And one more point he said, that is nothing but, when it comes to the radius of an atom, when it comes to the radius of an atom, he said, radius of atom it is 10 raised power minus 10 meters and when it comes to the radius of nucleus it is 10 raised power minus 15 meters okay 10 raised power minus 15 meters is basically the radius of nucleus okay so this was all about basically rutherford's alpha particle scattering experiment so Rutherford said an atom, an atom, inside an atom, positive charge is present at a unique position. That's what we call the nucleus. That's what we call the nucleus. That's what we call nucleus. Okay. And electrons are revolving around the nucleus in random orbits. Okay. Not in a fixed orbit. Random orbits. Random orbits. Okay. Because this is the clear proof which says that if, if positive charge was present in the entire sphere, then, then it would have not crossed directly and fallen on the screen. Is it clear? Let me know in the live chat, guys. Is it clear? Is it clear? Let me 
write the points over here that is the drawbacks that is the drawbacks so i'll write it over here drawbacks drawbacks of rutherford's model drawbacks of the rutherford's model okay see when it comes to the drawbacks of rutherford's model listen to me very carefully guys if you are not like this session like it as soon as possible when it comes to the drawbacks of a rutherford's model the drawback was actually i'll, I'll just write the statement over here i'll just write the statement over here the statement is basically something like this. I say it could not explain. It could not explain. It could not explain the. It could not explain the stability. It could not explain the stability of an atom of an atom. Sir, what does that mean? See, that means when he basically presented his model in front of different physicists, okay, then he said that you have got an atom, okay, you have got an atom, inside the atom you have the nucleus and around the nucleus you have got, around the nucleus, you have got an electron which is revolving around it. Okay, you have got an electron which is revolving around it. This is the electron which is revolving around it. Cool. Now, the question that different number of physicists asked him, in this case, we say electron is revolving. In this case, we say electron is revolving. Means, means, if electron is revolving, means, sir, charge is revolving, okay? Electron has got negative charge means charge is revolving. So we say charge is accelerating. Sir, what does acceleration mean? See, if I say a particle is moving in circle, is, the, is this circular motion accelerated motion? Does the particle have acceleration when, he is, when it is moving in circle? We say yes, this is an accelerated motion. It has centripetal acceleration. So if electron is revolving over here, it is an accelerated motion. So we say charge is accelerating in this case. Electron is accelerating in this case. And whenever the charge accelerates, remember this my dear friends, we say electromagnetic wave, wave is produced. This I'll tell you when we study the electromagnetic waves. We say electromagnetic wave is produced. We say electromagnetic wave is produced. We say electromagnetic wave is produced. Now see, so charge is accelerating. We say, sir, electromagnetic wave is produced. Okay. Sir, electromagnetic wave means, sir, energy is released. Energy is radiated. Energy is radiated. Or energy is released. Production of electromagnetic wave means radiation of energy. Energy is released. Energy is released. Okay, energy is radiated. Now, if energy is radiated means energy is losing. This electron is actually losing the energy when it is revolving around the nucleus. If electron is losing the energy means it will, it will, it will get attracted towards the nucleus because nucleus will keep on attracting it towards itself because electron is losing the energy losing the energy losing the energy and at some point it will fall into the nucleus at some point it will fall into the nucleus so if electron which is revolving around the nucleus is losing the energy radiating the energy means at some point it will keep on going towards towards the nucleus and it will fall into the nucleus so we say if energy is released we say electron falls into the nucleus electron falls into the nucleus and if electron falls into the nucleus what does that mean that means an atom is unstable an atom is not stable but we know when it comes to an atom electron does not fall into the nucleus because it's a stable system so this proves so i'll write over here this proves this proves proves we say atom is unstable 
because if electron is collapsing falling into the nucleus means this proves that atom is unstable but we know atom is stable but we know we know atom is stable atom is stable hence hence so he couldn't basically answer this particular question that's why it became the drawback that's why it became the drawback second drawback that we say is that it could not explain the line spectrum of hydrogen that we'll see later on that we'll see later on this was the main drawback that i want you guys to focus on now after this after this basically comes which one that's bohr's model of atom we are done with the rutherford's model of atom then comes basically the bohr's model of an atom what does bohr's model of an atom actually say listen to me very carefully my dear friends yes bohr, bohr proved this so we say bohr gave his model in three postulates three postulates you can kind of understand in three parts bohr's first postulate bohr's second postulate and bohr's third postulate okay he basically presented his model in three parts in three postulates what was the first postulate of the bohr let me know in the live chat if this is crystal and clear till over here and make sure you like this session guys So basically, what does Bohr's first postulate actually say? It proves the stability, stability of an atom. It proves the stability of an atom. Bohr's first postulate actually proves the stability of an atom. Okay? Bohr's first postulate proves the stability of an atom stability of an atom Bohr's first postulate proves the stability of an atom like what was the drawback of Rutherford's model it couldn't prove the stability of an atom so finally Bohr came he proved basically the stability of an atom so Bohr actually said if you have got a nucleus over here we know around the nucleus you have electron which is revolving around the nucleus yes 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 I completely agree with you so Bohar said, I completely agree with you. Electron is revolving. We say electron. We say electron is revolving. We say electron is revolving. And electron is revolving means, sir, charge is accelerating. Charge is accelerating. Why, sir? Because, sir, electron is performing the circular motion. Circular motion is an accelerated motion. Means charge is accelerating over here if electron revolves around the energy around this so so if charge is accelerating listen to me very carefully he said it forms the wave sir whenever charge accelerates wave is produced we say sir wave wave is produced but but my dear friends in this case in this case we said Sir, electromagnetic wave is produced. But here we say, here we say stationary wave is produced. Stationary wave is produced. Stationary wave is produced. Stationary wave is produced by the superposition of two waves. Okay. And it is that wave which does not, does not radiate. Which does not radiate energy which does not radiate energy it is that wave which does not radiate energy means 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 if it does not radiate energy we say sir electron is not losing the energy if electron is not losing the energy we say it will not collapse into the nucleus we say sir it does not radiate energy hence hence electron does not radiate energy so it won't collapse into the nucleus into the nucleus hence atom is stable hence atom is stable hence atom is stable is that clear my dear friends Is that clear? 
what I'm trying to say is that if an electron is revolving around the nucleus, means electron is accelerating, means charge is accelerating. So accelerated charge is producing the wave, but Bohr said it does not produce the EM wave, but which one? It produces the stationary wave. Stationary wave is, you, you might have studied this in the waves chapter. Stationary wave is that wave which does not release energy. Electromagnetic wave means release of energy. It is releasing the energy, losing the energy. So we say over here it does not release the energy. Since an at electron around an atom revolves in the stable orbits without the emission of energy. Without the emission of energy. So the statement actually was an atom, an atom revolves an electron, an electron revolves, an electron revolves around the nucleus in stable orbits, in stable orbits without the emission without the emission of radiant energy okay so means when an electron revolves around the nucleus it does not lose energy in that case means atom is stable over here okay okay now comes basically the Bohr's second postulate sir what does Bohr's second postulate say what does Bohr's second postulate say? So we say Bohr's second postulate defines the stable orbits. We say it defines the stable, stable orbits. Sir, what does that mean? What does that mean? Listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. Oh, let's suppose we take an atom over here. This is a positive charge, okay? This is a positive charge. And around the positive charge, let's suppose an electron is revolving. This is the electron revolving around the positive charge. Rutherford said, when it comes to an electron, the electron can revolve around a nucleus in any orbit, in random orbits. But Bohr said, an electron can revolve in those orbits only. An electron can revolve in those orbits only where its angular momentum is nh divided by 2 pi where its angular momentum is nh divided by 2 pi if i say this is the nucleus sir this is the first orbit second orbit third orbit let's suppose these are the different orbits sir if an electron is having listen to me very carefully if an electron is revolving in this orbit it is only possible if 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 angular momentum of electron in this orbit is equal to nh divided by 2 pi. If this is not equal to nh divided by 2 pi, then we say electron cannot revolve in this orbit. And if I say, check if an electron is revolving in this orbit, you say, sir, check its angular momentum, that is nh divided by 2 pi. If the angular momentum of this electron is nh by 2 pi, then we say, yes, electron can revolve in this particular orbit. Let me write the statement that will give you the more feel, that will give you the more feel over here and you will understand it much better. Now see, we say an electron, an electron can revolve, revolve only in those orbits, only in those orbits where its angular momentum angular momentum guys let's suppose if there are some students who don't know who don't know actually anything about the angular momentum what to do in that case sir just remember it directly because i will not explain the angular momentum over here then i'll have to go to the rotation so directly remember okay then directly remember this see we say an electron can revolve in those orbits. An electron can revolve only in those orbits where its angular momentum L is equal to nh divided by 2 pi. Okay. 
if this electron is having the angular momentum of nh by 2 pi in this orbit, then we say it can revolve in this orbit. That is true. Okay. Now, my dear people, my dear people, listen to me very carefully. If I ask you, if I ask you, if I ask you, an electron is having the angular momentum of h divided by 2 pi. An electron revolving in an orbit has an angular momentum of h by 2 pi. Is it possible that he is revolving in this orbit? We say yes. Because in this case, value of n is 1. We say value of n is 1. And if I say, sir, 2h divided by 2 pi, we say, sir, n is equal to 2 over here. If an electron is having the angular momentum of 2h by 2 pi, can it revolve in that orbit? We say yes. So we say these are the possible angular moment momentums. We say, we say, h, I'll write over here, where, where, n is equal to 1, 2, 3 and so on. So possible angular momentums. Angular momentum. So we say sir if you put n is equal to 1 so it will be h by 2 pi. If you put n is equal to 2 we say sir this will be 2h divided by 2 pi. If you put n is equal to 3, 3h divided by 2 pi. If you put n is equal to 4, 4h divided by 2 pi. So all of these momentums, if, if an electron is having this angular momentum, yes, then he is revolving, then it is revolving in an orbit. If I say, does elect, if an electron has this angular momentum, is it revolving in an orbit? We say yes. We say yes. Okay. We say yes, we say yes. Okay. So, an electron can have this angular momentum in an orbit. An electron can have this angular momentum in an orbit. An electron can have this angular momentum in an orbit. Here, n is equal to 3, n is equal to 2. And if I ask you the question, if I ask you the question, if I ask you the question, listen to me very carefully. Can an electron revolve in an orbit? in an orbit where its angular momentum is 3h by 4 pi, 3h by 4 pi. Can an electron revolve in an orbit where its angular momentum is 3h by 4 pi? Can you solve this particular question? See, it is saying that an electron, let's suppose this is the nucleus, around the nucleus an electron is revolving and its angular momentum is 3h by 2, 2 pi. Check, check. If it is true, how do you check? We say, sir, this 3h by 2 pi, this 3h by 4 pi, sorry. This 3h by 4 pi is equal to, make it equal to nh by 2 pi. Why? Because we know an electron can revolve only in that orbit where its angular momentum is nh by 2 pi. Now you tell me one thing. We say, sir, pi and pi will cancel, h and h will cancel. Two ones and two twos. So n will come out to be 3 divided by 2. What is 3 by 2? We say, sir, n is equal to 1.5 in this case. So n has to be, sir, integer that is 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. So we say in this case, in this case, in this case, we say, we say, we say in this case, no. Answer is no. An electron cannot revolve in that orbit where its angular momentum is 3h by 4 pi. Is it clear now? I hope this is clear now. Okay. Let's come on to the Bohr's third postulate. What was the Bohr's first postulate? Bohr's first postulate was an electron revolves around the an electron revolves in an orbit where it does not radiate energy, where it does not release energy. Second was, an electron revolves only in those orbits where its angular momentum is nh by 2 pi or quantized. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. One, two, three. 
Now see, now see. Bohr's third postulate. What does Bohr's third postulate actually say? Can anybody of you tell me in the live chat? So when it comes to the Bohr's third postulate, we say, we say, let's suppose, let's suppose we have got an, we have got a nucleus over here. Let's suppose we have got a nucleus over here. We have got a nucleus over here. This is the nucleus. We have got a nucleus over here. This is the nucleus, okay? And around the nucleus, the electron is revolving, let's suppose, in this orbit. The electron is revolving, let's suppose, in this orbit. Okay? And then, we say, we say, the electron can revolve in this orbit only. Okay? The electron is revolving in this orbit. So this is the first orbit, second orbit, third orbit. We say the first point is, the first point is an electron can revolve, can revolve, an electron can revolve in an orbit, in an orbit. If an electron is revolving in an orbit, let's suppose the electron is revolving in this orbit. An electron can revolve in an orbit without without losing losing the energy so if an electron is revolving in an orbit it does not lose the energy but my dear friends listen to me very carefully if it makes if it makes the transition from higher orbit to the lower orbit if it moves from higher orbit to the lower orbit, let's suppose initially it was revolving in the orbit number 3. Now, it went from orbit number 3 to orbit number 2. Now, it is revolving in the orbit number 2. If it makes the transition, if it makes the transition from, we say, higher orbit, higher orbit to lower orbit if it makes the transition from higher orbit to lower orbit then energy is released in that case then energy is released in that case then energy is released in that case okay then energy is released in that case okay so if the electron makes the transition for higher from higher orbit to the lower orbit, we say energy is released in that case in the form of photon. In the form of photon. In the form of photon. Means a photon is actually released in that case. Okay. And, and next point is my dear friends. If an electron makes the transition from lower orbit to the higher orbit. If an electron makes the transition makes the transition transition from we say lower orbit lower orbit to the higher orbit then energy is absorbed in that case energy is absorbed absorbed in that in that case so means if you want the electron should make the transition from this orbit to the higher orbit then you guys are supposed to give the energy in that case you have to supply the energy to this electron then only it can move to the higher orbit but if it makes the transition from higher to the lower in that case we say energy is released in that case we say energy is released In that case, we say energy is released. Is this clear? This was the Bohr's third postulate. Is this clear? Let me know in the live chat. We will move forward. And make sure you like this session, guys. Hit the like button. We have to cross 1000 likes today. That is mandatory. Now, mathematical analysis of Bohr's model. Mathematical analysis of Bohr's model. So what does mathematical analysis of Bohr's model say? 
फर्स्ट इज वेलोसिटी ऑफ एन इलेक्ट्रॉन इन एंथ ऑर्बिट वेलोसिटी ऑफ एन इलेक्ट्रॉन इन एंथ ऑर्बिट वेलोसिटी ऑफ एन इलेक्ट्रॉन इन एंथ ऑर्बिट ओके ग्रेट नाउ सी लेट सपोज आई से सर दिस इज द न्यूक्लियस ओवर श्योर एंड अराउंड द न्यूक्लियस वी नो एन एटम इज बेसिकली रिवॉल्विंग अराउंड द न्यूक्लियस ओके we know sir an atom is revolving an electron is revolving around the nucleus i'll make that electron over here this is the electron which is revolving around the nucleus and it has mass m it has mass m and this is the radius this is the radius from center to the to the to, to the electron to the electron okay now my dear friends this orbit is what we call nth orbit sir what does nth orbit actually mean n can be 1 n can be 2 n can be 5 if n is 1 means first orbit if n is 2 means second orbit if n is 3 means third orbit if n is 4 means fifth orbit okay so we say we say we say we say sir this is the nth orbit now my dear friends if this electron is revolving in the nth orbit we say sir it has velocity it is moving with some speed yes so that's we what we need to find out velocity of an electron in nth orbit in nth orbit how much is the velocity of an electron in nth orbit how much is the velocity of an electron in nth orbit how much is the velocity of an electron okay now listen to me very carefully i'll show you the derivation part in this one only but in the rest of the questions i'll not be showing you the derivation part okay now see over here listen to me very carefully if i say if i say in this particular case sir an electron is revolving in an orbit okay we say sir in this case centripetal force is equal to we say sir over here that is electrostatic force okay what i am trying to say what i am trying to say in this particular case is that sir this electron is revolving around the nucleus means centripetal force is acting because this charge is performing the circular motion and you have got a positive charge you have got a negative charge so we say sir between the two charges electrostatic force will act so this is equal to m v square divided by r where r is the radius m is the mass of electron v is the velocity with which it is moving and this is equal to this is equal to electrostatic force sir electrostatic force between this positive charge and this negative charge now my dear friends what i am trying to say is that if we talk about the nucleus listen to me very carefully we say sir nucleus has ze e charge how much is the charge of the nucleus we say ze e how let me show you if i say you have got a nucleus over here this nucleus has got 1 2 3 3 protons okay these are the three protons e e e these are not electrons protons how much is the charge inside the nucleus we say sir inside the nucleus you have got 3e charge okay if you have another nucleus in which you have sir five protons let's suppose how much is the charge on this nucleus we say sir 5e and if you have a nucleus in which you have z protons z number of protons how much is the charge of this nucleus z into e as simple as that that's why i mentioned over here z into e z into e so we say sir this will be when it comes to the electrostatic force that is k q1 q2 by r square so instead of k we know sir k is equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon not so we write 4 pi epsilon not and q1 q2 q1 is this charge that is z e q2 is this charge that is e that is z e square Z e into e is Z e square. See, this is k q one q two divided by r square. The distance between them is r square. This, see, guys, this is k q one q two divided by r square. So we say instead of k, I'll write four pi epsilon naught. Then you have this r square. Instead of q one, you write Z e. Instead of q two, you write e. This is this one. is this clear till over here is this clear till over here yes 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 now my dear friends my dear friends we say sir over here clearly this r square and one this r and one square will get cancel out over here and now what i want you guys to do is that take this m over here take this r over here 
and we can write it something like this v into m v r okay i'm taking one v out then you have m v and this r is equal to from this side you have z e square z e square upon we say sir 4 pi epsilon naught z e square upon 4 pi epsilon naught let's call this as equation number first let's call this as equation number first see i will be showing you this small derivation in this part only velocity part rest of the parts i'll not show you the derivation keep that thing in your mind now see now as as angular momentum angular momentum momentum of an electron of an electron in nth orbit if you have got an electron which is revolving in the nth orbit recently i told you sir its angular momentum is equal to nh divided by 2 pi nh divided by 2 pi and this nh divided by 2 pi is the angular momentum see sir, what is the normal general formula of angular momentum in mechanics sir that is mvr this is the formula for angular momentum that we have studied in ro rotational motion but this is the formula for angular momentum that we have studied from Bohr's second law, Bohr's second postulate. So we say, sir, this MVR, this MVR will be equal to NH by 2 pi. Now, this is the equation number second. I want you guys to put instead of this MVR, NH divided by 2 pi over here. Okay. In the next slide, we'll write. So we say V into, V into, I'll write put second in first put this in first v into instead of mvr i am writing nh by 2 pi so i am writing this nh divided by 2 pi okay is equal to is equal to over here over here over here this will be z e square upon 4 pi epsilon naught r this will be z e square upon 4 pi epsilon naught 4 pi epsilon naught okay now now guys we just have to do the calculations pi and pi will get cancelled and this is 2 so we can write v is equal to z e square upon we say th that is 2 n h epsilon naught and over here h over here 2 epsilon naught is over here so we can write v is equal to this will be take this out e square upon 2 h epsilon naught then you have z by n take z out n out now e is the charge on an electron h is the Planck's constant, epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space. All of these have the value, all of these, if you put all those values, put the value of, put the value of, we say E, h, epsilon naught in above equation, in above equation. So then, then this after solving, that value will come out to be 2.2 into 10 raised power 6. Then you have Z divided by N. This is the velocity of an electron which is revolving in nth orbit. This is the velocity of an electron which is revolving in nth orbit. This is the velocity of an electron which is revolving in nth orbit. Or you can say it something like this. V is equal to V naught Z divided by N. Sir, what is Z? Where, where Z is, where Z is atomic number, atomic number, okay. And we say N is, N is number of orbits. Like for hydrogen, atomic number is 1. For helium, atomic number is 2. Is that clear, guys? Let me know in the live chat. So this is the velocity of an electron revolving in the nth orbit of hydrogen atom <clears throat> yes 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 okay Okay, so this is basically the velocity of an electron in nth orbit. So we say this is the velocity, this is the, this is the velocity 
ऑफ एन इलेक्ट्रॉन इन एंथ ऑर्बिट दिस इज द वेलोसिटी ऑफ एन इलेक्ट्रॉन इन एंथ ऑर्बिट Now let's talk about the radius of an electron in nth orbit. Let's suppose I say I have got a nucleus over here. Okay, I have got a nucleus over here. Sir, this is the nucleus. Okay, this is the nucleus. Okay, this is the nucleus which I have over here. Do maglo tha bilay? Ita. <laughs> Who is singing over here? Can you guess in the live chat? Rakh lo chupa ke. He is actually the washroom singer. Huh? <laughs> ओके गाइस नाउ वी हैव ब्रो प्लीज गो प्लीज गो लेट मी फिनिश दिस वाव एवरीबडी इज लाइक वाव ओके नाव सी लेट सपोज वी हैव गॉट दिस न्यूक्लियस ओवर हियर एंड अराउंड द न्यूक्लियस वी हैव एन इलेक्ट्रॉन विच इज रिवॉल्विंग इन द एंथ ऑर्बिट ओके दिस इज एंथ ऑर्बिट एंड दिस इज द रेडियस दिस द रेडियस इन दिस केस वी हैव टू फाइंड द formula for this radius how much is this radius what is the formula what is the equation for this radius okay what is the equation for this radius now my dear friends my dear friends i will not the approach is simple directly you just have to do the previous approach by that you can basically find this radius but i'll write the equation directly over here so we say when it comes to this radius in nth orbit listen to me very carefully we say sir this radius r is equal to we say sir r not r not is constant and then we say sir this is n square divided by z this is n square divided by z r not then we say n square divided by z okay and in this case the value of this r not is 0.53 angstrom 0.53 angstrom this is the constant like you have in this case sir velocity is v not z by n what is the value of v not we say sir value of v not in this case is 2.2 into 10 raised power 6 but in this case the value of r not is we say 0.53 angstrom this is the velocity of an electron in the nth orbit which is revolving in the nth orbit okay okay is this clear is this clear is this clear is this clear now now we have the time period we have the time period let's suppose we have got the nucleus over here we have got the nucleus over here and my dear friends my dear friends we say sir around the nucleus around the nucleus we say electron is revolving around the nucleus electron is a revolving electron is revolving around the nucleus this is the electron which is revolving around the nucleus okay around the nucleus so my dear friends if i say if i say this electron has started its journey from this point and it's revolving 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 reach the same point once again we say sir time period time period is that time is that time time period is that time in which in which an electron in which an electron time period is that time in which an electron completes completes its one cycle in which an electron completes its one cycle one cycle means if this was the initial position final position is this only if it has completed one circle 
how much time it takes in completing the one cycle is what we got what we call the time period is what we call the time period now my dear friends now my dear friends i say when it comes to the time period when it comes to the time period we simply say sir this time period is simply this time period is simply we say 1.51 into into 10 raised power minus 16 1.51 into 10 raised power minus 16 we say sir n cube divided by z square we say n cube divided by z square this is the time period of an electron revolving in the nth orbit revolving in the nth orbit if you have got an electron over here i say how much time it will take in covering the one cycle we say this much is the time period n cube divided by z square and when it comes to the radius we say r naught n square by z and when it comes to the velocity we say v naught z by n keep all these things in your mind over here in your mind over here now my dear people my dear people listen to me very carefully when it comes to the frequency, remember always, sir, frequency is inverse of time period. So whatever is the formula of time period, just put up over here. What is the formula of time period? 1.51 into 10 raised power minus 16 n cube by z square. This is 1.51 into 10 raised power minus 16. Then we have n cube divided by z square. As z means atomic number. If you have got hydrogen over here, for hydrogen atomic number is 1. If you have got helium atomic number is 2. If you have got lithium atomic number is 3. So we say, we say in this particular case, notes will be in the telegram channel. Huh? So we say n cube divided by z square. So we can write it something like this 1 upon 1 upon. See this 1.5, can we write it 3 divided by 2? When you divide 3 with 2, it will be 1.5 into, you say sir, 10 raised power minus 16, 10 raised power minus 16, minus 16, and then you have n cube divided by, we say, z square. Now take it in the numerator. So we say, sir, frequency will come out to be, if we take it over there, 3 by 2 becomes 2 by 3, 2 by 3 into 10 raised power minus 16 becomes 10 raised power plus 16. And this becomes z square by n cube. So this will be the value of frequency in that case. This will be the value of frequency in that case. This will be the value of frequency in that case. Is that clear, my dear friends? Is that clear, my dear friends? Is that clear? Is that clear, my dear friends? This is the frequency of an electron in the nth orbit. If an electron is revolving. Yes, yes, yes. We'll complete the inorganic chemistry and 11th portion also. Don't worry, don't worry. Chill. Now, next is the total energy of an electron in the nth orbit. Total energy of an electron in the nth orbit. See, let's suppose we have got, we have got the nucleus over here. Let's suppose we have got the nucleus over here. This is the nucleus. Let's suppose we have got the nucleus over here. Okay. And around the nucleus, around the nucleus, around the nucleus, around the nucleus, we say, sir, electrons are revolving around the nucleus. Okay. So let's suppose you have got this electron over here. Okay which is revolving in which orbit we say sir nth orbit so previously we calculate its velocity we calculate its radius we calculate time period frequency now 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 we will have to find the energy in this particular case my dear friends if i say this this is moving this electron is moving with velocity v and this radius over here is basically, this radius over here is basically, we say R. And, and the charge, if I just write this nucleus has charge ZE. This nucleus has charge ZE. This is the electron moving with velocity V. Radius is R, nth is orbit and ZE is the charge of the nucleus in this case. Now, my dear friends, listen to me very carefully. We say, sir, this electron has got mass, it has got velocity. 
सो वी से वी से एज काइनेटिक काइनेटिक एनर्जी काइनेटिक एनर्जी ऑफ एन इलेक्ट्रॉन इन एंथ ऑर्बिट सी वेन इट कम्स टू द काइनेटिक एनर्जी वी से सर काइनेटिक एनर्जी इज के काइनेटिक एनर्जी इज वन बाय टू एम वी स्क्वायर वन हाफ ऑफ एम वी स्क्वायर इज वॉट वी कॉल द काइनेटिक एनर्जी ओके नू गाइज टेल मी वन थिंग सर इफ एन इलेक्ट्रॉन इज रिवॉल्विंग अराउंड द न्यूक्लियस वी से इट हैज गॉट सेंट्रिपिटल फोर्स एक्टिंग ऑन इट and it has got electrostatic force acting on it already i told you because there are two charges so electrostatic force will be there and there is circular motion so we say centripetal force will act and this centripetal force is equal to we say this centripetal force will be m v square divided by r is equal to we say sir this electrostatic force will be see k q1 q2 divided by r square Now you tell me one thing, sir. K is one by four pi epsilon naught. Then you have this r square. Instead of q one, you have z e because this is the first charge. This is the second charge, and then you have minus e over here. Why, sir? Minus e. This is cha negative charge over here. Or don't write minus e. Write e only, okay? Because we are talking about magnitude. So we say, sir, this will be z e square upon four pi epsilon naught r square. Okay. Now you guys tell me one thing. You guys tell me one thing. Don't you think that sir, this r and this square will get cancelled out over here? Yes. So m v square in this case m v square is equal to z d square upon four pi epsilon naught r. Now put in equation first. Put in equation number first. I want you guys to put this m v square over here. So we say kinetic energy will come out to be kinetic energy will come out to be. That is one half of then you have z e square upon four pi epsilon naught r. This is the value of kinetic energy. Further, we can write kinetic energy is z e square z e square upon two into four is eight pi epsilon naught r. This is the value of kinetic energy that you can put in the box. This is the kinetic energy of an electron in the nth orbit of hydrogen atom. Okay. okay so we say this is what we call the kinetic energy over here now my dear friends let's talk about the potential energy let's talk about the potential energy we say sir potential potential energy potential energy of an electron potential energy of an electron in nth orbit now see now see my dear friends my dear friends whenever we talk about the potential energy sir see this is the charge this is the nucleus zd this is another charge we have studied in electrostatics if you have a charge q1 if you have charge q2 distance between them is r we say they have potential energy there exists potential energy that is equal to k q1 q2 divided by r k q1 q2 by r now in this case you have got the charge we say sir in this case potential energy is equal to we say here here potential energy is equal to k what is the value of k we say sir value of k is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught now my dear friends the first charge is q1 is z z e q2 is e so we say sir this will be this will be q1 is z e q2 is minus e because when we write potential energy we write the sign of the charges also and then you have distance between them is r okay so potential energy in this case will be minus z e square upon 4 pi epsilon not r now put up this in the box over here 
So this is the potential energy between the nucleus. This is the potential energy between the nucleus and, and the electron which is revolving in nth orbit. And the electron which is revolving in nth orbit. Now, you guys can see this over here. My dear friends, I say Z e square upon 4 pi. See, kinetic energy is 1 by 2. Let's call, let's take this. Kinetic energy is 1 by 2 Z e square upon 4 pi epsilon naught r. See, as, as we say, sir, kinetic energy is 1 half of Z e square upon 4 pi epsilon naught r. Now, Z e square upon 4 pi epsilon naught r. So, this is potential energy. So, instead of this, can I write potential energy? Yes. So, kinetic energy will be simply, that will be potential energy. Instead of this, I am writing potential energy divided by, we say, sir, 2 and put the mod because we have to avoid the negative sign or you can put the negative sign also. Then remove the mod. So, this is another formula that you need to keep in your mind. Is this clear? Tell me, tell me, tell me. Is this clear? Is this clear to each and everyone? Tell me guys. Let me know in the live chat. Okay. Now let's talk about the total energy. Total energy of an electron. Sir, when it comes to the total energy, we say, sir, total energy is potential energy plus kinetic energy. Okay. We got the value of potential energy. We got the value of kinetic energy. Let's find, sir, total energy. Potential energy is minus Z e square upon 4 pi epsilon naught r then plus kinetic energy is how much? When it comes to the kinetic energy, that is Z e square upon 8 pi epsilon naught r. Z e square upon 8 pi epsilon naught r. So, if you subtract this from this, so what will you actually get? We say, sir, the answer that you are going to get is total energy is equal to, that will be minus Z e square upon 8 pi epsilon naught r. What you are supposed to do is, this is 1 by 4 minus 1, minus 1 by 4 plus 1 by 8, that will be 1 by 8 only. So, this is the total energy of an electron. This is the total energy of an electron. In nth orbit. Is this visible to each and everyone? Is this visible to each and everyone? Total energy of an electron in the nth orbit. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Because in case of potential energy, I am taking the negative sign over here. If you have watched my potential energy lecture, if you have watched my electrostatics lecture, there I have shown you these types of questions. When it comes to the potential energy, we say, sir, U is equal to K Q1 Q2 divided by R. But these Q1 and Q2, we take along with the signs. If the charge is negative, so then take minus Q1, minus Q2. That's why I'm taking the negative sign. But in case of kinetic energy, we say, sir, I put up the formula of force over here. In case of force, we do not mention the sign of the charge. This also I have told you in electrostatics. I hope you guys remember. Make sure you hit the like button, guys. Five ninety eight, make it six hundred plus. And and most importantly, I have told you to basically join the test series, huh? This test series, this test series over here, this test series. The link is in the description below. Description of this video, of this lecture that is, uh, need contest test series by our Manzoor sir. This is for physics and this is completely free of cost. I'm personally making the questions, this test series. So join it, enroll in this test series as soon as possible. Because I'm personally making this test series, that's why I'm saying join it as soon as possible. And enter into my Telegram channel. That is also mandatory. 
that the link I'll write over here t.me slash yawar manzoor okay this is the telegram channel which I want you guys to join this is the link it is on every Sundays it is every Sundays I put up the test over there enough so this is basically the total energy this is basically the total energy over here in this particular case this is the total energy over here i hope you got it till over here let's basically make the graph between energy let's make the graph between energy versus r i'll write over here graph between we say energy and r r is the radius okay now if i have to make the graph between e versus r listen to me very carefully listen to me very carefully let me just show you over here let me just show you over here let me just show you over here so i'll be making the graph in this particular case See, how do we actually make this particular graph? On this axis, we mention the energy and on this axis, this is basically R. Now, my dear friends, my dear friends, what I'm trying to say in this particular case is, listen to me very carefully. We have to plot the potential energy on this graph, the kinetic energy on this graph, and we have to plot the total energy on this graph also, okay? Sir, first of all, let's talk about, let's talk about kinetic energy. Sir, when it comes to the kinetic energy, we say, sir, that is ZE square on 8 pi epsilon naught R. In this case, we say, sir, kinetic energy is inversely proportional to R. Clearly, it is inversely proportional to R. So, graph is rectangular hyperbola and, and in this case, it is positive. Kinetic energy is positive. No negative sign is over here. Okay. So when it comes to the potential energy, recently we got the formula for potential energy that is minus z e square upon 4 pi epsilon naught r. And this, this, this potential energy, this potential energy is also inversely proportional to r. See, but this potential energy is negative. Means we have to make the graph of potential energy from the negative side, from the lower side. From upper side, we have to make total energy. Sorry, kinetic energy. And then you have, sir, total energy. So when it comes to the total energy, you say, sir, this is minus Z E square upon, we say, sir, 8 pi epsilon naught R. So in this case, we say, sir, total energy is inversely proportional to R. And this is also negative. This is also negative. Total energy is also negative. Total energy is also negative. Total energy is also negative. Okay. Now, we have to plot the graphs. Whenever it is something like this, means graph is a rectangular hyperbola. So, this will be the graph of, we say, sir, this is the graph of kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is inversely proportional to R and is positive. That's why I'm making it from the upper side. That's why I'm making it from the upper side. And then you have, then you have basically, total energy okay and then you have potential energy over here sir i'll make it over here i'll make it over here we say this is the graph of we say sir this is total energy in this and and with this color i'll make the graph of we say sir potential energy we say sir potential sir why are you making the graphs of total and potential from the lower side because because from the lower side because total energy is negative and potential energy is also negative that's why from the lower side is it clear guys is it clear is that clear tell me in the chats and potential energy potential energy is more from the negative side that's why graph 
this comes in between. Why? Because this is z e square by 4 and this is z e square by 8. If you divide z e square with 8, then the answer would come out to be less. And if you divide z e square with 4, the answer would be more in that case. That's why the graph is from the lower side. Hmm. Yes, yes, yes. I'll explain once again. See, I say, sir, kinetic energy is inversely. If I say graph between y versus x, if I say y is directly proportional to x, plot the graph, you'll say, sir, this is the graph. If I say y is inversely proportional to x, plot the graph, you say, sir, this is the graph. Because this is the graph of inverse relation. Y is inversely proportional to x, y is inversely proportional to x square. Same is the case over here. Kinetic energy is inversely proportional to R. So we say this will be the graph of kinetic energy. Potential energy is inversely proportional to R. Graph will be exactly like this but from the lower side. Why? Because, because this is negative. From upper side we write positive energy. From lower side we write negative energy. So we say this energy is basically negative. So that's why it is from the lower side. Is that clear now? Tell me in the chats. Tell me in the chats, guys. Is it clear to each and everyone? Let me know. Aditya is saying, is this sufficient? Can anybody of you tell him, please? Great, 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 great. Thank you so much for this love that you are actually showing. Huh? It definitely means a lot to us. It definitely means a lot to us. Personally to me. Okay. Okay, 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 okay. So, done with this graph and all, done with this graph and all. We'll take next break at 12 o'clock, huh? That's okay. Next break we'll take at 12 o'clock. <clears throat> now, one more thing I just want to make you understand. Important. This is something important note. Important note. See, what is this important note? As we know, sir, when it comes to the total energy of an electron in nth orbit, we know, sir, this total energy is minus z e square upon 8 pi epsilon naught and r. Now, what is this r? r is the radius. r is the radius between electron and nucleus. We know, sir, as value of r is equal to r naught n square by z r not n square by z okay now if you put the value of r over here put r in total energy put this r in total energy so what will you get total energy is equal we say minus z e square upon we say 8 pi epsilon naught instead of this r can we write sir this will be r naught and then you have n square divided by z. Then you have n square divided by z. R not n square divided by z. Okay. Now, what I want you guys to do is that, take this z in the numerator. So, this will become total energy is equal to, we say minus. See, if you take this in the numerator, z, in, z becomes z, z square. Minus e square upon 
we say this will be z square in the numerator and then you have 8 pi epsilon naught 8 pi epsilon naught and then you have r naught divided by we say sir n square see just the reshuffling i am doing over here now if i want you guys to put put the values values of put the values of e pi epsilon naught r naught you know sir value of e charge on an electron okay and value of pi you know epsilon naught you know r naught you know i have told you each and every single value if you put these values if you put these values and then solo it the total energy would come out to be sir minus 13.6 all of that if you solo it minus 13.6 z square by n square z square by n square very important equation very important equation very important equation now now see one more thing i want you guys to do is that is nothing but see so this is the total energy is there any relation between total energy total energy total energy and kinetic energy sir I'll, I'll i'll show you over here i'll show you over here sir kinetic energy is z e square upon 8 pi epsilon naught r total energy is minus z e square upon 8 pi epsilon naught r can we do one thing sir i can write sir kinetic energy is equal to kinetic energy is equal to z e square upon 8 pi epsilon naught r if i take this negative value over here okay or or what we can do is write it something like this we say sir this total energy is simply minus sir z e square upon 8 pi epsilon naught r z e square upon 8 pi epsilon naught r that is kinetic energy instead of this i'll put kinetic energy yes we can do it so this will be sir minus times of kinetic energy so means total energy is negative of kinetic energy total energy is negative of kinetic energy over here remember this one now same i'll do over here as as we say as total energy is equal to negative of kinetic energy negative of kinetic energy okay now take this sign over here we say sign sir kinetic energy is equal to negative of sir total energy now instead of this total energy can we put the above formula we say sir kinetic energy is equal to minus total energy is how much we say sir minus this is also negative 13.6 we say z square by n square now minus into minus becomes plus so kinetic energy will be simply my will be simply 13.6 z square by n square this is also the formula for this is also the formula for kinetic energy and this is also the formula for kinetic energy and this is also the this is the formula for kinetic energy this is the formula for total energy this is also the form formula for total energy also the formula for kinetic energy one and the same thing different 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 equations i am showing you over here because these equations will help us further okay so i hope when i was teaching you deep matter waves when i was teaching you matter waves let me take you back over there and i'll make you understand one thing i'll make you understand one thing what is that that is yes over here if you remember my dear friends an electron moving in nth orbit of an atom if an electron is moving in nth orbit of an atom how much is its kinetic energy 13.6 divided by n square that we recently got 13.6 divided by n square and more specifically we are talking about the hydrogen atom over here that is hydrogen atom because for hydrogen atom we say z is equal to 1 that is 1 square remove that 13.6 divided by n square now same is what i told you over here same is what i told you over here same is what i told you over here 13.6 z square by n square is that clear is that clear is that clear yes i'll drink some water somebody is advising me to drink some water i'll drink it
<laughs> now let's come over here. Let's come over here. Yes, yes, this is an EV, electron volts. Yes, 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 yes. Now see, I have made an atom over here. This one is the, this one is the nucleus of an atom. This is the nucleus of an atom. And this one, around the nucleus, this first one, first shell, this is what we call the first orbit. This is what we call first orbit. This is what we call first orbit. Okay. And my dear friends, this is also called the ground state. Either you call it the first orbit or you call it the ground state. It's one and the same thing. And what is the value of N for this first orbit? Means electron can revolve in this first orbit. The value of N is 1. Because it's first orbit or you call it the ground state. Then you have the next one. This next one is what we call the second orbit. Or you call it the first excited state. And the value of n is 2 for this second orbit. Then you have this one. Electron can revolve in this shell also. This shell is what we call the third orbit. Or this is called the second excited state. And the value of n is 3 in this particular case. And then you have this shell. This shell is what we call the fourth orbit. Or this is called the third excited state. And the value of n is 4 in this particular case. Value of n is 4 in this particular case. Okay. Now my dear friends, my dear friends, one thing I want you to remember is, if we talk about the ground state, if we talk about the ground state, if we talk about the ground state, sir, for ground state means n is equal to 1 or first orbit slash first orbit. Sir, we say, sir, for first orbit, we say n is equal to 1. For first orbit, we say n is equal to 1. Now, you tell me one thing. If I say an electron is revolving in the first orbit of hydrogen atom, we say, sir, for a hydrogen atom, we have got an hydrogen atom and an electron is revolving in the first orbit of hydrogen atom, we say, sir, for that, for that, we say, sir, when it comes to the hydrogen atom, atomic number of hydrogen atom is 1. Atomic number of hydrogen atom is 1. We say, if an electron is revolving in the first orbit of hydrogen atom, how much is its energy? We say, sir, when it comes to the total energy, you say that is minus 13.6 Z square divided by N square. We recently got it. So, this is the total energy of an Electron revolving in nth orbit. Yes, sir. For especially if we talk about hydrogen atom, Z is equal to 1. So, can we find the energy? We say, sir, total energy will be minus 13.6. Instead of Z, we say, sir, 1 square divided by. Why we write 1 over here? Because we are talking about the hydrogen atom. N. If we are talking about the ground state, means this is also 1 square. So, total energy is equal to minus 13.6 electron volts. So, this is basically the total energy of an electron. This is basically the total energy of an electron. This is the total energy of an electron in the nth orbit. This is the total energy of an electron in the first orbit of hydrogen atom. In the first orbit of hydrogen atom. Okay, let's suppose there's a hydrogen atom over here. Okay, and this is hydrogen atom. So electron is revolving in its first orbit. How much energy does it actually have? 13.6. Now, if I talk about, if I talk about, we say, sir, for a helium, H E, okay, ion. So I can write, sir, Atomic number for helium is, we say, He positive. It is nothing but 2. It is nothing but 2. Okay. Now, if we have to find the total energy in case of, we say total energy of an 
इलेक्ट्रॉन इन द इन द फर्स्ट ऑर्बिट फर्स्ट ऑर्बिट ऑफ हीलियम सो वी से माय डियर फ्रेंड्स वी से माय डियर फ्रेंड्स दैट टोटल एनर्जी विल बी सिंपली माइनस थर्टीन पॉइंट सिक्स डिवाइड जेड स्क्वायर बाय एन स्क्वायर नो इन दिस केस इट विल बी माइनस थर्टीन पॉइंट सिक्स व्हाट इज द वैल्यू ऑफ जेड ओवर हियर दैट इज टू स्क्वायर ओके डिवाइडेड बाय एन इज वन स्क्वायर वाई बिकॉज वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट द फर्स्ट ऑर्बिट सो एन इज इक्वल टू वन so this will be total energy will come out to be minus 54.4 electron volts means if an electron is revolving in the first orbit of helium how much energy does it have 54.4 electron volts now if i talk about for uh li2 positive lithium ion we say sir its atomic number is 3 okay now we have to find the total energy of an electron in the in the we say first orbit first orbit of of li2 positive we say if an electron is revolving if an electron is revolving in the first orbit if an electron is revolving in the first orbit of li2 positive how much is its is its energy we say sir its energy is minus 13.6 third square by n square and this will be my total energy is minus 13.6 what is the value of z over here that is we say sir 3 square divided by n we are talking about the first orbit that is 1 square so this will be total energy is minus 122 0.4 electron volts. Is this clear, guys? Is this clear, guys? Is this clear? Let me know in the live chat. Is this clear to each and everyone? Is this clear to each and everyone? Tell me in the chats, bro. Make sure you hit the like button. Make it seven hundred, guys. Make the like count seven hundred. <laughs> Now see. Now see. Now if I talk about the hydrogen atom, see. Sir, if I talk about hydrogen atom, means for hydrogen atom, Z is equal to one. So I'll make I'll make it over here something like this. <laughs> I'll make it something like this. This is the chart which I'll make over here. Yeah, this much is enough. Now. let's suppose we have an electron which is revolving this is orbits okay and this is energy listen to me very carefully sir what is the formula for total energy that is minus 13.6 z square by n square if an electron is revolving in the nth orbit how much is its energy we say minus 13.6 z square by n square now see if we are talking about the hydrogen atom more specially means you have got let's suppose a hydrogen atom this is the first orbit this is the second orbit this is the third orbit this is the fourth orbit and this one is let's suppose the fifth orbit okay now my dear friends listen to me very carefully if i say an electron is revolving in the first orbit of hydrogen atom means n is equal to 1 first orbit means ground state or or we say we say orbit means first or we say the ground state we say how much it is is its total energy let's calculate it so it will be sir that is total energy in that case will be simply will be simply just a second i'll See, see, see. We say in this particular case, in this particular case, 
we say sir total energy will be minus 13.6 z square what is the value of z in hydrogen that is one square divided by what is the value of n for first first orbit we are checking that is one square so this will be 13.6 only this is the formula keep this in the box okay so this is the energy of an electron in the first orbit of hydrogen now my dear friends if we talk about n is equal to 2 second orbit if an electron is revolving in the second orbit how much is the total energy of an electron in the second orbit of hydrogen atom that is minus 13.6 into n square into z square z is one square divided by we are talking about the second orbit that is n is equal to that is two square so that is 4 13.6 divided by 4 that is 3.4 electron volts and this will be minus 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 3.4 electron and if we talk about the third orbit, if an electron is revolving in the third orbit of hydrogen atom, means n is equal to 3. How much is the total energy in that case? This yes, total energy is minus 13.6. And then you have 1 square divided by, instead of this n, we say, sir, this will be 3 square. So this will be how much? Minus 1.51 electron volts. So you will remember from now onwards, these are, the, these, these are the values you have to remember directly. An electron which is revolving in the first orbit of hydrogen has an energy of this much. In the second orbit, this much energy. In the third orbit, this much energy. And if I say n is equal to 4, we say, sir, this total energy will be simply minus 13.6 into 1 square divided by 4 square. That is minus 0 0.85 electron volts. And it keeps on going, it keeps on going. Keep on dividing over here, divided by 4 square, then 5 square. <clears throat> Is that clear, bro? Is that clear? Is that clear? <clears throat> this was a question which was asked in NEED 2019. Can you guys tell me the answer of this particular question? The question is total energy of an electron in an atom is 3.4 electron volts. Total energy is given as minus 3.4 electron volts. We have to find its kinetic energy. We have to find its potential energy. An electron is revolving in an orbit. Its total energy is 3.4. We have to find its kinetic and pot potential. I just told you one formula if you remember over here. <coughs> we say sir. Total energy is negative of kinetic energy. Okay. Now, now, kinetic energy we can say is negative of total energy. Simply we can put up over here. So we say, sir, kinetic energy is equal to negative of total energy. So kinetic energy we can calculate negative of. What is total energy over here? Minus 3.4 electron volt. So kinetic energy in this case will be minus into minus is plus 3.4 electron volts. Simply, if total energy is this much, kinetic will be positive of this much. Now, you tell me one thing. You tell me one thing. We say, sir, this is how to find potential. We know, sir, total energy is equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy. Now, how much is total energy? That is minus 3.4 electron volt is equal. How much is potential that we need to calculate? Plus, how much is kinetic? That is 3.4 electron volt. If you take this 3.4 electron volt over here, it will become minus 3.4 electron volt. Minus 3.4, minus 3.4 becomes minus. We say, sir, it becomes minus 6.8 electron volt. So we say the answer is, answer is minus 
3.4 and minus 6.8 this option 3 c option c option okay mm, this one yeah in bohr's model of an hydrogen atom the ratio of the time period of revolution of an electron in n is equal to 2 and n is equal to 1 is c c c c c it is saying that we have got a hydrogen atom over here okay and this is the first orbit this is the second orbit and this is the third orbit now in this case it is saying that an electron is revolving in the third orbit and electron is revolving in no an electron is revolving in the second orbit and electron is revolving in the first orbit okay we say sir we say if electron is revolving in the second or second orbit its time period is let's suppose t2 if electron is revolving in the first orbit its time period is let's suppose t1 okay now my dear friends my dear friends we have to find the ratio of t2 divided by t1 okay the ratio of periods of revolution of an electron in second to first if an electron is revolving in the first orbit okay in first orbit how much time it will take to complete one cycle is t1 in second orbit how much time it will take to complete one cycle is t2 so we have to find t1 divided by t2 we have to find t1 divided by t2 okay so we say we say sir as 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 we know sir time period is equal to what is the value of time period that we calculated 1.51 into 10 raised power minus 16 then we say n cube divided by z square then we say n cube divided by z square is this equation correct tell me okay n cube by z square now see now see over here over here we say sir if we talk about t2 let's find sir t2 t2 is the time period of an electron in the second orbit we say sir that t2 will be simply 1.51 into 10 raised power minus 16 n cube n means what is the value of n in the second orbit that is 2 because in this will be multiplied by that is 2 cube divided by z we are talking about the hydrogen atom so hydrogen atom for hydrogen atom z is equal to 1 that is 1 square so this will be simply t2 let's find t1 sir t1 is the time period of an at electron revolving in first orbit that is 1.51 into 10 raised power minus 16 and then you have n cube by z square for this orbit first orbit if electron is revolving in first orbit n is equal to 1 1 square divided by z z is also 1 square now my dear friends we can say t2 divided by t1 will be now this and this we can cancel out over here and this will be t cube is this will be 8 divided by 1 okay upon we say 1 divided by 1 8 is to 1 as simple as that is that clear is that clear guys is that clear is that clear so we say this will be 8 by 1 Okay, we were supposed to find the ratio of the time periods. This is easy question. Let me show you this first. Okay, now consider the third orbit of helium. We have got He positive. Let's suppose this is the nucleus, okay? And this is the first orbit, this is the second orbit, and this is the third orbit. We say, sir, an electron is revolving in the third orbit of helium. An electron is revolving in the third orbit of helium. Means n is equal to 3 over here. For third orbit we say n is equal to 3. For third orbit we say n is equal to 3. 
And if this is the helium, we say, sir, Z is equal to 2. For helium, Z is equal to 2. We have to find the speed of an electron. How much is the speed? We have to find speed of an electron. If an electron is revolving in the third orbit of hydrogen, sorry, helium, we have to find its speed. Now, as we say velocity is equal to V0 Z divided by N. What is the value of V0? 2.2 into 10 raised power 6. V is equal to 2.2 into 10 raised power 6. Z, what is the value of Z? That is 2. What is the value of N? That is 3. Solo it and you will get the answer as this one, I guess. Okay. So we say velocity is 1.46 in 10 raised power 6 meter per second. Let's move on to the next one. This was the question which was asked in JEE mains 2022. J means 2022. J means 2022. Now, in this particular case, the speed for the, the ratio for the speed of the electron in third orbit of He positive. So, the speed of the electron in the third orbit of hydrogen will be. See, what does the question say is over here? What does the question say over here? We say, sir, the ratio for the speed of electron in third orbit of He. Let's suppose, sir, this is He, okay, helium. And we say, sir, this is the first orbit, second orbit. And we say, sir, this is third orbit. And then you have a hydrogen. We say, sir, this is H. So this is the first orbit. This is the second orbit. And this is the third orbit. It is saying that, it is saying that, an electron is revolving in, an electron is revolving in the third orbit of He. And an electron is revolving in the third orbit of this H hydrogen. The atomic number of this is 2, the atomic number of this is 1. We say, sir, over here, an electron is revolving in the third orbit. Over here, an electron is revolving in the third orbit. In this case, it has got the speed, let's suppose, over here v1 in this case it has got the speed let's suppose v2 and we are supposed to find we are supposed to find v1 divided by v2 this is the question this is the question can you guys tell me in the live chat i am i am waiting for everybody come on tell me tell me tell me simply you have to use as Sir, V is equal to V naught Z divided by N. So we say V is equal to V naught. This is the speed V1. This is the speed of an electron in third orbit of helium. V naught Z. For helium, Z is equal to 2. 2 by N. N is equal to 3 over here. Let's find V2. V2 is also V naught Z by N. What is the value of Z over here? That is 1. What is the value of N over here? That is 3. Okay, now tell me V1 divided by V2 will be simply, sir, that is V0 2 by 3. Then upon V0 1 by 3, this and this will get cancelled. So this will be take this in the numerator. 3 into 2 is 6. We say 6 by 3. So V1 divided by V2 is 2 by 1. So answer is 2 is to 1. Answer is 2 is to 1. Yes, 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 yes. Great, 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 great. This question. This is a very good question. This is a good question. I want you guys to solve this particular question over here. Come on. Give it a try. Give it a try. Read it. Are you able to read this? Are you able to read this? Are you able to read this? Yes. Then solo it. Solo it. Come 
come on swallow it guys everybody out there swallow this particular question Now, let me solve this particular question and then we'll take a break. Then we'll take a break. See, what is given in this particular question is that the inner electron in a hydrogen atom jumps from n is equal to 3 to n is equal to 1. We have got, we have got over here a hydrogen atom. Okay. So, we say this is the first orbit, this is the second orbit and this is the third orbit. It is saying that, it is saying that the electron jumps from n is equal to 3 to n is equal to 1. Okay. n is equal to 3 to n is equal to 1. Cool. And, and the photon thus is emitted on a photosensitive material. We have placed, we have placed a metallic plate over here. Photosensitive. Photosensitive. Plate. Metallic plate. Okay. My dear friends, I told you. Let me just show you this question over here. Let me just show you this question over here. We have got, uh, this is a nucleus. This is the first orbit. This is the second orbit. This is the second orbit. And this one is the third orbit. This one is the third orbit. Okay. My dear people, what I'm trying to say in this case is, we have got an electron, okay. This is a hydrogen atom. Electron jumps from n is equal to 3 to n is equal to 1. Tell me one thing. Tell me one thing. Sir, if, if we say electron is revolving in the third orbit, how much is its energy in the third orbit? We say, sir, its energy is minus 1.51 electron volts. Recently, we calculated it. If an electron is revolving in the third orbit of hydrogen, its energy is 1.51 electron volts. And... If an electron is revolving in the first orbit, how much its energy? Minus 13.6 electron volt. Okay. Now, if electron makes the transition from higher to lower, we say photon is released. Photon is released. Photon is released over here. And the energy of that photon, remember, it is always equal to this energy gap. This is always equal to this energy gap. If I say, sir, an electron makes the transition from second orbit to the first orbit, then we say, we say, photon is released. How much is the energy of that photon? This energy gap. Now, how to calculate that energy gap? Listen to me very carefully. We say this energy gap we calculate. What is the energy in this orbit? This orbit. This one third orbit that is we say over here minus 1.51 higher orbit minus lower orbit minus which one is lower that is this one so we say this is minus 13.6 electron okay 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 is this clear till over here let me know in the live chat let me know in the live chat guys if this is clear to each and everyone hmm? so we say if an electron makes the transition from n is equal to 3 to n is equal to 1, a photon is thus released. A photon is thus released. I'll make the photon over here. A photon is thus released. Means energy is released in the form of photon. Okay. okay. So we say this will come out to be 12.1 electron volts. So the energy of photon will be equal to this energy gap that is 12.1. How to find this energy gap? This energy minus this energy, higher minus lower over here. Okay. Now, this photon, when this is released, it falls on a photosensitive metallic plate. It falls on a photosensitive 
फोटो सेंसिटिव मेटालिक प्लेट फोटो सेंसिटिव मेटालिक प्लेट ओके माई डियर पीपल इफ इट फॉल्स ऑन द फोटो सेंसिटिव मेटालिक प्लेट एंड एंड इट इज गिवन दैट इट इज गिवन दैट वर्क फंक्शन ऑफ द मेटालिक प्लेट दिस वर्क फंक्शन ऑफ द मेटालिक प्लेट इज फाइव पॉइंट वन इलेक्ट्रॉन वोल्ट नव द फोटोन विच फॉल्स ऑन दिस मेटालिक प्लेट हैज गॉट दिस एनर्जी and work function is 5.1 electron volts we say sir whenever the photon whenever the photon falls on whenever the photon falls on a metallic surface we say sir electron is ejected we say sir electron is ejected we say here here photoelectric effect takes place takes place we say photoelectric effect takes place in this particular case okay Now, now listen to me very carefully, sir. We have to find if photoelectric effect takes place. We have to find the value of stopping potential. We have to find the value of stopping potential in this case. Now to find V naught. See, this is a very good question, conceptual question. You have got an elect. You have got an atom, hydrogen atom. Electron makes the transition from higher orbit to the lower orbit. Because of this transition, we say energy is released. Energy is released in the form of lunchbox. No, energy is released in the form of photon. That photon falls on a photosensitive metallic plate. Then photoelectric effect will take place. Work function is given. Stopping potential is asked. Now we say how to find. We say sir, energy of photon is equal to work function plus kinetic energy. Kinetic energy. Now you tell me one thing, sir. when it comes to the energy of photon that is 12.1 electron volt is equal work function is 5.1 electron volt plus kinetic energy is ev not because i told you this formula of kinetic energy also ev not so we say this is 12.1 electron volt minus 5.1 electron volt is equal to ev not so this will be how much that is 7 electron volt is equal ev not this and this will cancel so v not will come out to be 7 volt is the stopping potential in this case 7 volt is the stopping potential in this case is that clear is that clear guys let me know in the live chat is that clear okay okay now comes the next chapter but before the next chapter we need to give the break break we said 20 minutes or just just we say what is the time break till Break till we say twelve twenty-five a.m. Two chapters, two chapters done and dusted. Okay, according to the new syllabus, two chapters done and dusted. Okay, we'll be back at twelve twenty-five a.m. Guys. now this will not take us much time okay so don't sleep
Okay, guys. <clears throat> Let's start the nuclei chapter. Okay. Third chapter. Okay. We are done with the two chapters. So, my dear friends, in this particular chapter, we have to learn about, we have to learn about the nuclei or the nucleus. We have to learn about the nucleus over here. Okay. Now see. <clears throat> now see. Now see. It will take now further one and a half or two hours and we'll get done with this. Now see. This chapter nuclei. What do we have to study in this nucleus? See. Previously, we talked about, sir, atom. We have, when it comes to an atom, we have a nucleus and, and we have the electrons which are revolving around the nucleus. So, this is what we studied previously in case of atoms chapter. But when it comes to the nucleus, here, we study about the nucleus of an atom only. Here, we study about, here, we study about the nucleus of an here we study about the nucleus of an atom okay what is inside the nucleus and many other concepts over here many other concepts over here now see if we are talking about the nucleus in this particular case if we are talking about the nucleus in this particular case listen to me very carefully sir we know, sir, when it comes to the nucleus, when it comes to the nucleus, nucleus is present at the center of an atom. Nucleus is present at the center of an atom. If I say this is a nucleus, what is present inside the nucleus? We say, sir, inside the nucleus, you have protons plus you have neutrons. Remember from now onwards, the Particles which are present inside the nucleus are protons and neutrons. So I'll write over here the particles, the particles which are present, which are present inside the nucleus are called nucleons the particles which are present inside the nucleus are called basically nucleons those are called nucleons okay okay now what are these particles we say inside the nucleus we have protons and neutrons inside the nucleus protons and neutrons are present. Protons and neutron, neutrons are present. Inside the nucleus we say protons and neutrons are present. Okay. 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 Yes. sir. And, and most importantly these protons and neutrons are not the fundamental particles. Okay. They are made up of we say quarks. They are made up of quarks. Okay. So we say sir. In this particular chapter, we'll have to deal with the nucleus. What is present inside the nucleus? What is present inside the nucleus? Okay. So we say inside the nucleus, we have protons and we have neutrons. Sir, when it comes to the protons, when it comes to the protons, we say protons have got positive charge. And we say, sir, neutrons, neutrons are basically neutral. Okay, neutrons are basically neutral. 
ओके कूल नाउ माय डियर फ्रेंड्स वन मोर थिंग आई जस्ट वांट टू टेल यू दैट व्हेन इट कम्स टू द रेडियस ऑफ एन एटम आई होप यू रिमेंबर दिस दिस इज इक्वल टू दैट इज 10 रेज पावर माइनस टेन मीटर्स ओके एंड व्हेन इट कम्स टू बेसिकली रेडियस ऑफ रेडियस ऑफ एन वी से वी से न्यूक्लियस इट इज टेन रेज पावर माइनस फिफ्टीन मीटर्स ओके ना Let's come on to the representation of the nucleus. How do we actually represent this nucleus? How do we actually represent this nucleus? Listen to me very carefully. Let's suppose I have got a nucleus of any atom. I have got a nucleus of any atom, and the name of that atom is let's suppose whatever it is, whatever it is. Okay. Now, how do we actually represent this nucleus? Listen to me very carefully. Let's suppose we say this nucleus is X. So we represented something like this. We have got X nucleus, and if I say, and if I say inside this nucleus, inside this nucleus, there are protons and neutrons. We say I'll write over here A, and I'll write over here Z. This is how do we actually represent the nucleus of an atom? What does A mean? A means we say, sir, mass number, mass number. What does mass number mean? It means number of nucleons. Okay, and we say, sir, Z means atomic number. Z means atomic number. What does atomic number mean? That means number of protons. Number of protons. My dear friends, what I'm trying to say in this case is that if we have a nucleus, let's suppose X, how do we represent it? We say we take this x over here. We write a over here. We write z. A means number of nucleons, total number of nucleons. Z means z means we say number of protons, number of protons. That is atomic number. Let's suppose if I say I have got a nucleus over here, and inside this nucleus we have proton, 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 and you have neutron, 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 and neutron. Can you tell me? Sir, in this case, what is the value of A over here? A means number of nucleons. Total number of nucleons are how many? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So I write over here 10. Instead of A, I am writing 10. Total number of nucleons. And when it comes to Z, what is the value of Z over here? Z is the number of protons. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we write over here, this is 5. This is how we actually represent this nucleus over here. Okay. Now, if I ask you to tell me in this case, sir, in this case, you have to tell me the number of neutrons. We say, sir, number of neutrons. How do we find number of neutrons? Number of neutrons will be simply, sir, A minus Z, A minus Z. Have, see, if you have total number of nucleons, we say, sir, 10. And protons are 5. So you say, sir, in this case, A minus Z will be, that is 10 minus 5, which is equal 5. Means number of neutrons in this case is also 5. Number of neutrons in this case is also 5. Okay. So from now onwards, if I say, sir, X added at the top of it, we represent uh, mass number. You have this atomic number. Okay. Now, my dear friends, let's come on to this one. We have particle that's what we call the neutrino that's what we call the neutrino what is this neutrino it is that particle which is neutral it is a neutral particle it is a neutral particle neutrino means neutral particle what does neutral particle mean which has net charge zero net charge if on any particle is zero we, we say it is neutrino okay it has one more speciality what is that? Its mass is much, much less than mass of electron. We say almost, almost, we say massless. We say almost massless. Ma its mass is almost, it is massless because mass of electron is very, very small. Okay, 9.1 into 10 raised power minus 31 kgs. Okay, so we say, we say, its mass is much, much less than the mass of electron also. So that's why we call it the neutral particle. Okay, net charge on this is zero. 
Now, my dear friends, we have, we have the beta particle. What does beta particle mean? We say it is, it is a beam of electron. It's an electron beam. So many electrons are actually falling on something. We say that is the beta particle. Now, now we have alpha particle. When it comes to sir alpha particle, it is made up of, we say two protons. It is made up of two neutrons. When two protons and two neutrons combine, they form the alpha particle. They form the alpha particle. Now, if I ask you to tell me net charge in this case, you say, sir, net charge is nothing but we say 2E. Why? See, one proton has charge plus E. Two protons will be having the charge plus 2E. And neutron has charge 0. So, we say, sir, 2E will be charged. And when it comes to, sir, mass, mass will be 4 times mass of proton. Or 4 times mass of neutron. 4M. 4M you just write directly. Okay? <clears throat> because, because we say one proton has mass m, two protons have mass 2m. So, two protons plus two neutrons has mass 4m. So, mass will be 4m. And then we have positron. What is a positron? We say it is antiparticle. Antiparticle of electron. Antiparticle of electron. If you have an electron, opposite of electron will be basically the positron charge see i told you it is the opposite of electron if charge on an electron is negative we can clearly say charge on this will be plus e positive but mass of this is mass is same as electron okay it is not a proton it is a positron its charge is plus e but its mass is same as the mass of electron these are the different particles that we have to learn over here because sometimes the questions have been asked from this one also, from this one also, okay? Now, my dear friends, now, my dear friends, let's come over here. Now, we have the quarks. What are these quarks? We say, sir, protons and neutrons, protons and neutrons are made up of, are made up of quarks. So we say protons and neutrons are actually made up of the quarks. Okay. Protons and neutrons are made up of quarks. Now, my dear friends, my dear friends, there are six types of quarks. Six types of quarks. If you take the proton and neutron, which are present inside the nucleus, those protons and neutrons are made up of these quarks only. Now, there are total six types of quarks. The first one is we say up quark. Its opposite is down quark. Then you have the top quark. Its opposite is bottom quark. Then you have the beauty quark. Its opposite is charm quark. Now, if we talk about, if we talk about, if we talk about the charge on this up quark, that is plus 2 by 3e. Charge on a proton is plus E, but charge on this is plus 2 by 3E. And charge on the down quark is minus 1 by 3E. And if you take a look over here, charge on this quark is plus 2 by 3E. And charge on this bottom quark is minus 1 by 3E. Okay? And charge on the beauty quark is plus 2 by 3E. And charge on this charm quark is minus 1 by 3e minus 1 by 3e minus 1 by 3e okay let me just show you over here one example of the quarks we say sir when it comes to the proton when it comes to the proton this proton this proton is made up of this proton is made up of we say sir we say sir we say sir u u d this proton is made up of Two up quarks and one down quark. Two up quarks plus one down quark forms the proton. Okay. And we know, sir, when it comes to the net charge on a proton, it is plus E. Let's see. If we add the charge of this plus charge of this plus charge of this, let's see if this comes out to be, if this comes out to be, if this comes out to be, we say the charge on a proton. 
let me just find over here net charge is equal to what is the charge on up cork charge on up cork is plus 2 by 3 e so we say we say in this case we say this will be 2 by 3 e plus charge on another up cork is 2 by 3 e then minus 1 by 3 e 1 by 3 e okay now if you tell me one thing 2 plus 2 is 4 4 minus 1 is 3 so this will become 3 divided by 3 e okay so you guys tell me one thing what is that that will be simply e so that's what i was saying charge on a proton is simply e charge on a proton is simply e okay and if we talk about if we talk about neutron sir neutron is made up of neutron is made up of we say sir d d u two down corks and one up cork if somebody will tell you from now onwards, tell me how many quarks actually form the proton and neutron. You say, sir, two up quarks and one down quark form the proton and two down quarks and one up quark form the neutron in that case. Okay. And over here also you can find, we know, sir, when it comes to the neutron, how much is the net charge on neutron? That is zero. Let's see. If we add the charge of these three, if that comes out to be equal to zero or not, what is the charge on down cork that is minus one by three e plus? Then you have again charge on down cork that is minus one by three e, then plus charge on up cork is two by three e. This is two minus two by three e, this is minus two by three e plus two by three e. So this will be zero charge on down cork is cha cha charge on this is basically zero net charge on this one is it clear guys you got the idea what do we have to study in this nuclei chapter over here we have to study about the nucleus okay that's it that's it is this clear let me know in the live chat give me the signal guys everybody give me the signal if this is crystal and clear to each and everyone this was the question which was asked in NEET 2019. Alpha particle consists of two protons only, two protons and two neutrons only, two electrons, two protons, two neutrons, two electrons and a proton only. Tell me, which option is correct over here? Which option is correct over here? <coughs> which option is correct over here? option b this was the question i told you when it comes to the alpha particle we say when two protons and two neutrons will combine they form the alpha particle yes great great now some important points that you need to understand that you need to keep in your mind okay you have to remember this first and the foremost thing is when it comes to the proton we know sir proton is present inside the nucleus and proton has a mass also sir when it comes to the mass of proton the mass of proton is 1.67 into 10 raised power minus 27 kgs and if we check this in amu atomic mass unit that is 1 amu 1.007 amu okay sir what is amu i say sir if you have got 1 kg we say, sir, 1 kg is equal to 1000 grams. So, grams is also unit, kg is also unit. Similarly, over here, kg is also unit, amu is also unit. Now, the mass of these protons, neutrons is very small. That's why we usually calculate this in amu, not in kgs. So, if I say how much is the mass of a proton, 1.67 into 10 raised power minus 27 and in amu this much and then if i talk about mass of neutron mass of neutron is also equal to the mass of proton and it is slightly slightly greater than the mass of proton mass of neutron is slightly very my we take it approximately equal okay then you have the mass of electron when it comes to the mass of electron we say it is 9.1 into 10 raised power minus 31 kg 
and in AMU it is 0 0.0054 AMU. Okay. And then you have, my dear friends, when it comes to AMU, remember this conversion. Sir, 1 AMU is equal to 1.6 into 10 raised power minus 27 kgs. Or you can also say this is 1 by 12th of mass of carbon atom. Let's suppose if you are taking carbon atom over here. How much is the mass of this carbon atom? Let's suppose M. It's 12th. Mass 12th of 1 by 12th of mass of its carbon atom is equal to 1 AMU or is equal to 1.6. Sir, what does this mean? 1 AMU, how much is this 1 AMU mass? You say, sir, it is 1.66 into 10 raised power minus 27 kgs. Or you can also take a carbon atom and measure its mass, find its mass. Take the 12th portion of that mass, that will be equal to 1 AMU. 1 AMU is also equal to 1 by 12th of the mass of carbon atom. <clears throat> is this clear? Is this clear? Is this clear? Tell me guys, am I going fast or the speed is okay? Am I going fast or the speed is okay? Rest mass energy. Let's come over here. Let's discuss this particular topic. <clears throat> Let's discuss this particular topic. See, when it comes to the rest mass energy, listen to me very carefully. If I say I have, I have an object over here. I have an object over here which ma whose mass is m and it is moving with a velocity v. Listen to me very carefully. We say, sir, if this mass is in motion, we say due to its motion, due to its motion, it has, it has kinetic energy. Kinetic energy. And that kinetic energy is equal to 1 by 2 mv square. You guys know it. When anything comes in motion, due to that motion, it gains the energy or energy is in that mass. That is what we call the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is due to the motion of a body. Now, let's suppose I say I have an object. Let's suppose I say I have an object of mass m, which is placed at height h. You say, sir, due to its height, due to its height, it has potential energy and that potential energy is equal to mgh sir if you take some object at height h because of that height it will gain a kind of energy that's what we call the potential energy yes sir now my dear friends let's suppose i have an object over here and we say the mass of an object is m the mass of an object is m we say, I have an object over here. The mass of an object is M. The mass of an object is M. Okay. Now, my dear friends, listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. We say, sir, due to its mass, due to its mass, we say, sir, due to, due to the mass of an object, Due to the mass of an object, energy is stored in it. Due to the mass of an object, energy is stored in it, which is called, which is called a rest mass energy, which is called a rest mass energy. Okay. So we say, Sir, does this bottle have some mass? Yes. Due to its mass, does it have energy stored in it? We say yes. That energy is what we call the rest mass energy. And how do we actually calculate that? That is E is equal to mc square. This is the rest mass energy formula. This is the rest mass energy formula. 
This is the rest mass energy formula. E is equal to mc square. Now, my dear friends, if I say, if, if I say, if I say mass of an object is, let's suppose, if I say mass of an object is, let's suppose, 10 kgs, okay? Can you tell me how much is the energy associated or stored in 10 kg mass? Sir, it is very simple. E is equal to mc square. m is 10 into c is speed of light. That is 3 into 10 raised power 8, it's square. Okay. So this will be simply 10 into 3 square is 9 into 10 raised power, we say 16. So further we say, we say, sir, this energy is equal to, this energy is equal to. We say, sir, 9 into 10 is 90. So this will be 90 into 10 raised power 16 joules. This is so huge energy. It can, it can burn, burn the whole world. This energy is so huge, it can burn the entire world. It can burn the entire world. This is the amount of energy stored in just 10 kg mass. This energy is so huge that it can burn the entire world. Do you know when that incident happened, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, over there, how many grams of mass was converted into energy and because of that energy two complete cities were destroyed it was only two grams of mass two grams of mass was converted into the energy two grams of mass was converted into the energy and whole two cities were dis destroyed because of those two grams just two grams two grams is nothing and see this is the energy stored in, we say, 10 kg mass. This is the energy stored in 10 kg mass. Now, if you see, if you have got 60 kg mass, 70 kg mass, how much is the energy stored in you? You see the beauty of this universe. Are you guys able to understand? Yes, yes, yes. You are very dangerous, huh? How much energy do you have? Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool, cool, cool. Now, now, we have a question which was actually asked on the same concept. This was asked in 20, this was asked in 2020. This was asked in 2020. Now, see, listen to me very carefully. The energy equivalent to 0 0.5 grams of a substance is how much energy is associated with 0 0.5 grams? How much energy is stored in 0 0.5 grams? Tell me in the chats. Okay, we say, sir, energy E is equal to mc square. We say, sir, this E is equal to what is this is 0 0.5 into 3 into 10 raised power 8 it's square. Okay, if you have to find the energy in some mass, then, then we say E is equal to mc square. Now over here, this E is equal to 0 0.5. This is grams, okay? So we can convert it and we can write this is 5 into 10 raised power minus 4, okay? And then you have into 3 into, and this will be 3 square. 3 square is 9. Into, we say, sir, 9 into 10 raised power 16 because 8 square, it is 16. Okay, if you convert this into kgs and this will be 5 and 10 raised power minus 4, 
into 9 into 10 raised power 16. So this will be 5, 9 is 45. Okay, into 10, 16 minus 4 is 12. 10 raised power, we say sir, 12 joules. Okay, or you can say 4.5 into 10 raised power 13 joules. Is that clear? Is that clear? Great, 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 great. Now, the energy equivalent of one atomic mass unit. Now, see, in this question, it is saying that if we have mass, mass equals to 1 amu, we have to find the, to find, to find energy, energy in it. We have to find the energy associated with it. Guys, I just want to tell you, if you have to find the energy in a mass, which formula you use? E is equal to mc square. E is equal to mc square. Now over here, we say energy is equal to m. m is what? amu into c square. amu into c square. Now, can you tell me what is the value of amu in kgs? What is the value of amu in kgs? The value of AMU in kgs is 1.6 into 10 raised power minus 27 kgs. So I'll just put up this over here. We say, sir, energy will be simply instead of 1 AMU, 1.66 into 10 raised power minus minus 27 minus 27 into, into we say, sir, C square. C square is 3 into 10 raised power 8. It's whole square. Okay, now my dear people, what I'm trying to say in this case is, what I'm trying to say in this case is, we say, sir, this energy will be simply, this energy will be simply, this energy will be simply. See, this energy will be simply, listen to me very carefully. Once you solo this, this will come out to be 931.5 mega electron volt. This will come out to be 931.5 mega electron volt. This will come out to be 931.5 mega electron volt. This will come out to be 931.5 mega electron. See, what I was calculating in this case is that you have got 1 AMU. How much energy is stored in 1 AMU? We are just using the formula E is equal to mc square. Instead of M, I am putting 1 AMU. And what is the value of 1 AMU in kgs? That is 1.66 into 10 raised to the power minus 27. On solving this, you get 931.5. Now, from this equation, from this is first and let's suppose second. If I say from first and second, see, from first, you got the second step. Then you got the third step. So if we take the first step and second step from first and second step, so we can see over here, listen to me, first and this step. So we can say in this particular case, we can say in this particular case, sir, 1 AMU into C square is equal to 931.5 MeV, 931.5 MeV. Listen to me very carefully. 1 AMU into C square is equal to 931.5 AMU. So 1 AMU I can calculate from over here. Sir, 1 AMU will be simply take it and do it, put it over here, 931.5. Then you have MeV divided by C square. So 1 AMU is simply 931.5 divided by C square. Keep this thing exactly in your mind because this will help us. This will help us. In, in further questions, okay? Is that clear? Is that clear? Okay. Okay, okay, this is the 1 AMU in terms of MeV. Now, 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 let's come on to the nuclear size. 
What does nuclear size actually mean? What does nuclear size actually mean? We say it simply represents the size of nucleus. It simply represents the size of nucleus. Nuclear size means size of nucleus, size of nucleus, okay? Now we have to find the expression, we have to find the expression for the size of nucleus, okay? Let's suppose, let's suppose I have got over here, these are the nucleons, these are the nucleons, okay, six. And I have got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14, 15, 16. You tell me one thing. If I have to make a nucleus for these, I can make the nucleus this big. And if I have to make a nucleus for these, I have, make, I have to make nucleus this big. Now, in this case, we say, sir, mass number. Number of nucleons are 6. So, we say A is equal to 6. And in this case, we say, sir, mass number is 15 because number of nucleons are 15. Clearly you can see, sir, this is the nucleus, this is the nucleus. If number of nucleons are less, we say, sir, size of nucleus will be small. If number of nucleons are more, we say, sir, size of nucleus will be more. So we say, as it has verified, it has been experimentally verified, has been verified, we say, Size of nucleus, size of nucleus is proportional to, it has been experimentally verified, size of nucleus, size of nucleus is proportional to mass number, mass number, okay? Size of nucleus is proportional to mass number. More is the mass number, more bigger nucleus there will be. So we say over here in this particular case, listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. That is nothing but what is size of nucleus? Size means volume of nucleus. Size means volume. Volume of nucleus is proportional to, we say, sir, mass number. Okay? Because size means, or, or, after all, volume only. Volume is more, size is more. So we say, sir, what is the volume of this particular nucleus over here? Sir, volume, this is a sapphire, Sef the, the nucleus is spherical in shape. So this will be 4 by 3 pi r cube, where r is the radius of nucleus, is proportional to mass number a. Now 4 by 3 pi is constant, so we say r cube is proportional to a. And over here we say r is proportional to a raised power 1 by 3. r is proportional to a raised power 1 by 3. Okay. And from this you can also say R is equal to R naught A raised power 1 by 3. Replacing this proportionality with a constant. Replacing this proportionality with a constant. We say R is equal to R naught A raised power 1 by 3. R is equal to R naught A raised power 1 by 3. Okay. And this R naught is 1.2 Fermi meter. Something somewhere around that only. Is it clear, my dear friends, where R is the radius of nucleus? Where R is the radius of nucleus? Okay. Great. Now, what if I ask you to plot the graph between? What if I ask you to plot the graph between? I ask you to plot the graph between, I ask you to plot the graph between, we say R radius and we say mass number, mass number. So on this one, I'll plot, I'll put a radius and over here I'll put mass number, okay. And then on this one, we'll, you'll have to make two graphs, we put radius, radius and you put a raised power 1 by 3, mass number raised power 1 by 3. Can you make the graphs in this case? Can you make the graphs in this case?
Yes, nuclear density is same for all the nuclei. 10 raised power minus, 10 raised power 17 kg per meter cube. <clears throat> we'll teach that after this topic, nuclear density. So can you make the graphs over here? Can you make the graphs in this particular case? You have to plot the graph between radius versus mass number as the relation is R is equal to, we say R is proportional to A raised power 1 by 3. This is the relation A raised power 1 by 3. A raised power 1 by 3. Okay. See, when it comes to this, sir, when you have to make the graph between R and A, what is the power of R? That is 1. What is the power of A? That is 1 by 3. So the graph is something like this. Graph is something like this. This will be the graph. Because power of A is 1 by 3 over here. Okay. But in this case, graph between R and A raised power 1 by 3. See, over here, what is the power of 1? R, that is 1. And what is the power of A raised power 1 by 3? That is also 1. In this case, you are making the graph between R and A. But over here, you are making the graph between R and A raised power 1 by 3. Whatever the quantity you are putting up over here, that quantity has power 1. So this graph would be the straight line. This graph would be the straight line. I hope you got it. I hope you got it. I hope you got it. Over here, the power of this is, in reality, the power of this is, of A is 1 by 3. But over here, if you are putting the 1 by 3 only, then the power of this will be simply 1. Okay. Now comes the next topic that is nuclear density. Sir, what does nuclear density actually mean? It means the density of the nucleus. It means the density of the nucleus. Okay. Now see. When it comes to sir density, rho, density means mass divided by volume. Since we are talking about the nucleus here, so we will say that mass of nucleus, okay, divided by we say volume of nucleus, volume of nucleus. When it comes to the density, we say it is mass of nucleus divided by density of nucleus. Mass of nucleus divided by density of nucleus. Mass of nucleus divided by density of nucleus. Now my dear friends, listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. If I just tell you, if I just tell you, I have a nucleus over here. I have a nucleus over here. Inside this nucleus, you have got four nucleons. Can you tell me how much is the mass of this nucleus? You say, sir, mass of this nucleus is four times mass of proton mass of one nucleon is m four nucleons have four m mass now my dear friends if i say in general i have got a nucleus over here okay in this nucleus you have in this nucleus we say we say a is the mass number a is the mass number a is the mass number Sir, what does mass number mean? Mass number means the number of nucleons. Okay. So, can you tell me the mass of this nucleus? Mass of nucleus. Sir, A can be anything. 5, 10, 15. So, we say in this case, sir, if A is equal to A is over here 4. So, we say mass of this nucleus is 4M. Now, over here, can we say this mass of nu? this will be simply, this will be simply, that is 4 times mass of proton, yes sir. Because one proton, one proton has got mass mp. Four protons have got, got 4 mp mass. Yes. So we say in this case, we say in this case, it has got mass 4 mp. Okay. And now you tell me volume of nucleus, sir, volume of nucleus when it comes to the volume of nucleus sir we say volume is proportional to volume is proportional to mass number why because in the previous slide i told you 
if if mass number is more we say size or volume of nucleus is more size or volume of nucleus is more okay now you guys tell me you guys tell me in this particular case you guys tell me in this particular case that is nothing but can i say sir this volume is equal to v naught into a why sir because replacing this proportionality with a constant v naught let's say this is the equation number one let's say this is the equation number two now put it in equation this is two and this is three this is the equation first we say put put m and v in first equation so we say density will come out to be sir mass of nucleus is how much that is that is that is that is i have to write over here this is a a into mp because if you have a number of nucleons so mass will be a into mp that is a into mp divided by volume of nucleus that is how much v naught into a this and this will cancel and after putting the values this will come out to be 10 raised power 17 kg per meter cube and is constant for for all nuclei and is constant for all nuclei sir how mp sir 4 is the mass number so even neutrons are involved yes that's why i told you previously that's why i told you previously if let's suppose we have this nucleus we say this is proton proton neutron neutron how many number of nucleons are present over here four we assume that mass of proton is equal to the mass of neutron so that's why i said four times mass of proton or you say four times mass of neutron it is one and the same thing it is one and the same thing is that okay now zifan <laughs> okay we have got this question over here the volume occupied by an atom is greater than volume occupied is greater than the volume of the nucleus by a factor of about by a factor of about by a factor of about see in this case you guys are supposed to tell me you guys are supposed to tell me the volume occupied by an atom is equal to the volume occupied by a nucleus see you guys are supposed to tell me in this particular case in this particular case what is the volume of an atom divided by volume of nucleus this is the ratio which we have to find the volume occupied by an atom is how many times greater than the volume occupied by nucleus we know sir when it comes to the nucleus this much is nucleus and whole is atom we know obviously atom is bigger than the nucleus how many times it is bigger than the nucleus how many times volume is large that we need to understand so this is equal to when it comes to the volume of atom we say sir 4 by 3 pi r a cube a means atom upon because volume of atom is what 4 by 3 pi r cube because this is a sphere and when it comes to the volume of nucleus, this is also 4 by 3 pi r n cube, radius of nucleus cube. Okay. Now, my dear friends, I can write over here. This I can cancel with this one, 4 by 3 pi, 4 by 3 pi. Now, in this case, this is radius of atom divided by radius of nucleus. It's whole cube. Now, how much is the radius of atom? You say, sir, 10 raised power minus 10 meters upon this is 10 raised power minus 15 and this is whole cube so after solving this this will be 10 raised power plus 15 it will go up so it will be 10 raised power 5 whole cube that is 10 raised power 5 into 3 is 15 
ओके सो टेन रेज पावर फिफ्टीन टाइम्स इज दैट कूल इज दैट कूल द न्यूक्लाय हैज द मास नंबर इन द रैशो ऑफ टू न्यूक्लाय हैज द मास नंबर इन द रैशो ऑफ वन इज टू थ्री द रैशो ऑफ देयर न्यूक्लियर डेंसिटीज वन इज टू वन बिकॉज न्यूक्लियर डेंसिटी इज कॉन्स्टेंट दिस इज अ गुड क्वेश्चन एक्चुअली कैन यू सॉलो दिस पर्टिकुलर क्वेश्चन can you solve this particular question tell me tell me in the chats if you can solve this particular question can you solve this particular question and like this session if you have not liked this session yet Now see, a nucleus ruptures into two nuclear parts. We are given a nucleus. We are given a nucleus. It ruptures into two nuclear parts. It ruptures into two nuclear parts. What does that mean, sir? That means if you have got this nucleus over here, okay, this is a nucleus. So it it basically explodes. Ruptures means it explodes into two equal parts. it explodes into two equal parts let's suppose this is m1 mass and let's suppose this is m2 mass a nuclear explodes like a bomb into two nuclear parts okay and this goes with a velocity v2 and this goes with a velocity v1 this goes with a velocity v1 okay and the ratio of their velocities v1 divided by v2 is given as 2 by 1 is given as 2 by 1 okay then what is the ratio of their nuclear size we have to find r 1 divided by r 2 radius of first divided by radius of second we are given a nucleus it explodes into two different parts m1 m2 m1 has got velocity v1 m2 has got velocity v2 the questioner asks that what is the ratio of their radius what is the ratio of their nuclear size see my dear friends we know sir in case of these explosions momentum is always conserved we say sir in case of explosion we say p is conserved momentum is conserved so we say finally momentum of this one is equal to the momentum of this one so that is that is sir this one momentum is how much momentum is equal to p is equal to mv so we say sir that is m1 v1 momentum of this part is equal to momentum of this part remember this guys when bomb explodes momentum remains conserved or constant in that case that's why we say momentum of this one is equal to the momentum of this one now over here you say sir m1 divided by m2 okay it is equal to v2 divided by v1 now v1 by v2 is given 2 by 1 so v2 by v1 will be 1 by 2 it will be 1 by 2 okay so we got the mass m1 divided by m2 is equal to 1 by 2 so the ratio of their masses is 1 by 2 but we have to find the ratio of their radius we have to find the ratio of their radius now you tell me one thing sir as we know as we know density is equal to mass divided by volume so mass you can calculate from over here that is that you can calculate from over here that is density into volume now in this equation can you write this is first we say sir from from first equation so i'll write over here instead of this m1 instead of this m1 can i write density into volume of one yes sir so we say instead of m1 i'll write rho 
इंटू वॉल्यूम ऑफ वन डिवाइडेड बाई रो इंटू वॉल्यूम ऑफ टू यस इज इक्वल टू वन डिवाइडेड बाई टू दिस एंड दिस यू कैन कैंसल वॉल्यूम वॉल्यूम इज इक्वल टू फोर बाई थ्री पाई वी से सर आर वन क्यूब आर वन इज द रेडियस ऑफ फर्स्ट पार्ट डिवाइडेड बाई फोर बाय थ्री पाई आर टू क्यूब दिस इज द रेडियस ऑफ सेकेंड पार्ट इज इक्वल टू वन डिवाइडेड बाई टू नाउ दिस एंड दिस यू कैन कैंसल ओवर ह्योर आर वन डिवाइडेड बाई आर टू विल बी वन बाई टू होल रेज पावर एंड दिस 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 इज ओवर ह्योर दिस इज क्यूब दिस इज क्यूब नाउ दिस आर वन डिवाइडेड बाई आर टू विल बी वन अपॉन टू रेज पावर वन बाय थ्री so this is the ratio in the is that clear is that clear is that clear my dear friends r1 by r2 we, we were supposed to is that clear let me know in the live chat if this is clear to each and every one Which one? Which one? This one. Now, now let's come on to this one. It is mentioned over here. Radius of two H E four nucleus is three Fermi meter. The radius of sixteen S thirty two nucleus will be. The radius of sixteen S thirty two nucleus will be. Radius of sixteen S thirty. See, see what is given. We have got a nucleus over here, and we have got a nucleus over here. Okay, and this nucleus is which one? This is two H E four. Okay. helium nucleus and then you have got 16s32 this is another nucleus okay and it is saying that radius of this he is given as the radius of this nucleus is given as 3 fermi meter okay you guys are supposed to tell me radius of this this s how much this is okay now guys in this particular case we know one thing sir radius is proportional to a raised power 1 divided by 3 a raised power 1 by 3 or radius r is equal to r not 1 by 3 now my dear friends can i say in this particular case sir if i say radius of he is equal to we say a raised power 1 by 3 yes sir because the radius is proportional to mass number raised power 1 by 3 and what is the mass number over here mass number is 4 this is mass number this is atomic number and in this case mass number is sir 32 so we say in this case radius of s is we say sir that is a raised power 1 by 3 now divide this and this so we say r of he or we say sir r of this s Divided by R of this H E is equal to, sir, a raised power a upon a whole raised power one by three. This is mass number of H E and this is mass number mass number of S. This is mass number of H E. So further you can write it something like this: radius of this S upon radius of H E. What is the value of radius of H E? That is three. Three is equal to. Mass number of S that is thirty two. We say sir thirty two upon mass number of He that is four. That is four. Whole raised power one by three. Four ones are four eights are cube root of eight that will be two. Now three into two will be how much? That is R of S E is six Fermi meter. Simple question.
Is that clear, guys? Is that clear, guys? Six Fermi meter. Simply, radius of radius of this divided by radius of this, you will get the value of radius of this. Okay. This is the question on the same pattern. I want you guys to solve this particular question for me. Come on, solve it. What is the answer in this case? Tell me, tell me. Tell me in the chats, what is the answer in this case? Okay. Option A, I'll write 3.6. Option B, 4.8. Option C, 6. Option D, none. Which option is clear? Fermi meter. AL27 is given. CU64 is given. You have got two nuclei. AL60, AL, AL27, CU64, CU64. Tell me in the chats. <laughs> yes, four point eight is the option, correct option. Great, great. Four point eight per meter. Huh? Now comes the concept that's what we call the binding energy. That's what we call the binding energy. <clears throat> now comes the concept that's what we call the binding energy. <clears throat> See, what does this binding energy actually mean? What does this binding energy actually mean? Listen to me very carefully. <clears throat> Let's suppose I have got a balloon over here. I have got a balloon over here. Okay. And inside this balloon, inside this balloon, I have got one mass, another mass, another mass, another mass. This mass is 5 kgs. This mass is 5 kgs. This mass is 5 kgs. Okay. And this mass is 5 kgs. 5 kg, 5 kg, 5 kg, 5 kg. Okay. Now I am asking you what is the collective mass inside this balloon? We say collective mass. Collective mass or net mass inside this balloon. You say, sir, that is 20 kg. Okay. Now what I'm doing in this case is that, what I'm doing in this case is that I want to break this particular balloon. I want to break this particular balloon. Okay. Why do I have to break it? Because I wanted to basically take these masses out. I have to take these masses out. So, in breaking the balloon, I have to use energy. I have to use energy. Okay? So, I have to use energy in order to break the balloon. Now, then I took the mass out. This mass, this mass, this mass and this mass. So while I took the mass out, I calculated individually the mass of all the four. It came out to be, listen to me very carefully. The mass of this came out to be 5.5 kg. Mass of this came out to be 5.5 kg. Mass of this came out to be 5.5 kg. Mass of this came out to be 5.5 kg. Can you tell me how much is the net mass, net mass finally? How much is the net mass finally? Can you tell me in the live chat? Can you tell me in the live chat? <coughs> yes. <coughs> we say simply when it comes to the net mass, when it comes to the net mass over here, sir, we say in this case net mass came out to be that is 22 kgs over here. We said 22 kgs over here, let's suppose, okay, by adding them. 
See, initially, we say inside the balloon, the mass was 20. Sir, finally, the mass is 22. Can I say in this case, here, here, mass defect, mass defect occurred. Sir, what does mass defect mean? This is the mass defect. It should have been 20 kg here only, but we are getting 22. And that mass defect we are representing with delta M. And, and we say, sir, this delta M, how do we calculate it? Final mass minus initial mass minus initial mass. And this comes out to be 2 kgs over here. So means 2 kgs is basically the mass defect in this case. Okay. This is the simple example I am showing you, but this is not the correct example, appropriate. I will tell you that also. Okay. So we say this mass defect occurred. My question to you is why does this mass defect actually occurred? This mass defect occurred because the energy we used over here in breaking the balloon is stored as the, the energy used in breaking in breaking the balloon in breaking the balloon is stored is stored in the form of is stored in the form of mass 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 in in the form of mass in the form of mass so the energy which you actually used in order to break the balloon that only got stored over here in these small masses so their mass increased their mass increased okay so this is the concept of mass defect now let's come over here let's come over here let's come over here i'll make you understand this topic let's come over here this was the simple or general example now, what if I tell you, what if I tell you, I have got a nucleus over here. This is the nucleus, okay? And the mass number of this nucleus is basically A. A is the mass number. And Z is the atomic number. Okay? Sir, A means number of nucleons, total number of nucleons. Z means number of protons. And if I talk about collective, collective mass sir the collective mass in this case is we say let's suppose capital m let's suppose capital m now what i want you guys to do is that you just break this balloon over here you just break this balloon over here you just break this balloon over here okay sorry you just break this nucleus over here and i want to take these nucleons out of the nucleus so, if we break this nucleus, if we break this nucleus, so means I have to apply energy. I have to use energy. Now, my question to you is, after, after I'm done with the breaking of this nucleus, I took these out and I'll place it over here individually. Can you tell me how much will be the mass, mass, how much will be the mass of protons? We say, sir, Z protons you are taking out. So Z into MP will be the mass of protons. Then plus, how many neutrons are there? Total number of nucleons is A. Number of protons is Z. So you say, sir, A minus Z will be the number of nucleons. So, sorry, number of neutrons. And these number of neutrons has mass, we say, MN. Mn, okay? And then, then, sir, this, the collective mass of all of these protons plus neutrons is M. But after breaking the nucleus, the individual mass, I observed that, I observed that it came out to be greater than collective mass M. Can anybody of you tell me in the live chat, can anybody of you tell me in the live chat, why does this actually happen? Sir, individually, their mass came out to be greater than the collective mass. Individual mass. Individual mass came out to be, out to be greater than, 
greater than collective mass. Collective mass. Can you tell me the reason over here? Can you tell me the reason over here? I am waiting for your answer. Tell me in the live chat. Can you tell me the reason over here? So we say, we say here, here, it is because of the energy. So we say, we say here, here, mass defect occurred. Mass defect, defect occurred. Okay. And how do you find that mass defect? That mass defect is delta M is equal to final mass. That is Z of MP plus we say A minus Z into MN. Okay. That is Z protons have this much mass. A minus Z neutrons have this much mass minus collective mass that is M. Okay. That is M. You need to keep this formula in your mind. Okay. Now, my dear friends over here, we say, sir, this mass defect, this increase in the mass occurred because of the energy which got stored over here. Yes, mass is converted into energy in this case. Okay. Okay. So, we say, remember, my dear friends, remember, my dear friends, I'll write the statement over here. The energy, the energy used to break the nucleus, to break the nucleus, the energy used to break the nucleus is stored, stored in the form of, in the form of mass, in the form of mass and is called, and is called binding energy, binding energy. So binding energy is that energy which is used to break the nucleus and that energy is only stored in the form of mass and due to which, due to which mass defect occurred. Mass defect occurred. And due to this binding energy only, we say mass defect occurred, mass is increased. And if somebody asks you, what is the formula for that binding energy? You simply say, you simply say, sir, binding energy is simply, sir, delta M into C square, delta M into C square. Delta M is the mass defect. You have to check how much is the energy, that energy. You say, sir, how much is the mass defect? So put it over here. You'll get the value of binding energy. So you can also write this binding energy is simply instead of delta M, you can say, sir, Z into MP plus A minus Z, A minus Z into MN minus M and then, then multiplied by C square. Unfortunately, this was once asked, this complete expression was once asked in the JEE. <coughs> this was once asked in the JEE. Is that clear? Is that clear, guys? Is that clear? This is the concept of binding energy. Simply binding energy is that energy which is used to break the nucleus, which is used to take out the nucleons from the nucleus. And because of that energy only, we say mass is increasing. Mass increased, mass defect occurred. Is that clear? Tell me in the chats, everybody. Okay. One more thing I just want to tell you in this case is, see, binding energy is that energy which is used to break the nucleus. Okay. Binding energy is that energy which is used to break the nucleus. Means if let's suppose we have a nucleus, if more binding energy is required to break the nucleus, then we say that that is more stable. Can we say it something like that? Can we say it something like that? Tell me. No, that is wrong. Let me just tell you one more statement. The statement is something like this. The statement is something like this. What is that? We say, sir, binding energy per nucleon 
is proportional to stability. Remember this expression, binding energy per nucleon is proportional to stability. What does that mean? What does that mean? Listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. If I say, if I say, I have got a nucleus over here. I have got a nucleus over here. We say, sir, in this particular case, binding energy per nucleon. Binding energy means that energy which is required to take out the nucleons from the nucleus. And binding energy per nucleon means that energy which is required to take out one single nucleon from the nucleus. Binding energy per nucleon is that energy, that energy which is required, which is required to pull out, pull out one nucleon, one nucleon from the nucleus, from the nucleus. Okay. Now listen to me very carefully. More is the binding energy per nucleon, more stable a system will be. More stable a nucleus will be. If I say, sir, if I say, if I say, let's suppose you have got two nuclei over here. Let's suppose you have got two nuclei over here. This is the first one and second one. Listen to me very carefully. Sir, in this particular case, you have got this X nuclei and you have got this Y nuclei. Listen to me very carefully. Sir, the mass number of this is 6 and the mass number of this is 12. Mass number of this is 12. Clearly you see over here? Yes. Now, my dear friends, the binding energy of binding energy of this X, binding energy of X is we say sir 24 electron volts and binding energy of this Y is is, 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 is 36 electron volts. My dear friends, if I say binding energy is proportional to, if I say binding energy is proportional to, if I say binding energy is proportional to stability, then I say Y is more stable than X. But no, I have told you over here, binding energy per nucleon is proportional to stability, not binding energy. Because the amount of energy required to take out one nucleon, if that energy is more, means that uh, nucleus is stable. Now, can you find binding energy per nucleon in this case? You say, sir, binding energy is 24 divided by, this is 6, so this will be 4 electron volts. Means, if you have to pull out one nucleon from this nucleus, so you have to apply, you have to use 4 electron volt energy. Now, binding energy per nucleon in this case is 36 divided by 3. Sorry, 36 divided by 12. 12. So that is 3 electron volts. My dear friends, if you have to pull out one nucleon from this nucleus, you have to only apply 3 electron volt energy. And if you have to pull out one nucleon from this nucleus, you have to apply Four electron volt energy more means this is more stable, this is more strong. So we say, sir, this X is more stable, more stable than Y. Is this clear? Is this clear? Is this clear? No, no, no. Alpha DK, beta DK, that has been removed. All of that. Is that clear guys? Tell me in the chats. Tell me in the chats. Solo this question. Binding energy of 2HE4 and 3Li7. 2HE4 and 3Li7 are... <laughs> Binding energy of 2HE4 and 3Li7 are 27.7 MeV and 39.93 MeV. Which one is, which of the nuclei, two nuclei is more stable? Which of the two nuclei is more stable? Tell me, which of the two nuclei over here is more stable? Hmm. 
विच ऑफ द टू न्यूक्लाई इज मोर स्टेबल Tell me, guys, which of the two nuclei is more stable? He or Le? He or Li? We have got helium. We have got lithium. Okay. So we say this is two He four, and this is three Li seven. Okay. And when it comes to mass number of this, that is four. When it comes to mass number of this, that is seven. Four. A. This means mass number, number of nucleons. And in this case, when it comes to the binding energy, so binding energy in this case is given as twenty-seven point twenty-seven point three. And in this case, we say, sir, binding energy is given as we say thirty-nine point three. now you have to say which one is more stable how do you find the stability binding energy per nucleon in this case you find binding energy per nucleon and in this case you find binding energy per nucleon okay so if binding energy per nucleon came out to be greater in this case then this is more stable okay graph between binding energy graph between binding energy per nucleon versus mass number let me just show you this particular graph over here this is the graph between binding energy per nucleon and and mass number okay this is binding energy per nucleon and this is mass number <clears throat> or you say stability versus mass number because binding energy per nucleon is also the stability now experimentally when we made the graph between binding energy per nucleon and mass number it came out to be something like this it came out to be something like okay now now try to look at this particular graph over here try to look at this particular graph over here see my dear friends listen to me very carefully we say we say we say you see over here sir as as the mass number is increasing as the mass number is increasing we say sir binding energy per nucleon is also increasing okay at certain value it becomes maximum and then it again starts decreasing okay clearly you see sir mass number this is the mass number curve let's suppose you have got a nuclei whose mass number is let's suppose 30 So thirty has got this much of much of binding energy. Forty has got this much of binding energy per nucleon. So we say this nuclei is more stable than this nuclei. Why? Because binding energy per nucleon for this nuclei is more. Okay, binding energy for this nucleon is more. Now, now what I'm trying to say in this particular case is that is nothing but that is nothing but. as you keep on increasing the mass number we say binding energy per nucleon also increases stability also increases and then after certain value it again decreases then after certain value it again decreases it again decreases okay 
Okay. So we say, I'll write the statement over here. I'll write the statement over here. We say, from the graph, from the graph, we say stability, stability first increases, then decreases. Stability first increases, then decreases. Okay. Clearly, you see, sir, stability is increasing, increasing, and then it is decreasing because this is what we call the stability. Okay. Okay. Now, my dear friends, I want you guys to take a look at this one. Let's suppose we are taking, we are taking, let's suppose we are taking this, this nuclei over here. And we are taking this nuclei over here. And we are taking this nuclei over here. This is the nuclei which has got mass number 30. <coughs> and this is the nuclei which has got mass number 170. So all the nuclei which lie between A is equal to 30 and A is equal to 70 means these nuclei. They have got higher binding energy per nucleon. They are more stable. They are more stable. They are more stable. But sir, all of these nuclei, which are smaller nuclei, having, let's suppose I take that nuclei, which has mass number A is equal to, we say, sir, 15. 15 nucleons contain that nucleus. Means that is a smaller, lighter nuclei. It has got less binding energy per nucleon. It has got less binding energy per nucleon. Okay? It has got less binding energy per nucleon. Listen to me. Now, now, what I'll write over here, between the mass number, between the mass number A is equal to 30 to A is equal to 170, we say, we say A is equal to 30 to 170, the, the nuclei, nuclei are stable. So, these nuclei are actually stable. If I say, sir, that nuclei which has mass number A is equal to 40, is that stable? Yes. That nuclei which has mass number 100, is that stable? Yes. That nuclei which has mass number less than 30 is less stable, is unstable. Why? Because binding energy per nucleon is less. So we say, my dear friends, we say, my dear friends, the nuclei with a is less than 30. A is less than 30. The nuclei with the nuclei with A is less than 30 are called lighter lighter nuclei nuclei and are unstable and are un, unstable and are unstable. Why are they unstable? Because they have got less binding energy per nucleon. So let's suppose I am taking this nuclei over here. I am taking this nuclei over here. Both of these nuclei are, we say, sir, unstable. Why? Because, because their binding energy per nucleon is less. And I'll mention one more point over here. That is, those nuclei with mass number greater than 170. All of those nuclei whose mass number is greater than 170, again, this binding energy per nucleon stability is decreasing. Are, are heavy nuclei? <coughs> and are also unstable. And are also unstable. Okay, and are also unstable. Now, now, everyone in this universe wants to become stable. Let's suppose I say this is the bigger nuclei with mass number greater than 170. Okay, clearly you see its binding energy per nucleon is less. Now, if I say you have got the two unstable nuclei, everyone in this universe wants to become stable. So what they will do, they will join together. This nuclei will join with this nuclei. 
and they will form a bigger nuclei which comes in this range. So I'll write over here, I'll write over here two nuclei, two smaller nuclei. Two smaller nuclei fused together, fused together in order to, in order to reach stability, in order to reach stability, two lighter nuclei join together, fused together in order to reach stability is called the process is called the process process is called fusion okay let's suppose if you have got this nuclei this nuclei okay this has got <coughs> 16 nucleons 16 nucleons okay when they are joined together they form a nucleus which has got 32 nucleons now this is basically stable this is basically stable and and when two nuclei fuse together and become stable we say energy is released in that process energy is released in that process energy is released in that process okay now, my dear friends, if I say, if I say, if a bigger nuclei, if a bigger nuclei wants to attain stability, so it breaks into two smaller nuclei, so that it comes in the range of A is equal to 30 to A is equal to 70 in order to reach stability. So we say, when, when a bigger nuclei, when a bigger nuclei, when a bigger nuclei breaks into two small nuclei in order to reach, in order to reach stability. In order to reach stability, the process is called <coughs> fission. The process is called fission. Okay. So let's suppose you have got this nuclei, it has got 200 nucleons. So 200 is also unstable because A is greater than 170. So if it breaks into two small nuclei, this is 100 and this is 100. Now it has become stable. So now it is stable. And this process called a fusion and we say energy is released in this process. In this process also. Energy is released in this process also. Because whenever something attains stability in that case, we say energy is released. Okay, this was fission, this was fusion. And this is the graph between binding energy <coughs> per nucleon and, <coughs> and mass number. <coughs> is it clear? Next will be your semiconductor chapter. Personally, modern physics is my favorite, huh? Slide number 118. <laughs> Slide number 118. Now see, over here, we are given a graph between binding energy per nucleon and mass number. Okay. 
Now, these are the four nuclei indicated on the curve. Okay. You have to tell me the process that would release energy. The first process C to D. If you move from C to D, will there be their release in energy in that case? <clears throat> Will there be the release in energy in that case if, the, if we move from C to D? See, whenever something attains stability, we say in that case energy is released. Now, at 3, at 3, you say, you say, sir, see, this much is the binding energy per nucleon. When you are at 3 means binding energy per nucleon is more means stability is more. So you are moving from stable to unstable. In this case, energy is not released. Now, move this one. From A to C, C to D. Let's move from A to C, then C to D. So initially, you are, you are moving from, this is the binding energy per nucleon for A. This is the binding energy per nucleon for C. If you are moving from A to C, means you are moving from unstability to stability. Then again, you are moving towards the unstability then again you are moving towards the unstability <clears throat> okay so this is not the answer this is not the answer energy would not be released and then you have option d when it comes to option d first b to c c to d first if you move from b to c means you are moving from unstability to stability means energy will be released then again you are moving till d so you are moving from stability to unstability. Again, energy is not released. Energy would be absorbed. So this is not the case. Option C is the correct option over here. So we say if you move from A to C, you are moving from unstability to stability. You are moving from unstability to stability and energy would be released in this process only. <clears throat> <clears throat> we'll take guys shall we take 10 minutes break okay back at 10 uh, we say 2.15 2.15 I will be back 2.15 am huh? Just one, one and a half hour left. One hour left. One hour.
Now, let's basically talk about, let's basically talk about the nuclear force right now. Let's talk about the nuclear force right now. Okay. Now, let's talk about the modern, uh, this nuclear force right now. See, sir, if we talk about this nucleus, we have this nucleus over here. Inside this nucleus, we know we have protons, we have neutrons, okay? Now, my dear friends, when it comes to, sir, neutrons, neutrons are neutral. But when it comes to the protons, protons have got the positive charge. We say, as protons, have positive charge. So, inside the nucleus, inside the nucleus, so inside the nucleus, force acts between the protons. Inside the nucleus, force acts between the protons. And that force is K Q1 Q2 divided by R square. We know, sir, this nucleus is a very small space. And inside that nucleus, you have got the two protons, which are also very close to each other. So we say this proton may be repelling this proton and this proton will be repelling this proton. So these two protons are actually applying the force on each other. These two protons are actually applying the force on each other. Okay. And this is the distance between the two protons that is R. Similarly, this proton and this proton is applying force. Sir, proton and neutron is also applying the electrostatic force. We say no, because neutron does not, not have the charge. Neutron does not have the charge. Okay. So, here, this distance between the protons, here, here, we say R is very small, very small. If R is very small, my dear people, my dear people, we say, sir, force is inversely proportional to R square. If this R is very small, we say force becomes very large. F is very, very large. So, force between the two, nu two nucleon, force between the two protons is very large. Now, <coughs> <clears throat> the force between the two nucleons is large. Similarly, force between these two protons is also large. Similarly, force between these two protons is also large. So, this force is basically trying to pull the electrons out. This force is basically trying to push the, push the nucleus out. Okay. So, basically, this force, this force, this force, this force between the protons is actually very large, okay? And this force <coughs> tries, this force tries to push the walls of the nucleus. This force tries to push the walls of the nucleus in the outer direction, okay? But over sure, but over sure, we say another force comes into play, which will keep these protons, which will keep these protons stick to each other, which will keep these protons, okay? So we say this force tries to push the walls of the nucleus and makes the nucleus unstable system. But we know nucleus is a stable system. We say, we say, so another force, another force comes into play, comes into play called nuclear force. Nuclear force. Which acts, which acts between the nucleons between the nucleons and and makes makes <coughs> the nucleus as stable system as stable system and makes the nucleus as stable system 
my dear friends if we are saying that this is a nucleus inside the nucleus you have got these protons and these protons are applying the huge force on each other electrostatic force because of that electrostatic force this nucleus becomes unstable because force is acting in the outer direction so we say in order to overcome this large electrostatic force another force acts between the nucleons and that force is what we call nuclear force okay that force is what we call the nuclear force over here so we say in this case let's suppose if we have got a proton over here this is we have proton over here sir these two protons are trying to go out of the nucleus because electrostatic force is acting between these two nucleons but we say sir another force which keeps them inside the nucleus is what we call the nuclear force this f nuclear and this f nuclear is we say sir attractive in nature attractive in nature attractive in nature okay because of these two forces they want to go out of the nucleus but which force keeps them inside the nucleus that is nuclear force and remember my dear friends remember my dear friends we say if you have proton and if you have neutron we say between these two also sir nuclear force will act but between these two electrostatic force will not act why because neutron does not have the charge and if you say if you have sir a neutron you have one more neutron we say sir between these two also nuclear force will act why because nuclear force acts between the nucleons and when it comes to electrostatic force that acts between the charges and remember one thing that is force between two protons this nuclear force between nuclear force between we say two protons is equal to nuclear force between nuclear force between proton and neutron is equal to nuclear force between we say neutron and neutron the amount of force which acts between these two protons is same as the amount of nuclear force between these two protons the, the, this proton and neutron and this neutron and neutron this force is actually same okay 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 now one more important point i just want to tell you in this case is what is that that is basically we say sir this f nuclear f nuclear is we say 100 times greater than f electrostatic this f nuclear is 100 times greater than f electrostatic force and we say this f nuclear is 10 raised power 39 times greater than f gravitational see if you ask someone how many times nuclear force is greater than the gravitational force you say 10 raised power 39 times and my dear friends this nuclear force is basically charge independent and it's a sh short range force okay so this was the detail about the nuclear force one more topic we need to discuss over here graph between the potential energy and distance between the nucleons if you try to make the graph if you try to make the graph between the potential energy if you try to make the graph between the potential energy see this is the potential energy and and this is the distance between the nucleons distance between the nucleon let me just show you this one <clears throat> this topic and after this we have one more topic that's it that's it see we say we say in this particular case you have u versus r potential <coughs> potential energy versus potential energy versus distance between the nucleons listen to me very carefully 
in our electrostatics we have studied if we have a charge q1 if we have charge q2 distance between them is r we say sir potential energy exists between the two charges that is k q1 q2 divided by r and in gravitation we have studied we have sir mass m1 we have sir mass m2 distance between them is r we say sir u is equal to minus g m1 m2 by r so over here also potential energy exists in case of masses also potential energy exists now if i say if we have two nucleons proton and you have got neutron we say here also potential energy will exist between the two nucleons we say we say as as potential energy will exist what does that mean potential energy will be there between the two nucleons we say as potential energy will be will be there between the between the two nucle between the nucleons i i'll just write over here between the nucleons now now this this now we say potential energy between the nucleons okay now my dear friends my dear friends if we say we have one nucleon over here another nucleon over here this is the distance between them okay r now we have to make the graph of that potential energy between r that is something like this that is something like this that is something like this this graph has been experimentally verified the graph between potential energy and distance between the nucleons it has been experimentally verified okay cool now now listen to me very carefully i'll make you understand some points over here you just have to directly remember we don't have to prove it now see sir when it comes to the work done we know sir work done is equal to change in potential energy if you do the work done on something because of that work done its potential energy will be changed i have told you this before right now remember it directly and work done by this is work done by external agent external agent work done by conservative force is equal to negative of change in potential energy means if you do the work potential energy will be changed work done by conservative force means work done by gravitational force work done by electrostatic force okay now my dear friends my dear friends these are the equations you have learned if not remember it directly sir work done is equal to change in potential energy now if i say sir small work done small work done sir because of small work done small change in potential energy will be there so we say sir dw is equal to minus du how do we write small work done dw and how do we write small change in potential energy du yes now can you tell me what is the formula for work we say sir when it comes to work work is f dot dr let's suppose you you have got the tape you have got the block over here you are applying the force on it okay we say sir it has been displaced by dr distance how much is the work that you have done work is equal to f dot dr work is equal to f dot dr okay now in dw instead of dw what we can write over here is that is f dot dr okay and this will be simply minus du now this force is equal to minus du divided by dr so we say we say my dear people we say we say we say we say this is the relation this is the relation between between potential energy and force so this is the relation between potential energy and force okay now come over here can you tell me the value of slope in this case always i have told you slope means this perpendicular by base sir perpendicular is over here that is du or you call it u divided by we say sir dr because when it comes to the yx graph in case of y versus x graph slope is dy by dx 
and over here if you find the slope slope of this graph is du by dr okay yes now my dear friends this is equation number first and this is equation number second from first and second you can clearly see here du by dr is equal to minus f here du by dr is equal to slope so we say sir this force will be negative of slope from equation first and second so we say from equation first and equation second we say this force will be negative of slope if you have to find the force you find the slope you will get the value of force okay you will get the value of force F dot dr, dr is the work done. F dot dr is the work done. Work done. F is equal to, let's suppose you have not studied work. There is a block. If you are applying the force on the block, it will move some distance. So means work has been done. How to find that work? Force multiplied by displacement. Force multiplied by displacement. So we say, we say force is equal to the negative of slope. My dear friends, my dear friends, means if you want to find the force from this graph you find the slope now listen to me very carefully two cases we define over here let's suppose this is the point a and this is the point b and this is the point c over here from a to b from a to b let's come over here one more thing you just remember if i say sir the graph y versus x is something like this remember always in this case slope is negative why because this graph is decreasing or or this angle is greater than 90 degrees and if you see the graph is something like this in this case remember always slope is positive slope is positive because theta is less than 90 degrees over here now 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 if we take a look from A point to B point, this graph is decreasing. This graph is decreasing. We say, sir, from, from A to B in the graph, in the graph, from A to B in the graph. Listen to me very carefully. Listen to me very carefully. From A to B in the graph. Sir, clearly you see, clearly you see, sir, from A to B, is the value of slope positive or negative sir clearly the value of slope will be negative we say sir slope is equal to negative okay so this point listen to me very carefully sir when it comes to the b point this b point is where r is equal to 0 0.5 per millimeter 0 0.5 per millimeter one per millimeter is equal to 10 raised power minus 15 meters so we say r when r is equal to 0 0.5 per meter it's the point b so if r is less than 0 0.5 per meter the graph will be something like this if r is greater than 0 0.5 per meter graph is something like this now come over here come over here we say we say if if r is less than if r is less than this this is not we say sir from A to B in the graph, that is where R is less than 0 0.5 fermimeter. Okay. What is this R? Means distance between the two nucleons. If that becomes less than 0 0.5 fermimeter, the graph will be something like this. The potential energy graph is something like this. Now you tell me one thing. Sir, we have to find force. Force is negative of slope. Negative of slope. Slope is also negative. Whatever may be the value of slope, that will be negative. Negative 5, 6, 7, 8, 10. So negative into negative becomes positive. So force in this case will become positive. When force becomes positive, when force becomes positive, what does that mean? That means force is repulsive. Force is repulsive. What does that mean? It means that. It means that if the distance r 
between the nucleons between the between the nucleons is less than is less than 0 0.5 fermi meter if between the two nucleons for uh, distance becomes less than 0 0.5 fermi meter then then pores becomes repulsive pores becomes repulsive so means you have two neutrons you have two nucleons they are attracting each other with nuclear force now nuclear force is so strong if, if they keep on attracting 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 they will collapse so that's why we say if the distance between the two nucleons will become very small then they start repelling in that case then they start repelling in that case that's why force came out to be this one now if i say my dear people if i say if i say from b to c in the graph in the graph from b to c in the graph from b to c in the graph sir when it comes to b to c clearly we can say sir this graph is increasing slope in this case is positive slope in this case is positive and this is the case where r is greater than 0 0.5 fermi meter so we say where r is greater than 0 0.5 fermi meter okay where r is greater than 0 0.5 fermi meter and and this is from b to c in the graph from b to c in the graph so we say sir slope is equal to positive so force is negative of slope so in this case if slope is positive force will be negative of positive so force in this case will be negative means force is attractive so what does that mean that means if distance between the two nucleons is greater than 0 0.5 fermi meter in that case the two nucleons will apply the attractive nuclear force on each other. Is this clear guys? Is this clear? Let me know in the live chat if this is crystal and clear to each and everyone. Let me know in the live chat if this is crystal and clear to each and everyone. Is this clear? All the people out there. How many people are watching right now? Great, 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 great. <laughs> now the question over here is, now the question over here is, nature of nuclear force is attractive repulsive both tell me nature of we say if the distance between the two nucleons let's suppose this is these are the two nucleons if this r r is less than 0 0.5 fermi meter i just told you in that case force is a repulsive and if the two nucleons, distance between the two nucleons, R is greater than 0 0.5 fermi meter, in that case, force is attractive. Tell me, what is the nature of nuclear force? A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D. No. Option A. We always say nuclear force is attractive in nature. Keep that thing in your mind. I told you the concept in detail, but we consider nuclear force is attractive in nature okay yes a now the question is basically we have got we have got over here we have got over here the net force between two nucleons are separated the net force between them is f and e, both are neutrons we have got a neutron we have got a neutron so net force between these is we say sir f net is equal to f1 and then 
if both are we say protons this is proton and this is proton and in this case we say sir net force is equal to f2 and then if one is a proton and if one is neutron and in this case net force is f3 net force is f3 you guys are supposed to tell me which option is correct f2 is greater than f1 is greater than f3 f1 is equal to f2 is equal to f3 or any other options tell me tell me which option which option is correct over here <laughs> which option is correct over here you have got two neutrons you have got a proton and a proton you have got proton and a neutron you have to tell me will the force between all the three is equal or different or whatever it is tell me see 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 i'll tell you if it was what is the nuclear force between all the three in that case option b was correct force between these two is equal to force nuclear force between these two is equal to these two is equal to these two but 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 that is not the case over here that is not mentioned over here at all that is not mentioned over here at all so we say between these two between these two neutron and neutron let me just tell you when it comes to neutrons we say sir only nuclear force will act no electrostatic force will act so net force in this case is we say f1 now between the protons we say sir the nuclear force will act as well as electrostatic force will act as well as electrostatic force will act now in this case we say sir the force net force between two protons is f2 we can clearly say that this f2 will be less than this force see sir between these two proton and this neutron the force this only nuclear force will act okay now see in these two cases only nuclear force is acting so we can clearly say f1 is equal to f3 okay but but in this case electrostatic force is also acting in the opposite in the outward direction so means net force in this case will decrease because they have got external force see these forces are equal these nuclear forces and all the three but over here outer force is also acting so outer force will decrease this inner force so we say is greater than f so option d is the correct option yes yes i was not talking about the nuclear force i was talking about the net force that's why this is a good question actually <laughs> Now we have the Q value of the reaction. <clears throat> now we have, you got the previous question? You got it? You got it? Tell me. Q value of the reaction. Q value of the reaction. Now see my dear friends. Now see my dear friends. See. What does Q value of the reaction mean? Let me just tell you. Let's suppose we have got a nucleus. Nuclei A. Nuclei a and we have got one more nuclei over here. That is B. This is the nuclei A, this is the nuclei B. And these two nuclei are converted into nuclei C plus we say nucleus D. So this is basically the reaction, kind of reaction happening over here. A nuclei and B nucleus is converted into C nucleus and D nucleus. Now this is a reaction. In this reaction, some, some, some energy may be either absorbed some energy may be either released, we don't know. But something will be there. So when A nucleus and B nucleus are converted into C nucleus and D nucleus, 
we say in that case in that case in that case some energy may be absorbed or some energy may be released and that's what we call the q value of the reaction that's what we call the q value of the reaction so these are what we call the reactant nuclei reactant nuclei and these are what we call the product nuclei okay and this is what we call q value of the reaction of the reaction or we simply say it is energy absorbed or released energy absorbed or released during the reaction so i have taken the two nuclei over here a and b and it is converted into c and d and during this process we say some energy may either be absorbed or released that's what we call q q value of the reaction now the question may come to your mind how do we exactly find the q value of the reaction my dear friends how do we exactly find the q value of the reaction listen to me listen to me when it comes to the q value of the reaction when it comes to the q value of the reaction how do you find this q value of the reaction i'll make you understand you simply say you simply say mass of reactants mass of reactants okay minus mass of mass of products okay mass of reactants minus mass of products into we say c square this is how do you get the q value of the reaction this is simply q value of the reaction this is simply q value of the reaction okay now we can write it something like this also sir when it comes to the mass of reactants that is we say mass of a plus we say mass of b okay then minus you say sir mass of c plus we say mass of d and then we say multiplied by c square so this is how do we actually find the q value of the reaction over here okay okay now my dear friends my dear friends if i say if i say if if in a new if in a reaction we say mass of a plus mass of b comes out to be greater than mass of c plus mass of d nucleus then then we say sir q value of the reaction will be c if mass of a means mass of reactants is greater than the mass of products is greater than the mass of products we say sir q value of the reaction will come out to be positive sir how let's suppose if i say this is 10 this is 5 10 minus 5 is plus 5 so q will come out to be positive so we say q will come out to be positive in that case and and if i say over here if i say over here q is positive we say we say we say in that case energy is released in the reaction in the reaction we say in that case energy has been released from the reaction because mass of reactants is greater than the mass of products and and we say sir this is what we call this is what we call exothermic reaction it is it is exothermic reaction it is exothermic reaction okay it is exothermic and and my dear friends if i say if we say mass of a plus mass of b is less than is less than mass of c plus mass of d mass of reactants is less than the mass of products in that case q value will come out to be negative okay 
and that means energy is absorbed. And it is, it is endothermic reaction. It is simply logically correct also. We say, sir, mass of C plus mass of D. If mass of products has been increased, means the energy has been stored in the form of mass. That's why mass increased. This is the concept same which I told you in the binding energy. If this energy you are supplying is stored into the mass, then mass will increase. Same is the case over here. If mass of products is more than the mass of reactants means means energy has been absorbed as stored in the form of mass only is it crystal and clear okay and one more thing i just want to tell you we say q value in terms of Binding energy, Q value in terms of binding energy. Q value in terms of binding energy. So this was the Q value of the reaction. This was the formula for Q value of the reaction in terms of mass. But if I say Q value in terms of binding energy, how do we write it? We say sir Q value in terms of binding energy is binding energy of products minus we say binding energy of reactant okay this is the formula or you can something like this binding energy of c plus binding energy of d these are the products minus we say binding energy we say binding energy of a plus we say binding energy binding energy of of Binding energy of B. Is that clear? This is the Q value of the reaction in terms of binding energy. And this is the Q value of the reaction. And this is the Q value of the reaction in terms of mass, mass of nuclei. Okay, now let's move on to the questions. The question over here is, in a nuclear fusion reaction, in a, nu in a nuclear fusion reaction, is if the energy is released, then, if the energy is released, then, see, see, I'll tell you one thing. Here it is saying that energy is released. In a nuclear fusion reaction, energy is released. Means Q value of the reaction will be positive. Listen to me very carefully. I, show, I have shown you over here. If the energy is released, we say if the energy is released, Q value of the reaction in that case is positive. It is saying that in a nuclear fusion reaction, we say sir, fusion means two nuclei will fuse together to form a bigger nuclei. And energy is released in this case, Q is positive. When is the Q positive? Listen to me very carefully. We know sir, Q is equal to Binding energy of products minus binding energy of reactants. I just shown you, I just showed you this particular formula. Sir, Q value will only come out to be positive if this quantity is greater than this quantity. So we say Q is only positive. Q is positive only, only if we say binding energy of products is greater than binding energy of reactants. Because if I say this is 5 and this is 10, so then, then in that case, then in that case, we say, sir, Q will come out to be negative. That is violating. So which option is correct? Option C is correct. Yes, great, great, great. Now, similarly, I want you guys to tell me in this, this is a fission process. In case of fission, a nucleus divides into two nucleus. A nucleus divides into two nucleus. A nucleus is divided into B and C. And then, then in this case, in a fission process, A nucleus is divided into B and C. You guys are supposed to choose the correct option over here. 
सी इन फिशन प्रोसेस ऑल्सो वी से सर एनर्जी इज रिलीज एनर्जी इज रिलीज वाई सर बिकॉज फिशन मीन्स अटेनिंग स्टेबिलिटी वेन एवर समथिंग अटेन स्टेबिलिटी वी से एनर्जी इज रिलीज इन दैट केस यूर ऑल्सो एनर्जी इज रिलीज एनर्जी इज रिलीज मीन्स एनर्जी इज पॉजिटिव Energy is released means energy is positive. Energy is released means energy is positive. Energy is released means energy is positive. Okay, so energy is only positive when we say, sir, Q value is only positive when we say binding energy of products minus we say binding energy of reactants. It is only positive when binding energy of when binding energy of of products is greater than binding energy of reactants okay and what are, what is the binding energy of products over here that is energy of b these are the products products okay in case of fusion and this is the reactant we say energy of b plus energy of c when it is greater than energy of a then only q value will come out to be positive tell me which option is this energy of b plus c is greater than energy of a option option b option b is that clear is that clear is that clear okay one more good question that we have over here we are done with this one we just have two four questions and done yes four five questions we have and we are done how was this session by the way huh? real killing and real shelling of all the three chapters now once i finish the live stream you guys know what you are supposed to do fill the comment box with the comments okay how many kashmiris in the chat right now raise your hands how many kashmiris in the chat raise your hands <clears throat> because kashmiri sleep very early mostly great 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 now see now let's take a look over here let's take a look over here <clears throat> the binding energy of 3li7 and 2he4 are 5.60 and 7.60 mev respectively in a nuclear reaction see we are given a nuclear reaction over here we are given a nuclear reaction over here let me write the reaction first that is 3 li7 this is a nucleus okay plus plus 1 h1 1 h1 what does this mean it means hydrogen 1 h1 is hydrogen it gives it gives we say 2 he4 plus 2 he4 and then plus q so we say these are the reactant nuclei they are converted into product nuclei and some q energy is released in this case some energy is released in this case q value of the reaction and we have to find the q value of the reaction in this particular case okay these are the reactant nuclei okay reactants and these are the products and in order to find the q value of the reaction it is very simple guys sir q value of the reaction will be simply 
we say binding energy of products minus binding energy of reactants. That's it. That's it. How do we find the binding energy of products? Let me just show you. Binding energy of products. See, my dear people, when it comes to products, products means these, okay? It is mentioned on the screen, the binding energy per nucleon for 3Li7 is 5.60. So means binding energy per nucleon. Binding energy of one nucleon of 3Li7 is 5.60. Now, how many nucleons are over here? Seven. So, binding energy of seven nucleons will be seven into 5.60. Done. And then you have, sir, and 2HE4 is 7.60. We say binding energy of one nucleon of helium. It is how much? 7.60. Now, how many nucleons are over here? Four plus four is eight. So, 8 nucleons have how much binding energy? 8 into 7.60. So, I can write over here, this will be 8 into 7.60. Done. And then, when it comes to the binding energy of reactants, sir, binding energy of reactants is, we say, sir, over here you have got 7 into, how many, how much is the binding energy of one nucleon? of lithium that is 5.60. See guys, this 5.60 is the binding energy of one nucleon of lithium. Now we have got total of 7, 7 into 5.60. Here we have got 8, so 8 into 7.60. Now sir, binding energy for 1H1, 1H1 means it has only one nucleon. One nucleon, how you gonna take one nucleon out of what? Nothing. So this has binding energy 0. You can separate the two. You cannot separate one. So we say, sir, put it over here. Q value of the reaction will be, that is 8 into 7.60 minus 7 into 7 into 5.60. Okay. And this Q will come out to be, how much? How much? Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Yes. 17.3 MeV. 17.3 MeV. Tell me. How much? 17.3 or 19 point? Yes. 17 point something. Yes. Yeah, 17 point something. 17.3 MeV. Let's move on to the next one. Tell me in this one. The binding energies per nucleons of deuteron and alpha particle reaction is given as 1H2 plus 1H2 gives 2HE4 plus Q. 2HE4 plus Q. Okay. 2HE4 plus Q. And in this case, we have and plus Q. We have to find the Q value of the reaction. Q value of the reaction will be simply binding energy of products minus we say binding energy of reactant now we say sir q value of the reaction binding energy of product see this is the product and these are the reactants my dear friends the binding energy of per nucleon for deuteron these are what we call the deuterons okay and alpha particle this is alpha particle are x1 and x2 now see for one nucleon of alpha particle, binding energy is x2. For four nucleons, how much it will be? 4 into x2. <laughs> For one nucleon, it is x1. For one nucleon, it is x2. For four nucleons, it is how much? x4 into x2. x2. Then minus binding energy of reactants. Sir, Binding energy of one nucleon of this deuteron is how much? We say, sir, x1. Yes. This is the binding energy of one nucleon of deuteron. Now, how many nucleons are over here? 2 plus 2 is 4. So, we say 4 has how much? 4x1. So, this will be 4 into x2 minus x1. Is this clear or shall I repeat it? Is this clear? Is this clear 4 into x2 minus x1? Is this clear? Tell me. 
Tell me guys, is this clear? Is this crystal and clear? Let me know in the chats. Okay, this is a good question actually. This was the previous year JE question. Now, what does it actually say? The mass of a 3Li7 nucleus is 0 0.042 less than the sum of the mass of all of nucleons. The binding energy per nucleon of 3Li7 is C. In this case, you are given, you are given basically a nucleus. Okay. The mass of 3Li7 is this one and the sum. Okay, okay, okay. You are given the mass of nucleus as, you are given a uh, 3Li7 nucleus. Its mass is 0, 0.0. We say when it comes to the mass, it is given as 0 0.042 AMU. AMU. Okay. And, and, if this is the mass which is given in this question, you guys are supposed to find the binding energy per nucleon. This is the mass. See, see, you are given a 3Li7 nuclei. 3Li7 nuclei. Its mass is given as 0 0.042. Okay. And you have to find the binding energy per nucleon over here. Listen to me very carefully. If mass is given, if mass is given, if mass is given, can we find the binding energy? We say, sir, binding energy is equal to Binding energy is equal to, we say, mass, that is, M, B, E is equal to M into C square, delta M into C square. That is over here, 0 0.042 AMU into C square, okay? Now, you tell me one thing. I told you, okay, if I go back to those slides over there, I told you 1 AMU into C square as, as, 1 amu into c square is equal to 931.5 mev remember it i hope you remember it i hope you remember it this this 1 amu into c square is 931.5 into yes 931.5 mev so we can write it something like this this binding energy will come out to be that is 0 0.042 and instead of 1 amu into c square, I can write multiplied by 931.5 mev, mega electron mode. Now, 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 my dear friends, this is the binding energy. This is the binding energy of this nucleus. This is the total binding energy of the nucleus. This, and, and if we, if we consider C, Consider this as 1000. I know this is not 1000. Let's assume it as 1000. Okay. So this binding energy will come out to be, we say it will be simply that is 42. 1000 multiplied by this 0 0.042 will come out to be 42. MeV. Okay. So we say this is the total binding energy of the nucleus but what do we have to find we have to find the binding energy per nucleon of the 3Li7 nucleus we have to find binding energy of per nucleon binding energy of every nucleon of every nucleon so we say we say binding energy per nucleon sir what is the mass number of this one that is 7 so can I say in this case, can I say in this case, sir, binding energy per nucleon, that is 42 divided by 7. Because total binding energy is 42 divided by 7, that is how much? 6 MeV. Now, you check into the options. You check into the option. Is there any one which is 6? No. But which one is close to 6? That is 5.6. So this one will be correct. Why? Didn't we get the exact 5.6 because we assumed over here is at, at as 1000. So this is, this is in order to simplify the calculations. Same trick you can use in NEAT and many questions to simplify the calculations. Over here, 
we were supposed to find the binding energy per nucleon, binding energy of every nucleon. First, we calculated the total binding energy of this nucleus. Then, divide that with the mass number, you got the binding energy of every nucleon over here. Yes, this was a good question actually. Now, you have got this question. This I will give you homework. Now, you have got this question. This is also the homework. And then you have, thank you so much. Modern physics, done and dusted. Okay. Yes, it is very cold in Kashmir right now. So the ones who have not liked the session yet, like it as soon as possible. Okay. So thank you so much, guys. Make sure you comment afterwards once I end the live stream. Okay. This is all about it. Comment down whatever you want to say. How was the session each and everything in the comments afterwards. So I need to go right now. Okay. Because I am feeling now sleepy. Let me sleep and eat something before that. Okay. So almost we are done with the 80% of your 12th physics. Okay. Let me finish rest of the two chapters that we have over here in the marathons. And then I'll take your 11, some of the chapters from the 11th portion also. Because Kalasar is also taking the 11th portion from there. So chill scenes, take a chill pill, we'll be killing each and every single session. We'll have to kill it, that's for sure. Okay, I, I hope the real killing and shelling has been done in the modern physics. Every pattern of question has I have shown you, every problem I have shown you, all the concepts, each and everything. So thank you so much, boys and girls. See you guys very soon in the next session. Till then, take care and bye-bye. And make sure you like this and and put up the comment once I end this live stream. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>